Mother Nature is a cruel mistress. For every instance she brings water to quench the thirsty, she blows in a frosty wind to bitter the cold. Man has been so bold as to challenge her might, and even some of the most hardy and equipped have faced her only to never return. This is a tale of one such encounter between a band of resilient men and their maker in her most hostile of worlds. A story that shall live forever. A venture which tested the limits of human hardihood, endurance, and courage. The Antarctic continent, first thoroughly observed by a Russian scientific expedition in 1820, and then first significantly explored by the British-led Ross expedition 20 years later, remained a mysterious and elusive landscape, with many opportunities for scientific and geographic discovery throughout the latter half of the 1800s. However, Due to difficulties of weather and terrain, further studies were ultimately deemed by the British Royal Navy to be dangerous, expensive, and futile. In November 1893, biologist Sir John Murray presented his paper, The Renewal of Antarctic Exploration, to the Royal Geographical Society, the body in charge of the kingdom's advancements in geographical sciences. Murray theorized that there could be 4 million square miles of unexplored lands beyond what was known at the time, and that without further study of the Antarctic region, a full understanding of global meteorology, oceanography, biology, and physics could not be reached. Murray's argument to resume explorations of Antarctica was endorsed by the Society's president, Sir Clements Markham, a veteran of polar exploration, and also by the National Academy of Sciences. The Royal Society. The Royal Society subsequently teamed up with Markham's Royal Geographical Society to begin discussions on a future British Antarctic venture. Though powered by a common goal, this union was rife with disagreements. The Royal Society campaigned for a largely civilian-led expedition of scientists, while Markham sought a revival of naval glory following in the fashion of the Ross Expedition in the Antarctic and the Franklin Expedition of the Arctic. To further sour the affair, acquiring funds and sponsors proved to be a challenge for them. In contrast, by 1898, polar explorer Karsten Borchgrevink independently raised the £40,000 necessary for his own journey to Antarctica. Sir Clements Markham branded the explorer a liar and a fraud, and accused him of diverting funds from the Joint Society's planned venture. Similar accusations were thrown at scientist and explorer William Spears Bruce, who raised funds in Scotland for his own Scottish Antarctic expedition. Unlike Bruce, who would not have his plans realized until a few years later, Borch Grevink set sail in 1898 and carried out a myriad of scientific observations and recordings. His team was the first exploring party to use the power of sled dogs in the Antarctic, and in the year 1900, he reached the latitude 78 degrees 50 minutes south, setting the record for the southernmost point that any person had ever reached. Upon his return to England in June 1900, Borch Grevink by and large did not receive fanfare for his advancements in Antarctic science and discovery, since his travels were overshadowed by the high hopes of the upcoming expedition organized by the Royal Society and the Royal Geographical Society which had by this point acquired all the necessary funding and was now colloquially referred to as the Discovery Expedition, named after the ship that was specifically built to bring the team to Antarctica. Less than a month prior to Borchgrevink's return, through his persistent campaigning, Markham finally got his way and appointed a young, promising naval officer to lead the expedition and her crew, Torpedo Lieutenant Robert Falcon Scott. After experiencing personal and financial tragedy upon the bankruptcy and later death of his father, 
and the recent death of his younger brother, Scott became the sole breadwinner for his mother and his two unmarried sisters. Advancement up the ranks became a dire necessity, and upon a chance encounter with Markham, his old acquaintance, they discussed the upcoming expedition and Scott strongly argued for his desire to command it, even though he had no prior experience nor interest in polar exploration. Markham thusly got his wish to obtain a suitable and enthusiastic naval officer, and Scott fulfilled his need for career advancement, having been promoted to commander after his appointment. The expedition's main objective was to work in the Ross Sea region, as previously explored by Ross and Barge Grevink, to determine the extent of the polar lands from their observation points, and to conduct an array of scientific studies pertaining to the region. A venture beyond into the icy unknown was an option, but not a requirement. Despite his want for a full naval affair, Markham could only receive a limit of four Navy officers, including Commander Scott. In addition, a selection of merchant marine officers were also enlisted, like the mission's navigator and second-in-command, Albert Armitage, and third officer, Ernest Shackleton. The ship was also boarded by 20 petty officers and seamen, including one Edgar Evans, who became known as one of the strongest and most reliable men on the ship. As Scott was of Royal Navy background, he accepted the necessary respect and obedience to superiors, and had some difficulties in dealing with the seamen aboard who did not display the same sense of honor. He was also known to have a short temper, and would occasionally burst out into angry displays, only to apologetically gather himself soon afterwards. Shackleton proved to be very well liked by the men, and helped moderate complications and disagreements within the crew when they did not take kindly to Commander Scott's orders and demands. Shackleton and Scott soon grew close and built a foundation of mutual trust for each other. As for the ship's scientific assembly, it was rather junior, with the most senior member, botanist and naturalist Dr. George Murray, tasked with training and preparing the others before his planned departure from the expedition during the first leg of the ship's journey. Of these junior doctors, zoologist Edward Wilson earned a reputation for containing a wealth of knowledge about many things, and his profound generosity and caring nature helped him become very close to Commander Scott over the course of their trek. Impressed by Wilson's love and wisdom of animals, and his uncanny talents to perfectly capture them through drawings, Scott hired him in spite of his recent recovery from tuberculosis. On the 6th of August, 1901, the Discovery departed from England. They rounded Cape Town in South Africa, where Dr. Murray departed to the ship, and then later docked in the small town of Littleton, New Zealand, for final preparations in November. Naturally, shore leave led to a sailorly display of drunken rowdiness. After a nighttime of fighting, two seamen were brought before Commander Scott for disciplinary action. One was demoted, while the other deserted. Fortunately, Irish seaman Tom Crean, who was working aboard the Australian ship HMS Ringaruma nearby, departed her company and joined the Discovery team as a volunteer upon hearing of their call for an extra hand on deck. The ship's departure in December was marred by an unfortunate incident. As they were being cheered on by well-wishers on the docks, young able seaman Charles Bonner climbed to the top of the mainmast of the ship to raise the applause of those watching. He then lost his footing and fell to his death. The ship briefly stopped as Bonner was laid to rest in Port Chalmers, New Zealand. In early January 1902, the discovery finally reached Antarctica and began scientific study. As part of these studies, Scott and Shackleton both separately ascended up on a weather balloon made of cow gut to altitudes of up to 600 feet, only to observe unending white barrenness before returning to the ice safely. Around the 8th of February, Scott found a suitable place to set up camp along the exposed coastline of McMurdo Sound a stretch of water that lay between the Ross Sea and the Great Ice Barrier, the towering, expansive floating platform of ice. Here, they constructed a large prefabricated hut, along with smaller ones for scientific observations. They hence officially named the area Hut Point. 
troubles due to inexperience with the environment and what it demanded were made clear at this time, as none of the men had any competence with skis, and only two were experienced with using dogs to pull sledges. Efforts to teach the others were initially not fruitful. This encouraged Scott to rely on sheer manpower, or manhauling, to pull the sledges of supplies instead. On the 11th of March, a party returning from an expedition got caught by a blizzard while on an icy slope. During an effort to find a more secure ground, able seaman George Vince fell over the edge of a cliff. His body was never recovered, and at a later point, a cross with an inscription was erected in his memory in a nearby area. With the coming of March, the Antarctic winter set in, which brought with it endless night and temperatures of down to negative 40 degrees Fahrenheit, preventing lengthy travel. The men made the now ice-locked ship their home, which was found to be considerably warmer than the large hut they had built on ground. They killed as many seals as they could so they could have enough food for the winter. Scott, who was known to be very squeamish at the sight of blood, regretfully had to call the slaughter of the animals a necessity to ensure the team's survival. Eating seal meat was also known to help prevent scurvy, a debilitating vitamin C deficiency. The vitamin, which had not been discovered yet, was contained in raw or half-cooked meat, and explorers accepted the necessity of consuming it to prevent the dreaded sailor illness. To combat the likelihood of depression caused by lack of sunshine, under Scott's direction, Chief Engineer Reginald Skelton installed a large windmill intended to power the electric lights aboard the ship. He often complained about its need for constant maintenance, and surely was pleased when only a few months after its installation, the windmill collapsed in a storm. Skelton and Scott often worked together to solve problems experienced firsthand in their early trials. The commander was very keen on finding solutions, and if none were forthcoming, he would invent his own. For example, in thick blizzard conditions with zero visibility, Scott devised a simple device to steer by the wind. In addition, he fashioned a simple sundial to gather bearings where in a place so close to the magnetic south pole, standard compasses were less reliable. Scott was serious about the scientific objectives of the expedition and was always eager to learn more. During the icy winter, the scientific team continued to conduct experiments and take magnetic readings in their little hut laboratories, while others entertained themselves by contributing to the production of an in-house magazine called The South Polar Times. Edited by Shackleton, it was printed in monthly issues during the winter months and contained typed reports of experiences during the trip, scientific discoveries, and tales of hardship, along with whimsical anecdotes and lofty poetry. The text was accompanied by watercolor pictures, drawings, and photographs provided by team members. Dr. Wilson provided the most competent collection of paintings and caricatures. Only one copy of each issue was ever made, which were recited and displayed in large group settings. The crew also put on crude stage play productions in their largest hut, which, for these occasions, was referred to as the Royal Terror Theater, as the nearby Mount Terror looked on with only vague interest. One performance featured crew members dressed in drag or as police officers, delivering a raucous comedy routine greatly enjoyed by Scott. Another was a minstrel show, an extinct genre of stage performance in which actors displayed negative stereotypes of African-American people in comedic settings while donning blackface makeup. As the weather warmed, Scott assembled a small group of explorers for a daring journey to venture as far south as possible. At first, he considered only himself and his close friend, Dr. Wilson, to go on their trek. But on Wilson's suggestion, he chose to elect a third member, since if one of the two men were to meet some unfortunate incident, it would spell disaster. Commander Scott elected the trusty Ernest Shackleton. On the 2nd of November, 1902, the core team of Scott, Wilson, and Shackleton began their journey after writing their farewell letters, just in case. They were accompanied by a troop of dogs and supporting parties that would pull supplies along their route and create depots along the way to be used on the trio's return trip. 
by the 15th of November, all the supporting parties had turned back to return to base camp, leaving only the Corps 3 to venture on, who by now had already surpassed Borchgrevink's farthest south record. Unfortunately, their lack of knowledge with sled dogs slowed their progress. To make matters worse, the dog food they had brought had spoiled, which led to the dogs quickly starving and growing weak. Wilson killed the weakest to feed the stronger ones. Soon, the surviving dogs could only manage to walk alongside Scott, Wilson and Shackleton as they had to haul the sledges themselves. Moreover, the team began displaying symptoms of scurvy on the count of their insufficient supplies. Shackleton worsened more than the others. Eating fresh meat, like that of the dogs, would have greatly helped them, but Scott's sentimentality prevented them from doing such a thing. They also suffered from snow blindness, a painful irritation of the eyes caused by prolonged unprotected exposure to the endless reflective blanket of snow and ice. At one point, Wilson resorted to pulling the sled blindfolded to help ease the pain. On the 30th of December, the three explorers decided they had gone as far as they possibly could have and measured their latitude as 82 degrees 17 minutes south, a new record. Despite the distance traveled, they still had not stepped off the Great Ice Barrier. On their return trip, all of their remaining dogs died, and the men continued to suffer from progressively worsening scurvy and frostbite. Shackleton became so weak that he was unable to pull the sled. After 93 days of trekking, they finally reached the discovery on the 3rd of February 1903, which was now accompanied by a relief ship, the Morning, bringing with her fresh supplies as scheduled. The original plan was then to have the Morning travel with the discovery back to England. However, upon Scott's return, he found his ship to be still firmly locked in ice, miles away from open water. To everyone's dismay, it became clear that their stay in Antarctica was far from over. Sir Clements Markham had privately anticipated that the discovery would still be icebound, so he had the captain of the morning deliver a secret letter to Scott, giving him permission to extend the mission by one more year. Commander Scott took this opportunity to reduce the number of crew that would stay with him by nine, placing them aboard the morning that would then take them back home. This number included Ernest Shackleton, who Scott deemed too unwell to continue to stay on the ice. Shackleton understood his position, but was greatly saddened to part ways. He wept as the morning sailed away from Antarctica. Commander Scott privately wrote that he was pleased to be rid of all the men who he had sent away, apart from Shackleton. In early March, the remaining Discovery team prepared for another cold, dark winter, which, according to Scott, was spent efficiently, with apparently none of the men feeling disheartened or miserable as they kept themselves busy with catching and eating wildlife, expanding their scientific and geological knowledge of the region, and playing outdoor sports. During this time, Scott devised a program of another likely perilous journey, this time bound west to explore the Ferrar Glacier named after the geologist on the expedition, Hartley T. Farrar. In October, Scott and a team of 11 set out to travel through the expanse of the glacier. The party went through many struggles, such as a steady increase of altitude, which put their sledges of supplies and the men who pulled them under great strain. In the first days of November, the team set up camp at an altitude of 7,000 feet. A serious gale prevented them from moving onward for a week. Inside their tent, they took turns reciting the book, Voyage of the Beagle, by Sir Charles Darwin, until the men's fingers were too cold to turn the pages. After a lull in the stormy weather, the party separated into two teams, with the one led by Scott advancing to the highest point of the glacier, setting up camp at 8,900 feet above sea level. In spite of excruciatingly painful daily winds and consistent temperatures of negative 30 to 40 degrees Fahrenheit, Robert Scott and his band of hardy men continued onward beyond the glacier and were the first to walk on the Polar Plateau, a huge flatland without seeming end. Scott made the decision to turn back around the 30th of November, impressed with the endurance of his men. 
On the return trip to the glacier, the team encountered yet more unforgiving weather, with Scott unable to confidently determine their location or direction since there was no discernible landmass anywhere in sight. The loss of their navigation tables in a blizzard did not help matters. In mid-December, the party of three, comprising of Scott, Petty Officer Evans, and Royal Navy Seaman William Lashley, suffered a great fall into a crevice, bruising badly but rising again with no broken limbs. To their delight, they had fallen into the summit of the Ferrar Glacier. A couple more near-death plummets ensued, after which point they experienced a relatively peaceful march back to the Discovery, which they finally reached on Christmas Eve. Scott, Evans, and Lashley had traveled over a thousand miles in 81 days, pulling their supply sledge through sheer manpower alone. Meanwhile, Dr. Wilson led several expeditions to examine the Emperor Penguin Rookery in the nearby Cape Crozier. Since the Emperor was considered to be the most primitive of birds, Wilson felt that a missing link to reptiles could be witnessed if one were to examine the embryo of a young Emperor Penguin egg. However, when his party reached Cape Crozier, they found fresh hatchlings and no unhatched eggs. He theorized that to retrieve a young Emperor Penguin egg, one would have to visit the rookery during the brutally cold Antarctic winter. Wilson left his theories unconfirmed, vowing to return and hopefully finish his research in another expedition. On New Year's Day, 1904, nearly 20 miles of icy separation stood between the Discovery and open waters, an unfortunate sight for Scott. The 4th of January welcomed the arrival of not one, but two relief ships, the returning morning and alongside her, a whaling ship, the Terra Nova, which were to do their utmost to free the discovery from the ice. If it was deemed an impossible task, then it was entirely likely that the crews would have to consider the discovery lost, trapped in ice for all time, and abandon her. In any case, the Royal Navy made it clear that there would be no more costly relief missions. Fortunately, by the 23rd of January, more and more ice began to break away, and the morning and Terra Nova etched closer and closer. The use of explosives helped to tear apart the ice, but was proven to be only minimally effective. By mid-February, the ice continued to naturally break apart, and the trio of ships were virtually side by side. The last of the imprisoning sea ice was beginning to crack in many places and was bound to loosen its hold over the ship shortly, but Scott grew impatient and wanted to expedite the departure with more explosives. The charges tore apart the ice, water bubbled through the fresh cracks, and the discovery was freed. On the 16th of February, the three ships made their long and stormy way back to England, finally docking in Portsmouth on the 10th of September, 1904. Upon their return, the men were welcomed by an enthusiastic public, eager to hear of what happened on their trip. The officers were awarded Arctic medals and an array of other awards for their achievements. As for Scott, People looked to him like a national hero who braved unimaginably merciless conditions and gallantly returned to tell the tale. He was showered with various medals and awards, some even from overseas, and was promoted to the rank of captain. He was also invited by King Edward VII to come to his Balmoral Castle in Scotland and deliver a lecture of the Antarctic, after which Scott was given the honor of being declared commander of the Royal Victorian Order a title one step under knighthood. The following year kept the captain busy as he launched a lecture tour across the country. In its aftermath, Scott finally settled down and was granted one year's leave from the Navy to finish writing a book about the Discovery Expedition, something he had attempted to do via diary entries during his time in Antarctica, but evidently failed. In spite of his editor's compliments, Captain Scott remained humble doubtful of his writing skills, stating, Of all things, I dread having to write a narrative, and am wholly doubtful of my capacity. 
The two-volume Voyage of the Discovery was published in late 1905 and became a modest success, with both the critics and the reading public applauding Scott's beautiful and skillful command of the English language. The books, however, helped stir something inside Ernest Shackleton, who felt that it was due to his poor performance that the trio of explorers had not gone further. After reading of the events portrayed in the book, Shackleton vowed to prove himself to be a better man than before and venture back to Antarctica. There were rumors of a possible rift between Shackleton and Scott, though at the time, both in public and in private, they were on very amicable terms. However, in a private letter written to founder of Stanford's travel bookshop, Edward Stanford, Scott stated that upon observing a new updated map of Antarctica in Stanford's London Atlas series, he was caught aback at the sight of the farthest south spot reached being credited to quote-unquote Scott and Shackleton. According to Captain Scott, this implied dual leadership, which was not the case. Stanford wrote back, clarifying that no one disputed Scott was the only leader and offered to remove Shackleton's name from future publications. Whether this was a display confirming a rivalry between the two explorers is debatable, as Scott was well within his right to dispute the claim made by the creators of the map, for he was undoubtedly the one true commander of the trek. Further tension escalated the situation in February 1907. Not long after approaching the Royal Geographical Society about leading another Antarctic expedition, Captain Scott learned that Ernest Shackleton had also proposed plans for his own venture, asking the Society for their approval and funding. Sir Clements Markham, now Vice President of the Council, publicly supported Shackleton in his upcoming quest, leaving himself open for any future advice and guidance. Shackleton had hoped to recruit a significant contingent from the Discovery Expedition, but most, including Dr. Edward Wilson, declined the offer. One of the men he had invited inadvertently revealed that they had agreed to remain open to join Scott's proposed but yet largely unplanned expedition. Shackleton's original plans were to set up his base of operations in McMurdo Sound, the same area that was occupied by Scott's crew for two years. Upon hearing this, Scott initiated a letter correspondence with Shackleton, asking him to accept that McMurdo Sound was Scott's territory and that it should remain untouched until he returned. In private letters, which clashed with his stance as perceived by Shackleton, Sir Clements Markham wrote to Scott in agreement that Shackleton had behaved shamefully and it grieved him that such a harmonious expeditionary team, like that of the Discovery, could have such a black sheep. Wilson joined in on the discourse as well and took on a more aggressive tone, telling Shackleton that he should retire from McMurdo Sound and not perform any work in the Ross Sea region until Scott made clear what limits he set for his base. After continuous aggression from several parties, Ernest Shackleton signed a declaration on the 17th of May, making clear that he was leaving McMurdo Sound and its neighboring Victoria Land to Captain Scott meaning he had to forfeit some of his original objectives, such as reaching the South Magnetic Pole located within Victoria Land. With the matter seemingly settled, Shackleton and his crew set sail aboard the Nimrod, an old Norwegian sealing vessel that was only half the size of the Discovery. As she approached the intended landing zone in early 1908, Shackleton saw that the coastline had changed significantly since his time on the Discovery and had to find another place to land. After extensive searching and attempts, the Nimrod failed to find a suitable location. To avoid the danger of calving ice from the Great Ice Barrier or rapidly approaching ice on the water that may trap the ship, Shackleton made the decision to set up camp at the safest place he knew, McMurdo Sound, breaking his word to Scott. The decision would impact his relationship with the RGS and irreconcilably ruin that with Wilson, who wrote that Shackleton broke his word and dared not speak to him again. Scott, on the other hand, was no doubt disappointed but understanding of the situation. After establishing a base camp and building their prefabricated huts, the men of the Nimrod proceeded to carry out a myriad of tasks and experiments, which included ascending to the top of the active volcano, Mount Erebus. 
the Nimrod expedition was also the first time that a motor car was used on the ice. Unfortunately, it was found to be useful in only very specific circumstances, namely expansive planes of smooth, flat ice, which were quite rare. The team made some use of the old discovery hut, which, when they had discovered it, had its door blown open by winds and its interior thoroughly covered in snow. They used it mostly for storage of equipment, food, oil, and other matters. During the cold, dark months of winter, a number of members took part in creating the so-called first book to be ever published in Antarctica, Aurora Australis, an account of experiences and activities by the crew. Less than a hundred copies were ever produced, and were eventually distributed amongst crew members and their families. In October, Shackleton and three other men set out to conquer the geographic South Pole, hoping to overcome his shame for contributing to the poor performance of the previous South Pole effort. Since he experienced firsthand the horrors of the dying sledge dogs during the Discovery expedition, this time round, Shackleton opted to experiment with using Manchurian ponies to pull the sledges. The four ponies greatly helped the team as they surpassed the farthest south latitude achieved by Scott, Wilson, and Shackleton in only half the time. One by one though, the ponies began struggling to make it through the terrain of the ice barrier. The first pony was shot and killed in mid-November. Its meat was collected to be cooked later. As they traveled further, the ground beneath them became more treacherous to walk upon, which led to the ultimate demise of two more ponies. In early December, Shackleton's team discovered an immensely long and steep glacier which seemed to take them in the direction of the South Pole, thus avoiding the crossing of the perilous mountain ranges on either side. Shackleton christened it the Beardmore Glacier, named after Scottish industrialist Sir William Beardmore, who had generously sponsored the expedition. On the 7th of December, the team's last remaining pony fell into a crevice nearly taking the life of one of the men. The day after Christmas, the four men had completed their climb up the glacier and set foot atop the polar plateau. In the early days of January 1909, Shackleton came to terms that they did not have enough supplies to reach the South Pole and get back to base camp, so he adjusted the team's mission to travel to within 100 miles of the pole. On the 9th of January, the men made one last dash to get as far as possible, leaving their sledges behind, before stopping at latitude 88 degrees 23 minutes south, a mere 97 geographical miles away from the South Pole. This would have in fact equated to around 111 statute miles, or the more common measurement of distance, but the detail regarding the different types of miles was largely omitted from public records of their trek to enhance their image of success. Shackleton later wrote, On January the 9th of this year, 1909, the British flag was hoisted in latitude 88 degrees 23 minutes south and longitude 162 degrees east. We reached a point within 97 geographical miles of the South Pole. The only thing that stopped us from reaching the actual point was the lack of 50 pounds of food. After marking their location and planting the Union Jack, Shackleton turned his team back north. On the return trip, members of the team began experiencing enteritis, or inflammation of the small intestine, caused by consuming tainted pony meat. Nevertheless, they struggled ahead, encountering blizzards and rapidly diminishing rations. Shackleton's men darted for their camp and reached it on the final day of February, with the Nimrod nowhere in sight. They set fire to a small hut used for magnetic observations. The ship, which was anchored in a safer location nearby, noticed the smoke and came to rescue the team. Meanwhile, back in England, Robert Scott was engaging in an affair with accomplished sculptor and socialite Kathleen Bruce, while her other suitor, upcoming novelist Gilbert Cannon, was overseas. Scott's persistent insistence resulted in his and Bruce's wedding in September 1908. In early 1909, 
His prospering career and personal life were interrupted when England first heard that Ernest Shackleton had come within 100 miles of reaching the South Pole. Words of congratulations overwhelmed the British public. The news spread faster and reached more people than the news of the Discovery Expedition due to the greater number of printing newspapers. Sir Clements Markham publicly expressed wishes to propose to Shackleton the Royal Geographical Society's Patron's Medal. However, the duplicitous Markham cast doubts on Shackleton's claims in private conversations. Scott apparently confirmed with his mentor his own suspicions concerning the farthest southern point reached. It is possible that Markham was not able to overcome his undoubtable bias towards the captain, his protege, who he greatly wanted to become the one to plant the British flag on the South Pole. Markham had even asked the RGS to delicately scrutinize Shackleton's calculations and findings, even though they had been vetted and confirmed for accuracy by several parties. Nevertheless, like Scott before him, Shackleton received a medal from the RGS, though members of the society made sure that it was not so large as that which was presented to Captain Scott. On the 14th of June, Shackleton's return to England was welcomed by thousands in attendance at London's Charing Cross station, unfazed that his team had not actually reached the pole. Shackleton was accompanied by his wife Emily, along with President of the RGS Major Leonard Darwin, former President Sir Clements Markham, and Captain Robert Scott. The two Antarctic rivals reportedly shared a handshake, and Scott cried a cheery bravo, after which point Shackleton and his wife embarked on a parade in horse-drawn carriage through the city, observed by excited onlookers all along the way. Like Captain Scott before him, Ernest Shackleton was also awarded the rank of CVO, or Commander of the Victorian Order. But unlike Scott, just a few months later, the King of England awarded Shackleton with a knighthood. Afterwards, Sir Ernest Shackleton went on an extensive lecture and presentation tour detailing his exploits by dramatic oration, never failing to commend his team members. Shackleton stated, Those fourteen men, who are my comrades, who regardless of self, denied themselves in every possible way to promote the success of the expedition. And it has been through them that we have achieved the measure of success that the country deems to think we have done. He also received unmitigated admiration from noted North Polar explorers Fritjof Nansen and Roald Amundsen. No doubt, this only pushed Scott harder to best the best and to take the pole for himself. As Markham himself had stated, Scott was bitten by polar mania. On the 13th of September, 1909, Captain Robert Scott publicly announced his second Antarctic expedition. A brochure intending to raise funds for the mission stated that the main objective was to reach the South Pole in the name of the British Empire. He did not reveal his ambitious scientific goals, as the quest for the Pole was a more alluring topic through which he could garner public support. Since this was the height of polar exploration, Scott was well aware of other upcoming expeditions, so had to arrange his own quickly. Japanese and Australian-led Antarctic ventures were revealed to be in the works, as well as a journey to conquer the North Pole by Roald Amundsen. However, the Norwegians' plans were soured by disputed claims that American explorers Robert Peary and Frederick Cook had reached the North Pole already. Outlining his plans to the World Geographical Society, Scott added that it was an explorer's plain duty not only to create a record of his movements, but to take full advantage of the opportunity to study natural phenomena. The Society expressed their hopes that the captain's expedition would focus first on scientific observations, with conquering the Pole a secondary objective. In contrast to the Discovery expedition, Scott's new journey would not be run nor funded by the RGS nor the Royal Society, but be considered a privately funded venture with an estimated cost of £40,000. The day following Scott's announcement for his expedition welcomed the birth of his son, 
Peter Markham Scott, bearing the name of Captain Scott's mentor and most devout supporter. In response to a call for volunteers to join him, Scott received over 8,000 applications from which to choose only the best, truly witnessing how lucrative it had become to want to be part of polar exploration. Out of thousands, the captain chose seven who had previously traveled with him aboard the Discovery, including Petty Officer Edgar Evans, Seaman Tom Crean, and William Lashley, and Scott's most trusted confidant, Dr. Edward Wilson, who was put in charge of the entire scientific team, which would prove to be the most accomplished group of scientists yet to set foot on Antarctica. The team included meteorologist George Simpson, biologists Dennis Lilly and Edward Nelson, Canadian physicist Charles Wright, and geologists Thomas Griffith Taylor, Raymond Priestley, and Frank Debenham. 23-year-old Apsley Cherry Garrard applied to be part of Scott's scientific team, inspired by stories of his own late father's heroic exploits in the British Army. His application was initially rejected. Having inherited a grand fortune after the death of his father, Cherry Garrard sent in another, this time promising to contribute £1,000 to the expedition if he were accepted. Scott rejected this offer as well, but young Cherry donated his contribution regardless. Touched by this gesture, Scott reconsidered and was further convinced by Wilson, who agreed to add him to the team as an assistant zoologist. Herbert Ponting a professional photographer who was best known for stunning imagery of Asia was asked to join to create a visual record of the expedition via both photographs and moving pictures taken with his cinematograph. Scott himself would provide a detailed written record of the journey by writing near daily entries in his diary. He sought to write as eloquently as possible making his own edits and alterations as he wrote, to save time for the editor when preparing the book for publication. He signed a contract with the Central News Agency, which would be acting as the sole worldwide distributor of his writings, and he was obliged to provide 8 to 10,000 words by the end of the expedition. In return, the captain would be paid 2,500 pounds. The expedition was also provided with a generous number of Royal Navy officers. Lieutenant Edward Evans, no relation to Petty Officer Evans, had served on the morning, Discovery's relief ship, and had been gathering funds for his own Antarctic venture. But after Captain Scott offered him the position to be second in command, the lieutenant transferred all of his funds in support of the captain and joined the crew. Other officers of the Royal Navy included surgeons George Levick and Edward Atkinson. The young Henry Bowers was a lieutenant with the Royal Indian Marines and was recommended to join the team by Sir Clements Markham. During his first introduction to the team, Bowers suffered a blundersome fall down an open hatch of the ship, falling 19 feet down. To the amazement of former Royal Navy officer Lieutenant Victor Campbell, who stood witness, he brushed himself off and carried on unhurt. Bowers earned the nickname Birdie due to his prominent nose and was likely the shortest member of the expedition. In spite of his clumsy first impression, he soon proved his worth as one of the most enthusiastic and hard-working men on the team. Lawrence Oates, a captain of the British Army, contributed 1,000 pounds of his own fortune to the expedition and volunteered his services. Scott hired him largely for his expertise in horses. Captain Scott observed the published findings of Ernest Shackleton's Nimrod expedition and made his plans accordingly, following his lead when it was deemed successful. Scott felt that purely man-hauling to the South Pole was an impossible task and elected to use a variety of modes of transportation. Sled dogs were a must, but to prevent the mismanagement of the animals this time round, he recruited adventurer, linguist, and dog handler Cecil Mears to be in charge of acquiring and managing the dogs. Influenced by Shackleton, Scott also wanted to use ponies and would leave them in the care of Captain Oates. However, Oates could not join the expedition until a much later point, so the task of acquisitioning 19 ponies and 34 dogs in Siberia fell in the hands of Mears, 
who had no experience at all with ponies. Captain Scott noted that Shackleton's strongest ponies were white and provided mirrors with only this request when purchasing the animals. While in Russia, Mears recruited dog driver Dmitry Gerov and pony minder Anton Omolchenko. Shackleton had little success with his motor vehicle, so Scott had asked for the development of a simple motorized sledge that would propel itself by use of wheels turning a state-of-the-art caterpillar track in the hopes that it would operate more efficiently over difficult terrain. This request was fulfilled by the Wolseley Tool and Motor Car Company, and Scott hired naval engineering officer and discovery crewmate Reginald Skelton to be its chief operator and mechanic. Scott and Skelton took the sledges for testing in Norway and were assisted by the famed polar explorer Fridtjof Nansen. Nansen encouraged Scott's team to use skis and recommended that 21-year-old ski expert Trygve Gran go with him to train the men. He was hired in an instant. While in Norway, Scott tried to telephone Roald Amundsen regarding a cooperation of sorts, since the Norwegian would soon set out to explore the North Pole. Amundsen failed to answer Scott's calls. Gran even brought Captain Scott to Amundsen's home, but he was not present to their disappointment. Lieutenant Evans surprisingly had some misgivings with Skelton's place on the expedition, as Commander Skelton outranked him. Skelton was curious as to why it took so long for Lieutenant Evans to express his distrust, and even offered to take a civilian role to please Evans, but Skelton's offer was refused. To quell the commotion, Scott was forced to remove Skelton from his team, a tremendous loss of the motor engine's engineer and mechanic. Bernard Day, who was the chief operator and mechanic for the motor car used on the Nimrod expedition, was instead recruited to operate and maintain the three motor sledges designed for Scott's expedition, which was still in need of a ship. Scott had hoped to acquire the Discovery, but it was already in use. He instead opted to spend 30% of his mission's funding to purchase the Terra Nova, the whaling and sealing vessel which was one of the two relief ships that had come to the Discovery's aid in 1904 and was in need of refurbishing. Thankfully, many generous members of the public helped by contributing donations to the expedition. A further £20,000 was provided by the government in the form of a grant. Further funds were received from company sponsorships, which would in return receive promotional photographs of Captain Scott and his crew advertising their products. Most of the crew departed from Cardiff aboard the Terra Nova on the 15th of June, 1910. Scott himself was not on the ship as he was still on fundraising duty. In his absence, Lieutenant Evans was in charge, and along with Dr. Wilson, they were some of the most senior and outstanding members of the crew. Cherry Garrard reflected that Wilson had a wealth of knowledge about all things, big and small, was as unselfish as possible, and was ready to divulge sympathy, insight, and advice to all who sought it. During their trip, the ship came in contact with a huge variety of wildlife, which Wilson would delicately depict onto paper. Captain Robert Scott took a fast passenger ship and in the middle of August, met up with the Terra Nova again while she was anchored in South Africa. From there, the team sailed on to Australia. While stopped in Melbourne, Captain Scott was given a dreadful telegram, the wording of which is debated, but the message basically read, Beg leave to inform. Heading south. Amundsen. Roald Amundsen had already received all the public and private funding necessary to carry out his Arctic expedition when the American explorers, Cook and Peary, each claimed the North Pole for themselves. This discouraged Amundsen from exploring the North, and instead set his sights on the South. He kept his plan secret for more than a year, knowing that his financial backers would surely not accept such a drastic change of plan. It was only well after his ship, the Fram had departed Norway, did Amundsen inform his own crew and then Captain Scott that he had changed his course from the North Pole to the South Pole. In addition, sailing south would mean he would be bringing himself into a race for the Pole with Captain Scott and would risk offending the British, 
for they were the newly independent Norway's strongest ally. Furthermore, Norway's Queen Maud was the granddaughter of Queen Victoria of England. Amundsen only made his secret plans public when there was no opportunity for anyone to back out or turn back. And naturally, when the news broke in Europe, Amundsen's nefarious scheme was near universally condemned. When Scott and his crew learned of Amundsen's quest for the pole, they were understandably perturbed, as the Norwegian explorer had built up a reputation for being a meticulous planner. However, Captain Scott refused to entertain the idea of a race to the South Pole. No matter what the outcome was, he told the men that they would carry out their objectives as planned and would not sacrifice advances in science and understanding just to capture the South Pole first. Gran was left in an awkward position as the sole Norwegian on the team and was worried the captain would resent his presence, though fortunately it was not the case at all. Scott remained confident in his crew's ability, though privately, he believed Amundsen had a fair chance of success. The Terra Nova then sailed off to the port town of Littleton, New Zealand, which by now had become very well known for being the final rest and resupply stop before Antarctic explorers sailed away for the Great White Silence. It was here that the ship was reloaded with fresh supplies, copious amounts of coal, the three motorized sledges, and the 34 dogs and 19 ponies from Siberia. Upon seeing the condition of the ponies, Lawrence Oates was horrified. He reckoned, perhaps half-jokingly, that they were purchased at a cost of five pounds each and were too old for the job, declaring that Captain Scott's ignorance regarding the marching animals was colossal. Oates disagreed with Scott on many occasions, but Scott noted that it was the result of Oates's pessimistic outlook on most things in life. The ponies were kept in a cramped makeshift stable below deck. The bunk room of the seamen was directly underneath, and not infrequently, pony urine would drip from the ceiling onto them. The Terra Nova finally steamed away on the 26th of November, with a dock in full attendance of admiring well-wishers. During the departure, Petty Officer Evans drunkenly fell into the water, disgracing the image of the ship, and was almost left behind in New Zealand. But due to his history of resourcefulness and strength, the captain chose to overlook the incident. After some vague excuses, Petty Officer Evans soon carried on with his duties as if nothing transpired, much to the annoyance of Scott. This incident increased tensions between Scott and his second-in-command, Lieutenant Evans, who thought that the petty officer's permitted return was a poor show of discipline and threatened to resign from the expedition unless some matters were resolved. There was also talk of some crew members quitting alongside the lieutenant as a show of solidarity, though the row was quickly subdued. The ship made one last stop on the 29th in Port Chalmers, where Captain Scott, Lieutenant Evans, and Dr. Wilson bid one final farewell to their wives, who had a reputation of launching attacks at each other out of jealousy, with all the wives urging their husbands to be more forceful and commanding than the others. Kathleen Scott in particular was known to be too over-controlling over the affairs of the ship and her crew. Of Kathleen, Birdie Bowers wrote, Nobody likes her on the expedition, and the painful silence when she arrives is the only jarring note of the whole thing. There is no secret that she runs us all just now, and what she says is done, through the captain. Now nobody likes a schemer, and she is one undoubtedly. We all feel that the sooner we are away, the better. In a letter to his mother, Captain Oates wrote of an apparent altercation between the wives. Mrs. Scott and Mrs. Evans have had a magnificent battle. They tell me it was a draw after 15 rounds. Mrs. Wilson flung herself into the fight after the 10th round, and there was more blood and hair flying about the hotel than you see in the Chicago slaughterhouse in a month. The husbands got a bit of the backwash. With the wives left ashore, the Terra Nova then sluggishly left the civilized world behind her. The ship was heavily overloaded with it cruising a full foot lower in the water than it comfortably should have, packed as densely and tightly as possible. 
The month of December opened with strong winds. Scott remarked that the ponies looked miserable, swaying under the constant throes of rough seas. The dogs, likewise, chained to the deck of the ship, were pitifully bearing the cold lashings of the sea, their fur thoroughly wet. On the 2nd of December, the Terra Nova came under ferocious attack of wind and sea. Waves loosened the lashings holding heavy bags of coal in place, which then acted as battering rams and began to beat and break other holdings of supplies, such as petrol and forage for the animals. The crew worked tirelessly, trying to resecure the coal, all while periodic waves washed over the deck, momentarily submerging the men in full. To further add to the trouble, water was leaking down into the engine room. To combat the rapidly increasing water, water pumps were used, but their alleviation of the issue was minimal. The boilers heated up the ocean water around them, which made the already challenging and dangerous maintenance operation near impossible. Leaving the pumps to dribble, Lieutenant Evans organized two parties of men to bail out water by use of buckets, which amazingly kept the water level below deck steady with little, if any, increase. The men sang sea shanties as they struggled to save the ship from sinking with buckets alone. The waves punished the animals severely. Two ponies perished during the storm. Oates was with the animals at their stables throughout the ordeal, trying with all his might to keep them standing. Meanwhile, the dogs on deck were at great risk of drowning, with only the chains linked to their collars saving them from being swept away. One dog was eventually found dead, hanging overboard. Another's chain broke, and he was washed away by a wave. Miraculously, another wave brought him right back onto the deck. By the next day, the men devised a more efficient pumping system, and the storm subsided. During the struggle, they had lost 10 tons of coal, 65 gallons of petrol, and a case of the biologist's alcoholic spirit. In the second week of December, members of the crew were briefly visited by seabirds. Dolphins were also nearby, which, according to Scott, made the bellies of the hungry men ache. After some reports of ice up ahead, around the 8th of the month, the crew began observing the growing number of icebergs, some reaching 80 feet in height. On the 10th, Scott wrote in his journal that the ship had reached pack ice or layers of ice floating on the ocean, close to a month sooner than expected. The crew grew cheerful as they were visibly coming ever closer to Antarctica. Dr. Wilson shot down a couple of Antarctic petrels for food. Others managed to shoot four crab-eater seals and pulled them up on deck to later feast on. By the 11th of December, the ship was firmly surrounded by flows of ice, some more than two feet thick. The steel-enforced Terra Nova broke through the ice with no trouble. Cinematographer Herbert Ponting recorded the ship cutting apart the ice sheets by hanging off the side of the ship, supported by a makeshift harness, while resting on wooden planks suspended overboard. They occasionally stopped when the ice flows were more stable, so some of the crew members could exit the ship and practice their skiing skills on the ice. It was here that Edward Atkinson tested out a blubber stove of his own design that would be used in Antarctica. It was a portable cooking apparatus that used seal blubber as fuel. It was proven to be very effective, though naturally, it produced a distinct and unpleasant smell of burning blubber. After a promising start, the Terra Nova was slowed down by formidable flows of ice but the men kept their spirits up and their bodies and minds active by carrying out a myriad of activities, including practicing sledge pulling, skiing, driving dog teams, taking sea temperature measurements at varying depths, and noting meteorological data. Dr. Wilson managed to capture an Adelie penguin on the ice. Atkinson dissected it and found in its intestines a new type of tapeworm with a propeller-shaped head. By the 22nd of December, the ship had experienced very varied conditions, which turned from smooth sailing to perilous avoidance of icebergs and back again very quickly. On Christmas Day, while the Terra Nova was surrounded by near uninterrupted ice from all sides, the crew celebrated with a rich dinner prepared by the team's chef, 
Thomas Clissold. After dinner, the company spent close to five hours drinking and singing, with the merchant sailors performing much of their grand repertoire of sea shanties. Herbert Ponting entertained the men with his banjo playing and off-key singing, forcing Scott to depart company to avoid a headache. Tom Crean's rabbit, which he had smuggled on board, surprisingly gave birth to 17 babies, which he then gave away to some wanting seamen. On the 30th of December, after 20 days of traversing through the ice pack, they finally reached open waters. In his diary, Robert Scott praised his men. The spirit of the enterprise is as bright as ever. Everyone strives to help everyone else, and not a word of complaint or anger has been heard on board. There is a rush to be the first when work is to be done, and the same desire to sacrifice selfish consideration to the success of the expedition. It is very good to be able to write in such high praise of one's companions, and I feel that the possession of such support ought to ensure success. Fortune would be in a hard mood indeed if it allowed such a combination of knowledge, experience, ability, and enthusiasm to achieve nothing. The beginning of 1911 brought sightings of Antarctic land for the first time as they entered the Ross Sea. By the 3rd of January, they were in clear sight of the Great Ice Barrier up ahead, but rough seas prevented the Terra Nova from landing. On the 4th, Captain Scott, Dr. Wilson, and Lieutenant Evans spied the ideal place for unloading the ship and setting up camp. It was a cape that was originally discovered 10 years before by Scott, and it was now christened Cape Evans in honor of Scott's second-in-command. After deciding on the location, a lengthy period of unloading cargo ensued. Two of the motor sledges were safely unloaded onto land, but the third was lost after it strongly impacted the ice below, which then broke apart, causing the sled to sink into the water. Captain Scott wasted no time in blaming himself for the loss of the motor, for he was the captain and took the blame even for mishaps beyond his control. Though instead of dwelling on it, he used misfortune to his advantage and only pushed himself harder and made himself more openly optimistic. The surviving motor sledges were quickly put to good use. Each could pull up to two tons of cargo at a top speed of three miles per hour. On pleasant terrain, the sledges were proven to be greatly useful. The ponies were hoisted down from the ship next, one by one. After an uncomfortably long trek, they were visibly overjoyed at touching down on a great expanse of ice and snow once more. The dog soon followed. One of the dogs, Makaka, was accidentally run over by the sledge he was helping to pull. He suffered injuries, but quickly carried on with his tasks. In addition to the ponies and dogs, the ship's crew brought with them a solitary black cat. Nigger, our mascot, was also glad to be ashore. His was the proud distinction of having been farther south than any cat that was ever a kitten. He was in fine spirits. Next came the assembly of the main hut, which came prefabricated in the ship in smaller pieces and then reassembled on shore. The main reasons for not using the same hut that was built by the discovery team or the same location was because the old hut was proven to be too cold, and the plan was to allow for the Terra Nova to depart Cape Evans and then return the following year while the shore party carried on working and living in Antarctica. On the 5th of January, Ponting observed a remarkably shaped grotto in an iceberg and proceeded to take a series of photographs and moving pictures of its exterior and interior, as physicist Charles Wright and geologist T. Griffith Taylor admired its structure, while the Terra Nova quietly waited in the far background. Over the next couple of weeks, the assembly of the main expedition hut progressed positively, though occasionally Transfer of supplies was interrupted by some near accidents caused by some jittery and suddenly frightened ponies and dogs, which would all of a sudden dart in an unexpected direction, taking their attached sledges with them. Fortunately, 
neither they nor any of the men were injured during these manic episodes. In his journal, Captain Scott complained of ski expert Grant's unwillingness to exert himself in any strenuous duties, despite his obvious physical strength, calling him lazy. He noted that Gran only became busy and hardworking when he thought that people would be looking at him or if Ponting was photographing him. Oates also privately wrote that he couldn't stand Gran, calling the so-called Norwegian chap dirty and lazy. It was around this period of unloading that photographer Ponting was close to being devoured by a curious killer whale when it tried to knock him off the ice floe he was standing on by ramming it from below. Some time later, Scott and Mears set off to check on the Discovery Hut to see if anything could be salvaged from there. They found it in a terrible state. The interior was covered with old, hardened snow, which would take weeks of hard work to remove. Under the snow, they could see the dreadful condition in which the Nimrod crew had left the hut, filthy and disheveled. Above all else, Scott was terribly disgusted at the sight of excrement stored in boxes and even in the corners of the interior by members of the Nimrod expedition. He even singled out specific offending parties of the Nimrod team, writing their names in the margin of his journal. By the 23rd of January, the hut on Cape Evans was virtually ready and made hospitable for Scott and 24 others. The captain remarked that the word hut was misleading, as their residence was more like a house of generous size with double wooden walls sandwiching an insulating layer of knitted seaweed to ensure warmth. Meanwhile, Victor Campbell was tasked with leading the Eastern Party, a team of six men that was to explore and scientifically observe King Edward VII land on the east side of the Great Ice Barrier. His men consisted of petty officers George Abbott and Frank Browning, able seaman Harry Dickinson, surgeon and zoologist George Levick, and geologist Raymond Priestley. Campbell's crew set off on their mission aboard the Terra Nova, as Scott's team wished them away. The Eastern Party was also accompanied by a geological team led by Taylor, tasked with making scientific observations during a two-month period along the Victoria Land coastline. This team was first dropped off by the ship on Butter Point. The Terra Nova then carried the Eastern Party towards their destination on King Edward VII land. On the 26th of January, Captain Scott and 12 others formed the so-called Southern Party, a team that would haul supplies to create depots at set intervals going south, which would later be used by Scott's team on their forward and return trips for the South Pole. With them came the dog teams and eight of their strongest ponies. The following day, the team first set foot on the Great Ice Barrier, which was of a softer surface than the frozen sea to which they had grown so accustomed, and was more difficult for the ponies to traverse. Scott had purchased Norwegian horse snowshoes for the ponies, but Oates had left them behind at the hut because he thought that they would be useless. They had only one set of shoes on hand just to try it out on the depot journey. Scott equipped one pony with the shoes and the change was said to be magical. Captain Scott wrote that it was a shame to have left the rest of the snowshoes behind, and no doubt must have been annoyed with Oates. Later on, Oates attempted to kill a seal for food, but with shame returned empty and bloody-handed, after his knife had slipped and slashed along the length of his hand. The team also came across two visible humps in the snow, which they uncovered and found to be abandoned tents from Shackleton's Nimrod expedition. The tent skin itself had rotten away, but the supplies inside, including cocoa, beef, sheep's tongues, and biscuits, were well preserved by the cold weather and were enjoyed by the depot laying party for the next few days. The cooker Shackleton had used was also successfully salvaged. As the southern and eastern parties continued to approach their destinations, the team of nine who remained at the hut proceeded to make the living spaces more comfortable and organized, and the scientists set up their labs to record their findings. Among them was Dr. Simpson, who created a weather observation station on a spot that was afterwards aptly named Windvane Hill. 
He also instructed members of any expeditions to periodically note their locations and corresponding temperatures to gather detailed weather data of the unknown continent. This would also help Simpson in creating a rudimentary weather forecast which he hoped would aid Captain Scott in his quest for the pole. On the 30th of January, the captain's southern party laid the so-called Safety Camp Depot, named so because the area of the barrier where it was placed was deemed unlikely to break away and fall into the sea. At the start of February, Scott revealed his plan to travel forth for a fortnight establish depots of two weeks worth of nutrients at latitude 80 degrees south and then head back to safety camp. Unfortunately, Atkinson had badly chafed his foot and it had begun to fester. He would have to be left behind at safety camp along with Tom Crean, who was tasked with taking care of him while also making scientific observations whenever possible. Scott was understandably angered by this, as it was clear that Atkinson was concealing his wound so he would not be sent back, but now his actions caused Scott's team to effectively be reduced by two. On the 2nd of February, the depot lane party departed safety camp, pulling behind them a combined total of around 1300 pounds of supplies. They established a routine of traveling during the night, a time when the never setting sun was at its lowest point and provided the crew with a more comfortable, lower temperature and harder surfaces to work in. Not long into their journey, they were stopped by a blizzard, which lasted over two days. The men stayed inside their tents quite comfortably and enjoyed good meals. The ponies outside seemed to suffer, while the dogs relaxed and snuggled up next to one another in the snow. Meanwhile, Campbell's eastern party aboard the Terra Nova was having trouble finding a suitable place to land to allow exploration of King Edward VII land, hampered by bad weather. Deciding it was for the moment inaccessible, they turned back and sailed along the barrier's edge in the hopes of exploring Victoria land due northwest. During their crossing, the ship unexpectedly encountered the Fram from Norway. Amundsen had set up his camp along an inlet named the Bay of Wales, and his team was still preparing for the southern trek later in the year. They had settled down at a point that happened to be 60 nautical miles closer to the South Pole than Scott's camp. Campbell and Amundsen exchanged civilities in spite of their rivalry. The British team even had breakfast aboard the Fram. The Norwegians returned the gesture by eating lunch on the Terra Nova. Amundsen was relieved to know that Scott's team was not in the possession of a wireless radio and had no ability to quickly announce that they had reached the pole. However, he was concerned upon hearing that their new motorized sledges were performing well. Amundsen offered his rivals help in establishing a camp on King Edward VII land and even suggested that they could be aided by the Norwegian's enormous collective of 116 dogs. But Campbell didn't dare to accept such an offer. He decided to instead take the Terra Nova back to base camp and inform Scott of the unpleasant encounter. Upon their return to Cape Evans, they let their two allotted ponies swim to the shore by themselves, because Campbell figured they would now be of more use to Scott. They were pulled back ashore by the men and were coaxed into drinking from a bottle of whiskey to warm themselves up. Campbell wrote a message for the captain stating what happened, which was then brought to the discovery hut. He then reorganized and set out again with his eastern party team now renaming themselves to the northern party as they changed their itinerary and took the Terra Nova to travel to and explore Victoria land in the north. Back on the barrier, the depot lane party were having problems with the ponies. It became clear that three ponies had gotten terribly feeble and did not prove much use for the mission. To further protect the ponies from the bitter wind, Scott and then later others following his lead began building walls of snow to surround their tiring steeds, though sometimes the ponies would unwittingly demolish them, necessitating a speedy rebuild. On the 12th of February, it was decided that the three weakest ponies would be led back to base camp by Lieutenant Evans and two others, leaving a crew of seven to lead two dog teams and five remaining ponies in building further depots. They were met with a blizzard, during which, unlike the others, 
Birdie Bowers wore little head and face protection. Despite worries, Bowers remained thoroughly unaffected by the sharp winds, and, along with his young friend, Cherry Garrard, were commended by Scott in his private diary. Throughout the night, he has worn no headgear but a common green felt hat kept on with a chin stay and affording no cover whatever for the ears. His face and ears remain bright red. The rest of us were glad to have thick balaclavas and wind helmets. I have never seen anyone so unaffected by the cold. Tonight, he remained outside a full hour after the rest of us had gone into the tent. He was simply pottering about the camp, doing small jobs to the sledges, etc. Cherry Garrard is remarkable because of his eyes. He can only see through glasses and has to wrestle with all sorts of inconveniences in consequence. Yet one could never guess it, for he manages somehow to do more than his share of the work. It wasn't long before the men noticed the ever-worsening condition of their remaining ponies, forcing some to haul the ponies' loads themselves, as the weakest ponies, reduced to not much more than skin and bones, would stumble alongside them. This was in part a consequence of the team's food supplies, which proved to be insufficient or incorrect nutritionally. On the 17th, Scott's depot laying team had reached 79 degrees south and decided to create one last depot before turning back and returning to their hut. Oates had suggested that they take the ponies up until latitude 80 degrees and then kill them, creating a depot of pony meat. Captain Scott was firmly against this idea, admittedly feeling sick on the count of the ponies suffering. The two men came to blows, with Oates reportedly telling Captain Scott, Sir, I'm afraid you'll come to regret not taking my advice. Scott remained firm on his stance, believing that if they were to turn back at this point, they would ensure that most if not all of their ponies could survive the trek back to Cape Evans. He reasoned that even though Oates was the expert on horses, he was poor at judging how difficult surfaces could strain the animals beyond utility. This final spot was named One Ton Depot as it consisted of well over a ton of supplies. It was covered by a large cairn, or mound of snow, standing six feet above ground, and was topped off with a flag hung from a bamboo chute to increase its visibility. On the same day, Campbell and his northern party were veritably pushed out with all of their needed supplies out of the Terra Nova and into Victoria Land. The crew of the ship were running dreadfully low on coal, and could not even risk bringing the shore party closer to land, so the team had to wade through waist-deep chilly water to reach the beach. The Terra Nova and the ship's crew promptly sailed off to New Zealand to replenish her coal supply and other necessities, leaving the expedition's numerous landing parties virtually by themselves, with no way off the ice in case the need arose. Campbell's party built their own prefabricated hut at Cape Adair, where they spent the better part of a year carrying out numerous scientific observations and studying the Adelie penguin rookery, with Levick later compiling a book of his findings. Some of the animals' activities were so vulgar that he wrote of them in ancient Greek and kept them to himself. At One Ton Depot, Captain Scott elected to divide the team into two, a faster, dog-led team consisting of Scott, Mears, Wilson, and Cherry Garrard and the slower trio of Oates, Gran, and Bowers, who would be tasked with leading the five remaining ponies back to the hut. Scott was eager to hear of the news regarding Campbell's landing on King Edward VII land, and his team made excellent progress in the first two days. Then suddenly, the dog team met near disaster as they found themselves perilously hanging over the edge of a crevice in the ice. The dogs in the middle of the line had fallen in, some were dangling in their harnesses and were held up by only the sledge on one side and the leading dog on the other side of the line. Two fell out of their straps and were left crying for help in a chasm 65 feet below. One of these was Makaka, who had previously sustained injuries and now showed signs of partial paralysis. Scott ordered Mears to go down to rescue them, but he refused. Cherry and Wilson both volunteered in his place, but Scott instead risked his own life in saving those that had fallen down, descending to attach the dogs to an alpine rope, 
which was then hoisted back up to the surface by the other men. Scott wished to remain for a while longer to conduct some scientific research and observation, but Wilson furiously convinced him to return, exclaiming that the bridge of snow he was standing on was unstable. All the dogs were eventually saved after a two-hour-long rescue mission, hugely indebted to the hard work and smart thinking of Wilson and Cherry Garrard. Though they survived, some dogs were visibly in pain, with some passing blood, a sign of internal injuries. In addition, they were growing agitated and hungry. Scott wrote that the dogs would soon feed on their own excrement if allowed the opportunity. Mears was coming to terms that he had overestimated the abilities of the dogs in such conditions and would need to reorganize the rations they had made for them, for it was clear that they could not be sustained mainly by dry biscuits. Meanwhile, trailing behind, Oates and the others were leading their five ponies back to Hut Point. Along the way, they spotted a snow cairn in the distance, silhouetted against the sky. They were curious about its origins, but did not deviate from their course to investigate. Not long after, they came across another cairn, this time near enough for them to examine further. A hastily written note by Lieutenant Evans was found at the site, informing the men that this and the previous cairn were the final resting places of the two oldest and weakest ponies of the three that Scott had sent back on the 12th of February. Scott received this news from Evans himself on the 22nd, when Scott, Mears, Wilson, and Cherry Garrard finally reached safety camp. Evans and his team were there already, along with their last remaining pony which was now being very well tended to and generously fed. The captain was also concerned that Crane and the afflicted Atkinson had departed the camp without leaving any note behind, a thoughtless proceeding according to Scott. He had to assume that they had returned to the hut, hopefully safely. After a short rest and replenishing of stomachs and spirits, the men set out again. Along their path, they stopped at Hut Point the site of the old Discovery Hut, which was visibly cleared of snow and recently lived in. They uncovered a spot on the wall which marked the site of a bag of mail addressed to Captain Scott, but there was nothing there to be found. Scott assumed that Atkinson and Crane had stayed in the hut for a while and took the mail themselves, as Scott's team did not arrive as early as expected. They found tracks of the men leading back south signifying that Atkinson and Crean had gone back to safety camp at around the same time the captain was making his way to the hut. Growing anxious, Scott and his men released a great sigh of relief upon seeing a tent pitched on the way to safety camp inhabited by the two weary travelers. It was here that Atkinson delivered a troubling letter to Scott, which was signed by Campbell. It wrote of the Eastern Party's encounter with Roald Amundsen. The news brought out an anger in Scott's team that could not be quelled for nearly an hour. Some expressed their want to go over to the Bay of Wales and have an altercation with the Norwegians. Scott, remaining calm, pointed out that the best course of action was to pretend that nothing had changed, even though Amundsen's closer starting point and large dock teams greatly threatened the British team's chances of success. On the 26th of February, Oates and the rest of the pony party arrived safely at safety camp, with all five ponies still alive, but terribly emaciated. Their condition was only made worse by a blizzard which lasted two days. On the final day of February, final packing was completed, and the men with their animals began to make their way over the frozen sea onto Hut Point, the final stop before their home base at Cape Evans. They observed that the ice on which they traveled was growing shaky and feared that it might start breaking up under their feet, but they had to take the risk and return to their home base. First, the two dog teams, steered by Wilson and Mears, departed. Bowers then set out, leading a single pony, following the tracks of the dogs. The others soon followed, pulling their weary ponies along. Bowers' steed suffered from several falls along the way despite attempts to nurture it back to health and get it to stand up on its own, it died on the 1st of March. The men then divided into smaller units, with Bowers, Crean, and Cherry leading the stronger ponies, and Scott with the others trailing a distance behind. Before turning in for the night, 
Barris cooked up a hot drink for his comrades, but mistook a bag of curry for one of cocoa. Crane drank his too quickly to notice anything was wrong. The others felt ill, but only for a short while. About two and a half hours after going to sleep, Bowers was awoken by a troubling sound. He dashed out of his tent to see that the sheet of ice on which they had pitched their tent had broken up into smaller flows. The ice had cracked right under one of their ponies, which had fallen into the water and drowned. Bowers shook awake the others, and they hurriedly gathered all the sledges and the remaining three ponies into one place atop their small ice flow. They got their ponies ready, prepped their large sledges, and made a move for the oldest and most secure ice, known as fast ice, which was at the foot of the ice barrier wall. For over six hours, they would move from flow to flow, jumping as one drifted and briefly touched the one they stood on. Sometimes, they had to push the ponies first, when the new sheets of ice bounced away too quickly for the men to cross. Their steeds seemed to wait patiently to be reunited with their carers, which touched Bowers. As they closed in on the barrier, a troop of killer whales made their presence known, observing the commotion up on the ice, their menacing black fins watching them from the water like periscopes. The decision was made to elect someone to venture back to Captain Scott's position to inform him of what had happened. It was decided that Tom Crean would go back. By himself, he was more expeditious and able to jump over the cracks in the ice. He traveled to a point which seemed more approachable and used a ski stick to climb up to the top of the ice barrier. Crean managed to spot Scott and the rest of his men atop the barrier and quickly made his way for them. The captain was now accompanied by Mears and Wilson, who sought him out upon seeing the ponies adrift on the ice and thought that Scott was with them as well. After Crean relayed his message, Scott ordered Gran, Wilson, and Mears to go back to Hut Point, leaving Crean, Oates, and himself to rescue Bowers, Cherry, and the ponies. It didn't take long for them to find the missing party down below, surrounded by killer whales. At this point, the flows had ceased drifting, and after nearly 12 hours of work, the rescue team managed to hoist up the two men and their supplies up onto the barrier using an alpine rope. It was then that the ice became noticeably unstable and thought it useless to try to take the ponies up as well. They provided the animals with generous rations, anchored the ice with their rope, and left them alone on their flow for the time being, as the exhausted men made camp above on the barrier. Scott was at first angry at Bowers for not placing his own safety as his primary priority, but Bowers argued that he had not and would not ever consider leaving anything or anyone behind. As they tried to sleep, the whales continued to ominously snort and blow below them. After a little rest, they turned out and saw that the flow with the ponies had drifted off, later being spotted a mile away by Bowers using his binoculars. The men packed their belongings and quickly made their way for the animals, which were fortunately reasonably easy to reach. Upon making a pony jump over a gap in the ice, it fell into the water and was unable to get out. Oates was forced to kill the steed to put it out of its misery by bashing an ice pickaxe into its skull. Shortly after, Scott and Cherry managed to dig out a veritable road to a safe zone and successfully rescued one pony. They tried to do the same with the last remaining animal, but it too fell into the icy water. As killer whales menacingly approached the pony, Scott gave the order to euthanize this one as well. As this was the steed which was primarily in the care of Bowers, he stressed that he ought to be the one to kill it. Oates, still shaken and covered in brain matter, was relieved to hear his words. He instructed Bowers where to strike and the pony was swiftly put out of its misery. The men and their remaining pony dejectedly made a new camp on a safe region on the ice barrier itself and decided to walk atop the barrier to return to Hut Point, which would be a longer trek and especially a tougher one on their sole pony. By the 4th of March, they made very slow progress due to the conditions of the surface on which they tread. They eventually traced sledge, foot, and pony prints to a camp led by Lieutenant Evans' team and his remaining pony. After catching up and resting,
Scott organized the first team that would go out to Hut Point, where he expected Wilson and Mears to be waiting. On the 5th, Scott and six others reached the Discovery Hut and took their rest there. The dogs were leashed outside, and from the eight ponies that had set out on the depot journey, the two survivors were housed in the hut's veranda. Wilson and Mears did their best to make the interior more habitable by constructing a rough apartment within the hut made of spare materials and storage containers to help better guard themselves from the cold and the winds. They had a near unlimited supply of 10-year-old biscuits, and after a recent exploratory venture, a hefty supply of seal meat. For the foreseeable future, they would have to make this old hut their temporary home as they waited for the sea to freeze up again and create a way back to their camp on Cape Evans. The only other unlikely alternative was to scale the neighboring volcano Mount Erebus to an altitude of around 4,000 feet and trace around a route that would lead back to the camp. After some time at the Discovery Hut, the captain thought it best to let the dogs run free at times to prevent their bodies from icing up. This resulted in some occasional infighting, but generally, the dogs were in better spirits for it. On the 15th of March, Scott was greeted with a returning geographical party led by Griffith Taylor. This new addition increased the population of the hut to 16. They exchanged many stories from their respective adventures, with Taylor giving special credit and words of merit for Petty Officer Evans, who greatly assisted him. The larger number now made themselves comfortable and took on roles which best suited them. Some took on cooking duties. Others busied themselves with the production of seal blubber lamps to help illuminate and spiritually warm up their residence. Scott reflected on their lifestyle in the hut. We gathered around the fire seated on packing cases, with a hunk of butter and a steaming tea, and life is well worth living. After lunch we are out and about again. There is little to tempt a long stay indoors, and exercise keeps us all the fitter. The falling light and approach of supper drives us home again with good appetites, about 5 or 6 o'clock, and then the cooks rival one another in preparing succulent dishes of fried seal liver. A single dish may not seem to offer much opportunity of variation, but a lot can be done with a little flour, a handful of raisins, a spoonful of curry powder, or the addition of a little boiled pea meal. Be this as it may, we never tire of our dish, and exclamations of satisfaction can be heard every night, or nearly every night. For two nights ago, Wilson proposed to fry the steel liver in penguin blubber, suggesting that the latter could be freed from all rankness. The blubber was obtained and rendered down with great care. The result appeared as delightfully pure fat free from smell, but appearances were deceptive. The fry proved redolent of penguin a concentrated essence of that peculiar flavor which faintly lingers in the meat and should not be emphasized. Three heroes got through their pannikins, or metal cups, but the rest of us decided to be contented with cocoa and biscuit after tasting the first mouthful. After supper, we have an hour or so of smoking and conversation. A cheering, pleasant hour, in which reminiscences are exchanged by company which has very literally had worldwide experience. There is scarce a country under the sun which one or another of us had not traveled in. So diverse are our origins and occupations. An hour or so after supper, we tail off one by one, spread out our sleeping bags, take off our shoes, and creep into comfort. For our reindeer bags are really warm and comfortable now that they have had a chance of drying. Thanks to the success of the blubber lamps and to a fair supply of candles, we can muster ample light to read for another hour or two. Everyone can manage 8 or 9 hours sleep without a break, and not a few would have little difficulty in sleeping the clock round, which goes to show that our extremely simple life is an exceedingly healthy one, though with faces and hands blackened with smoke, appearances might not lead an outsider to suppose it. On the 15th of March, members of the team managed to kill 11 seals at Pram Point, leaving them there to be picked up at a later point. Two days later, Captain Scott wrote a long report of his grievances regarding Trigva Gran. I sent Gran with Evans to take the sledge lunch tent over. Griffith Taylor and party en route to their second sledge were to help up the hill. 
Before reaching the gap ridges, Gran dropped down, suddenly, declaring he had a cramp in both legs. He rose up as I approached and commenced to totter about, leaning on Taylor. From the first I had scanned patience and sent him back to the hut. When we returned in the evening, I told Wilson and Atkinson to examine him thoroughly. They could find nothing wrong with him, nor could they make head or tail the symptoms he confusingly described. Both doctors were convinced that there was nothing the matter beyond some stiffness caused by the small sledge excursion of last week. I felt there was nothing for it but to tell the young man exactly what I thought of him, and I did so. At the same time, I directed him to keep clear of the fire and to go to Pram Point the next day to fetch in more blubber. Yesterday, he started on the last mission, keeping up the pretense that he could scarcely walk. When he thought he was being observed, he staggered about like a drunken man, and as he passed the sledge party at the top of the hill, he seized the opportunity to totter and fall prone. The whole thing was an elaborate pantomime to extort pity. I'm afraid it got none. Later we watched the young man descending Crater Hill. It would have been amusing had it not been so terrible to see him playing the lame man when he thought the sledge party might be looking, yet walking on briskly when he imagined himself unobserved. Such as Gran, a big hulking oaf. Absolutely without spirit, evidently he never meant to go another cold journey on the barrier, and this is the way he has evaded it. It was a terrible mistake to bring him, but now he is here, he must work and I shall see he does so, but for all practical purposes he is useless to the expedition, and all that remains is to rid oneself as far as possible of the nuisance of his presence. For himself and for the contemptuous opinion which he has earned from every member of the expedition, he appears to feel no shame whatever. Gran later confided in Dr. Wilson regarding Scott's anger, and what he was told was that the captain loathed laziness for he himself was naturally prone to idleness and prided himself on escaping his habit. The young Gran seemed to take his words to heart and learned to busy himself regularly to regain Scott's approval and trust. On another journey to retrieve a cache of frozen seal, Wright and company consumed some extra pemmican or a dried and compacted mix of meat, fat and berries provided by Lieutenant Evans. Wright believed Lieutenant Evans had taken the food from another party. He later learned that Evans had asked if he could borrow some extra pemmican from Bowers. Wright was so outraged at this indiscretion that he later went to Bowers and his team and asked them not to accept such a request anymore. Throughout the middle of March, a fierce blizzard dampened the team's spirits as they were forced to stay inside. The horrible weather also took a toll on the dogs and strong winds prevented the men from creating adequate shelters for them. A small white dog, which had previously fallen into the crevice, passed away on the 20th. The only comfort Scott found was that the continuous colder weather was chilling the seawater and increased the likelihood of the arrival of secure ice. Towards the end of the month, ice began to form between the Discovery Hut and their Cape Evans Hut. Further bad weather prevented the team from setting out but in the second week of April, the ice was secure enough, and after dividing themselves into three separate teams, they traversed the icy road back to camp, reaching it on the 13th of April. The nine residents of the Cape Evans hut rushed to welcome them home. Ponting was leading the way, and at first stopped in his tracks once he failed to recognize any of their soot-covered faces, supposing that it was the Norwegian team paying them a visit. But as they moved closer, he relaxed, and the men came to the explorer's aid. The team who stayed on Cape Evans quickly divulged the most pressing updates, including the deaths of one pony and one dog. Apart from those items, the rest of the news was welcomed. The newly arrived crew then enjoyed their first baths in three months. Afterwards, Captain Scott was treated to a tour of the hut, which had received great advances to make it as luxurious as possible. Dr. Simpson's Corner, as it was called, was an array of shelves stocked with a plethora of gizmos, self-recording instruments, electric batteries, and switchboards, all working to remotely record the various weather phenomena witnessed by the only meteorological station in Antarctica, constructed by Simpson himself. Scott then moved onto Herbert Ponting's darkroom and was given a tour of the premises by the man himself. 
He proudly displayed his photos taken during the summer and the yards upon yards of cinematograph film. Lastly, Scott observed the condition of the stables and holds for the dogs, lamenting that a significant number of the stalls would remain empty, but was glad that the animals were well looked after. Scott and a select few others could only afford a brief rest of a day or so before setting out again with ponies and long sledges to the Discovery Hut to pick up the remaining men there and any salvageable supplies. Makaka, the injured dog, was allowed to run alongside the others on their way back without the burden of having to pull sledges. However, somewhere along the way, Makaka lost his direction and disappeared out of sight. The complete Cape Evans party finally reconvened at their exceptionally comfortable hut on the 21st of April, and two days later, the sun finally set below the horizon and shrouded the land in darkness, marking the official start of winter. During these early cold and stormy days of Antarctic winter, Captain Scott would sit down at his desk in his own quarters, calculating the route to the South Pole and what supplies were to be brought with them. The issue with the dogs was simple, their rations needed to be increased. The ponies, however, would become emaciated no matter how much of their compressed fodder they ate. Furthermore, the dwindled number of just 10 ponies made the British team's capture of the pole much less likely. The depot-laying trip made it clear that they could not handle strong freezing winds and so had to set out later in the season when it became warmer. Cherry Guard noted that upon reflection of their situation, Scott had told him, this is the end of the pole. Oates then focused on training the ponies with a daily regime of exercise and feeding them with an adjusted and measured diet that was as balanced and healthy as possible, given what they had. He cared a great deal for the wretched ponies, spending much of his time at the stables. He was often accompanied by Mears and Atkinson, with whom he built strong bonds. They would routinely moan and complain about certain aspects and men of the expedition including Captain Scott. The winter of 1911 did not bring many blizzards or fierce winds, and the vast majority of nights were astoundingly quiet. The acetylene lights in the house would be turned off at 11 p.m. Private candles would sometimes remain lit until midnight, when all of the men ought to be sound asleep. Bowers were singled out by many as the loudest snorer. A single crew member would always act as a night watchman to stay awake through the night and make sure everything stayed in order. They would often rather busy themselves with additional duties come morning rather than sleep. At 7 a.m., Clissold, the cook of the hut, would wake up and start preparing breakfast and in turn wake the others with the smell of freshly prepared porridge and fried seal liver. As a strict rule, Everyone had to be awake and ready to eat breakfast before 9 a.m. to ensure that everyone could contribute a full day's work. Every morning, Dr. Simpson would sleepily stumble out of the hut to check on his weather station. He also began experimenting with small weather balloons inflated with hydrogen that would ascend up into the air, carrying a compact array of data recording instruments. Lieutenant Evans and Wright would bring their telescopes outside to observe the state of the universe. Men would wash themselves by rubbing snow all over their bodies and pretending they enjoyed it. More intense, thorough sessions of bathing were strictly reserved for the weekends. The still air would carry the sounds of men skiing, dogs or ponies running, and ice cracking for miles upon miles. And on especially cold days, one could hear the particles of their smoky breath freeze and crackle mid-air. The dogs would be taken out for exercise, though naturally, outside conditions were sometimes perilous given the sunless days. During middays of April and early May, the sun would come close enough to the horizon to offer illumination reminiscent of an hour or two before sunrise. Otherwise, their only other light source was the shine of the full moon. At the start of winter, when there was still some light at midday, 
the crew would go outside to play football, a nominal outdoor exercise. Their skills improved with every match they played. The captain singled out Seaman Frederick Hooper, Petty Officer Evans, and Seaman Tom Crean as some of their best players. Gran was said to have also been good had he not been so lazy. As a general rule, if they were to ski, the men were to ski alone, for it was the only chance they could take to spend any time in solitude. Following the tradition first started with a discovery expedition, Captain Scott relaunched the publication of the South Polar Times magazine, assigning its editorship to the capable hands of the young Cherry Garrard. A contribution box was designated for any members of the team to anonymously submit their prose, poetry, scientific accounts, and drawings. During this dark period, Ponting experimented with flash photography, with Scott noting the great power of the magnesium flashlight illuminating the landscape at long distances, theorizing that it could be used as a communicative tool as well. Wilson was known to spend two or three hours per day depicting scenes from his observations through expressive canvases of watercolor. Ever the perfectionist, if he noticed any mistakes or unsatisfactory renderings, he would tear the pictures up and start over. Captain Scott on occasion had even measured the details and dimensions of the landscapes Wilson painted and found them to be remarkably accurate. Apart from his musings in the arts, he was known by the men as undoubtedly the most knowledgeable, sincere, and selfless member of the group. Scott further wrote in his diary, Words must always fail me when I talk of Bill Wilson. I believe he really is the finest character I ever met. The closer one gets to him, the more there is to admire. Every quality is so solid and dependable. Whatever the matter, one knows Bill will be sound, shrewdly practical, intensely loyal, and quite unselfish. Add to this a wider knowledge of persons and things than is at first guessable, a quiet vein of honor and really consummate tact, and you have some idea of his values. I think he is the most popular member of the party, and that is saying much. Bertie Bowers was in charge of food management and stores in the hut, and distributions on the sledges. As Cherry Garrard held the bunk bed under him, he observed that every night, Bowers would stand on a chair and use his bunk as a desk, quietly writing down lists of remaining stores and weights. Birdie viewed difficulties as obstacles that were to be overcome and was never seen idle, always busying himself with odd chores or necessities that could be addressed. He would do his bidding to the best of his abilities, making sure that his comrades would feel comfortable. And throughout his entire stay on the mission, not once did he say a word to prompt recognition of his work, nor utter a moan of complaint. Bowers, together with Wilson, would team up near every day to record the measurements of all the numerous thermometers placed atop various positions in their surroundings. Such kind words were altogether absent from Captain Scott's diaries when referring to his second in command, Lieutenant Evans. In fact, very little is written of him or his character in Scott's journals, with more detailed and honest conversation reserved to letters he had written for his wife, Kathleen. Evans himself is a queer study. His boyish enthusiasm rallies all along till one sees clearly the childish limitations of its foundation and appreciate that it is not a rock to be built upon. Being desirous to help everyone, he is manfully incapable of doing it. There are problems ahead here, for I cannot consider him fitted for a superior position, though he is physically strong and fit for a subordinate. He seems incapable of expanding beyond the limits of an astonishingly narrow experience. It seemed that most of the men held the same sentiment, at least privately, with Debenham writing. Teddy Evans, second in command, is a very nice, jolly fellow with overflowing spirits out of sight of Scott. But he is not, unfortunately, the right man in the right place, and relations between him and the captain are rather strained, the fault, I think, being six of one and half a dozen of the other. He is great fun in company, but I don't like being alone with him. His confidences are too overwhelming and ill-advised. 
During lunches, group conversations could get heated, as the eclectic mix of explorers discussed their theories and opinions across a never-ending supply of topics, such as whether tea or cocoa contained more merits. A gramophone they had brought with them filled the hut with a warm ambience in the aftermath of dinner time, playing through a selection of contemporary and classical records. On other occasions, someone would drive the pedals for the expedition's pianola or self-playing piano. For relaxation and mental stimulation, the men had with them a wealth of donated books to flip through, and no one flipped through as many and as effortlessly as Captain Scott himself. Cherry Gard later wrote that Scott proved himself time and time again how easily he could forge friendships. He always gave great consideration and thought to any queries or suggestions that he was offered. It pleased everyone to see that Scott was a firm believer of science and would fondly discuss geological, meteorological, or other scientific subjects with the team's specialists. Even though he was not considered a particularly strong man, he sledged harder than anyone else, inspiring his crew to muster all their might. When he was not the center of attention, he was observed to be quite shy and reserved, and exceptionally emotional, almost to a feminine degree. Cherry wrote that he had never met a man who cried as easily as Captain Scott. He further wrote that the captain seemed to lack a sense of humor and was a poor judge of character. He would sometimes fall into a depression of irritability, which could take him weeks to crawl out of. But in spite of his flaws, Scott was commended for clamping down his weaknesses, acknowledging his faults, and striving to overcome them. He went against the imperfections which could weigh down a man in his position, and proved himself to be a commanding leader worth listening to, admiring, and following. For additional entertainment, members of the crew would create and then present lectures regarding their various fields of expertise three times per week. Attendance was not compulsory, but nevertheless, many men chose to sit and learn. Dr. Wilson presented his paper on Antarctic flying birds, and later on, a lecture on penguins followed. He also presented his methodology in creating sketches and art pieces and stressed the importance of capturing every detail as is, without an artistic line signifying nothing. Wilson then critiqued the sketch efforts of his crewmates, accompanying many with a thin smile on his face. Bowers delivered a lecture on the evolution of sledge foods, and later a presentation on the evolution of polar clothing, arguing that what they had at hand was excellent and could not be improved much further. Dr. Simpson spent an hour explaining the intricacies of coronas, halos, rainbows, and auroras. Ponting presented several popular slideshows of his photos and stories from India, Burma, Japan, and other Asian lands. Wright lectured the crew on ice problems, visibly nervous throughout his presentation, since he had not published any of his own research yet. The captain was quite disappointed with his lame presentation, as he was looking forward to learning more about the topic. The interest in the conundrums he presented only encouraged Wright to devote his entire time on the mission to solve them. Mears, who seemed to be growing agitated and bored with the civilized confines of the hut, entranced his audience for nearly two hours as he recounted his wild adventures in Tibet. Oates offered an amusing and informative presentation on the mismanagement of horses. Atkinson proposed that scurvy resulted from an acid intoxication in the blood caused by bacteria, and that fresh vegetables were the only safeguard against the disease. He confirmed that consuming seal meat reduced the chance of contracting the disease. All the crew members duly adjusted their diets to accommodate for this fact, all except Lieutenant Evans who evidently was a picky eater. Debenham later wrote, Lieutenant Evans really was a very naughty boy and wouldn't eat his seal meat. It's not fishy, but it is black and tastes like very poor steak, and the rest of us ate it. Every lecture was seemingly attended by the captain, who took notes on their contents in his diary. Captain Scott himself presented his plans for the next season's journey to the South Pole. Here, he and his men acknowledged their mutual distrust of their dog's abilities, 
and felt that they would have to rely chiefly on the ponies and man hauling. He announced that four men, including himself, would make the final march to the pole, but the identities of the other three were yet undecided. He would judge who would go with him after observing their performance and attitude during the arduous depolaying stage. On the 6th of June, Clissold, the chef, surprised the captain on his 43rd birthday with a grand sugary birthday cake for lunch, adorned with chocolate, crystallized fruit, flags, and pictures of himself. For dinner, they were treated with a luxurious meal consisting of seal soup, roast mutton and red currant jelly, fruit salad, asparagus, and chocolate. A few days later, Debenham and Gran skied over to the Discovery Hut to spend some time there, gathering info and supplies. It was there that they found Makaka, the dog that had disappeared, visibly frail but still alive, coiled up next to the building. The blood on his mouth implied that in order to survive, he had managed to capture and consume a seal. Throughout June, Outside temperatures progressively lowered, eventually reaching minus 36 degrees Fahrenheit. On the 22nd, the crew celebrated Midwinter Day when the sun reached its lowest point and marked the very gradual return of warmth and sunlight. As if it were Christmas Day, Bowers brought forth a Christmas tree he had fashioned out of sticks, decorated with candles, crackers, strips of paper, flags, and presents for all of the hut's members, which had been prepared by Wilson's wife's sister. Scott gave a speech, informing the crew that the celebration marked not only the halfway point of winter, but quite probably the halfway mark to their journey to the South Pole. He also toasted to the safety and well-being of the crew aboard the Terra Nova and Campbell's research party in Victoria Land. Following Scott were speeches from everyone in the party. Afterwards, more drinking and conversing ensued. Cherry Garrard then showcased to Scott and the rest of the crew the first completed issue of the revived South Polar Times. Even though all entries were anonymous, Scott was fairly sure of the identities of most of the contributors. The night was closed by a walk outside to observe the most vibrant and bright aurora that they had yet to see. Captain Scott recounted the last moments of the day in his diary. One wonders why history does not tell us of aurora worshippers. So easily could the phenomenon be considered the manifestation of God or demon. To the little silent group which stood at gaze before such enchantment, it seemed profane to return to the mental and physical atmosphere of our house. Finally, when I stepped within, I was glad to find that there had been a general movement bedwards, and in the next half hour, the last of the roisterers had succumbed to slumber. Thus, except for a few bad heads in the morning, ended the high festival of midwinter. There is little to be said for the artificial uplifting of animal spirits, yet few could take great exception to so rare an outburst in a long run of quiet days. After all, we celebrated the birth of a season which for weal or woe must be numbered amongst the greatest in our lives. Before everyone's return to Cape Evans in April, Dr. Wilson had proposed to Captain Scott a daring expedition, the likes of which had never been ventured before. In order to expand their knowledge of Emperor Penguin's development, he asked for permission to retrieve and later examine a selection of Emperor Penguin eggs at an early embryonic stage to continue his research first started on the Discovery Expedition. The penguins lay their eggs in their rookery on Cape Crozier, near the slopes of Mount Terror, and the eggs had to be seized in the dead of winter, when they were in their earliest stages of development. In addition to advancements in zoology, the team traveling to Cape Crozier would try out various means of clothing and food rationing to examine which means would prove to be the most effective for the crossing south come summer. Wilson asked for willing volunteers to go with him, and the challenge was accepted by Bertie Bowers and Apsley Cherry Garrard. In preparation, 
engineer Bernard Day constructed for them a blubber lamp for illumination, since their journey would be carried out in total darkness. The men would also be pulling an exceptionally heavy load behind them, 253 pounds per man, divided across two nine-foot-long sledges tied one behind the other. Captain Scott criticized Wilson for bringing with him six gallons of oil, or paraffin, which was the fuel used in their Primus stove. Wilson felt that it would be highly necessary for heating their tent. On the 27th of June, before setting out, the trio posed for a photograph taken by Ponting, greatly assisted by his flash. He also attempted to capture the moment via cinematograph, but the candlelight he used proved to be futile in illuminating the dark scene. According to Scott, the team set out in high spirits, though Cherry Garrard, for one, was privately quite frightened of what may come. As they moved on, the men's sweat would freeze inside their suits. The cold wind pushed them and encouraged them to hurry, and the presence of land up ahead could only be gathered through the absence of stars in the sky which it blocked. Pitching a tent, which used to be such an easy task, became a true struggle, as the men could not see their hands before them, and after a few days, Cherry Guard forgoed his useless spectacles. The tent setup they brought with them included additional steps of draping over it an additional layer for insulation. When pitching the tent, two men typically did the hard work, while the third would beat themselves and stamp about in the snow, struggling to return circulation to his numb limbs. In order to execute more finicky tasks, they had to take off their gloves momentarily. But even so, with temperatures reaching negative 50 degrees, all ten fingers would become frostbitten very quickly. Handling buckles, the cooker, spoons, or any other metal object would cause instant frostbite if they were touched with naked hands. One morning, Cherry Guard exited the tent to prepare the sledges and happened to look up skywards. He then discovered that he could not bend down again because his clothes froze in place. He had to spend the next four hours hauling their loads with his head cocked up. Cherry later wrote in detail about the ordeal of their journey. It was the darkness that did it. I don't believe minus 70 temperatures would be bad in daylight, not comparatively bad when you could see where you were going, where you were stepping, where the sledge straps were, the cooker, the primus, the food could see your footsteps lately trodden deep into the soft snow that you might find your way back to the rest of your load, could see the lashings of the food bags, could read a compass without striking three or four different boxes to find one dry match. The trouble is sweat and breath. I never knew before how much of the body's waste comes out through the pores of the skin. On the most bitter days, when we had to camp before we had done a four-hour march in order to nurse back our frozen feet, it seemed that we must be sweating, and all the sweat, instead of passing away through the porous wool of our clothing and gradually drying off us, froze and accumulated. It passed just away from our flesh and then became ice. We shook plenty of snow and ice down from inside our trousers every time we changed our footgear, and we could have shaken it from our vests and from between our vests and shirts, but of course we could not strip to this extent. But when we got into our sleeping bags, if we were fortunate, we became warm enough during the night to thaw this ice. Part remained in our clothes, part passed into the skins of our sleeping bags, and soon both were sheets of armor plate. As for our breath, in the daytime, it did nothing worse than cover the lower parts of our faces with ice and solder our balaclavas tightly to our heads. It was no good trying to get your balaclava off until you had the primus going quite a long time, and then you could throw your breath about if you wished. The trouble really began in your sleeping bag, for it was far too cold to keep a hole open through which to breathe. So all night long our breath froze into the skins, and our respiration became quicker and quicker as the air in our bags got fouler and fouler. It was never possible to make a match strike or burn inside our bags. Due to the increased humidity within their tent, they had to light their Primus stove outside and then rush back inside once the stove was lit. 
For food, Cherry, Bowers, and Wilson had not much other than pemmican, or a mix of dried meat and berries, and biscuits which were created by the biscuit manufacturer Huntley and Palmer in accordance with Dr. Wilson's own specifications. In addition, they had butter and tea, with each man consuming a specific quantity of each as an experiment to see which diet was the most efficient. Soon enough, breakfast became the only time of the day that they could enjoy. After breakfast, they would pack up their tent and march on with their sledges for 17 hours at a stretch. On the 30th of June, they traversed through a bay that normally did not receive any high winds on the count of its geography. As a result, the snow which fell here was not swept away and had continued to pile up softly. Pulling their sledges through this thick, soft snow was akin to pulling through sand. Hauling two sledges simultaneously was determined to be not the best use of their energy and time, so they had to take them ahead one at a time. The three men would pull one sledge and leave the other behind until they traveled one mile further. They would then leave the one they had just pulled and return to get the other. As it was too dark to see their tracks, they used a single candle to light their way back to their sledges. As a consequence, the men had to trek three miles for every one mile they advanced. On this day, they managed to travel little more than three miles forward. That night, as Wilson slept relatively comfortably and Bowers snored loudly, Cherry Garrard was overcome with long fits of uncontrollable shivering which took hold of his entire body. It took several minutes for him to regain control of himself as his teeth chattered so fiercely he was at risk of losing them. Indeed, the excessive chatter caused many of his teeth to crack and break apart. Outside, the temperature reached minus 70 degrees Fahrenheit. On the 1st of July, the sledging was not any easier than the day before. In addition, Wilson and Cherry began experiencing a curious optical illusion. As they followed their deep footsteps in the snow that led back to their sledges, they perceived the depressions inversely as little hills and instinctively tried to step over them. Bowers seemed to be less affected by this phenomenon. By this point, Cherry's hands were terribly frostbitten, affected with anywhere between 5 to 10 blisters, making any chore he had to undertake utter agony. He learned that he could relieve the pain by pricking at the blisters and releasing the fluids contained within. On the evening of the 2nd of July, a full moon arose but was totally obscured by clouds. By sheer chance or divine intervention, a break in the clouds allowed the moon to shine through and unveil before the trio a crevice in the ice, barely a few steps ahead. If they had not seen it, they surely would have fallen in and been dragged under by their sledges. After detouring, they continued on their path, now knee-deep in soft snow. According to Wilson and Bowers, above was the most spectacular and brilliant aurora that anyone had ever seen in Antarctica. Cherry Guard could not fully appreciate it since he would not put on his spectacles for they would freeze onto his face. After their dinners, the men often suffered from cramps in their legs, and Bowers especially was brought to the ground by stomach cramps. Cherry experienced heartburn, which he assumed was caused by his diet. When turning in for the night, Wilson always encouraged Cherry to get settled inside his sleeping bag before the others were ready. Once their meal was finished, the temperature of their bodies and that of inside their tent fell rapidly so it was a struggle to crawl into their sleeping bags and thaw them out with the heat from their bodies. It usually took over an hour of pushing, pulling, thumping, and cramping up in order to enter a sleeping bag. Afterwards, there was another arduous affair of bearing the cold as they attempted to thaw the sleeping bags with their body heat. On the morning of the 4th of July, to their great relief, a slight blizzard fell over the land bringing with it temperatures of minus 27 degrees, an ample opportunity to heat themselves up and have a little rest. A little rest was all they could afford, for only a few hours later, the temperature dropped to negative 40 and soon enough, back into the 60s. 
It was also on this day that Scott and the rest of the hut had their first disturbance in the peace for a very long time. Cape Evans was being beaten by a strong blizzard. Without Captain Scott's knowledge, at about 5.30 p.m., Atkinson and Gran decided to head out to check the readings of two outdoor thermometers, about a mile to the north and the south of the hut respectively. When Gran returned, he informed the captain that he had failed to reach the thermometer and had managed to travel no more than 300 yards before being forced to head back, taking him nearly an hour to find the hut. Atkinson's absence was not noticed until dinner was concluded at 7.15 p.m. Though slightly annoyed at Atkinson's tenacity for undertaking a crossing in such dire conditions without notice, Scott was not all that concerned at first. He assembled a small search party composed of Petty Officer Evans, Crean, and others, equipped with a lantern. By this point, the wind had died down, but heavy snowfall submerged the Cape. They returned at 9.30 p.m. without Atkinson. At this point, Captain Scott sent out several search parties to look for their lost wanderer. By 10 p.m., the only men left in the hut were the captain and the cook. At 11.45 p.m., Scott heard the shouts from Mears and Debenham, who found Atkinson alive and were bringing him back. His hand was badly frostbitten, and he was gravely confused and disorientated, but was fortunately fine otherwise. Atkinson explained that he traveled only a quarter of a mile before deciding to return. He lost his bearings and fell into an old fishing hole of theirs. He went in the direction he thought to be correct, but had found nothing. The blizzard reduced visibility to zero. He wandered aimlessly, eventually circling around the nearby islands in Accessible Island and Tent Island, and after a while dug a hole in the snow for some shelter. Happy to have him back, Scott hoped that this experience would convince the crew of the very real dangers when facing a blizzard. Following this mishap, the cape was overcome with gale force winds averaging 70 miles per hour, which did not subside for a full week. On the 5th of July, Dr. Wilson, Cherry Garrard, and Bertie Bowers struggled to traverse more than a mile and a half through the soft snow. At 5.51 p.m., Bowers recorded the temperature as minus 77.5 degrees Fahrenheit. Meteorological records were chiefly the responsibility of Bowers, noting down every temperature reading with their corresponding time and location with pencil and paper very delicately. If one were to breathe directly onto the paper, it would become instantly glazed with a film of ice that the pencil could not penetrate. Within the tent, they would allow their primus stove to burn well after cooking was finished to warm up their living quarters and their limbs. Thusly, they had already expended four out of the six gallons of oil that they had brought with them. Wilson was feeling terrible for the conditions they had to face vowing that he had not expected such bitter cold and near-impossible sledge pulling. On more than one occasion, he had asked his comrades if they should turn back, but Bowers and Cherry always rejected the idea. Wilson placed great care in his companions because he was only permitted to go ahead with the mission if he promised to bring everyone back safely. After a further couple of days of very slow movement, the ground beneath them began to solidify and the thick snowy blanket began to fade away as the three men edged closer to Terror Point, along the edge of Mount Terror. However, as soon as their sledging was speeding up, they were stopped in their tracks by a thick fog and later a blizzard that lasted three days. Fortunately, the storm brought with it greatly warmer temperatures that thawed all of their belongings, and they enjoyed a lengthy and pleasant rest. As the winds banged on their tent, the men adjusted their diets, as Wilson was craving carbohydrates which Cherry had in abundance, and Cherry himself hungered for the fats contained in the butter that Wilson could not finish. Bowers, who was on a protein-heavy diet, felt fine. After the storm subsided, they continued sledging over the outermost slopes of Mount Terror, covering over seven miles in a single day. On the 14th of July, Wilson, Bowers, and Cherry Garrard reached a rocky knoll where they would set up a small hut made of boulders and snow. 
It was only four miles from Cape Crozier, which was blocked from view by the knoll. Using snow as a type of bonding agent proved to be challenging, as the snow in that area was very old and as hard as ice. Bowers was very disappointed and almost angered that they could not finish their igloo in a single day. It was finally completed on the 18th of July, using their tent door as the door for their igloo. They collapsed their tent and left it a few yards outside the igloo, with many of their belongings still contained within. After a night's rest, the men undertook their first journey to the Penguin Rookery, navigating over complex pressure ridges around the rim of Mount Terror. A great number of times did they have to traverse impossible roads, leap over depressions, and stop themselves from falling down snow slopes. Cherry had to be rescued at least six times, since he could barely see anything without his spectacles, and kept falling into tricky spots that Wilson and Bowers easily avoided. Nevertheless, Cherry Guard later described it as exciting work. They kept on stumbling onward until they were faced with an ice wall in the form of a pressure ridge formed by colliding slabs of ice, some 200 feet tall. From about a quarter mile away, they could hear the cacophonous cries of the Emperor Penguins, but with what little light they had at midday fastly fading away and no visible passage through the ridge, they thought it best to return back to their camp and try again the following day. On the 20th of July, the three men made another attempt for the rookery. When they reached the pressure ridge at a different location, Wilson spotted a hole which they safely could crawl through and come out the opposite side of the ice wall. As they emerged from the opening, they were welcomed by the trumpeting calls of the emperors looking after their eggs. From where they stood, 12 feet off the snow atop a small cliff of ice, the men could see some unaccompanied eggs, as was observed to happen. The emperor penguins would keep their eggs warm between their feet throughout the winter, but of course, the parents would get hungry, so would leave their eggs on the snow as they dived into the water to retrieve some fish. Eggless penguins overcome with parental instinct would then try to steal the lonely eggs for themselves. Fights would ensue upon the return of the rightful parents, and maulings, deaths, and broken eggs were common. In the diminishing light, the men had to move quickly. Cherry stayed on the cliff to lower down Bowers and Wilson via alpine rope. There were only 100 penguins in the rookery, far less than expected, with maybe only one out of every five protecting an egg. Some were so desperate for a child that they were incubating snowballs of about the same size as an egg. Others were desperately trying to incubate eggs that were already frozen and lifeless. The men managed to take five eggs and also killed and skinned three penguins to fuel their blubber stove. Bowers and Wilson tucked the eggs into their own mitts and were hoisted up by Cherry Garrard. He struggled to pull up Wilson, who complained about it uttering the first words of impatience on the entire trek. In the dark, they had to traverse the jagged path by which they came, searching hard for the axe and footprints they had left behind. Along the way, both of the eggs that Cherry was carrying burst, leaving the team with only three. The weather was getting worse, colder and more windy. Soon, it became impossible to search for their previous tracks, so instead they just tread forward and hoped for the best. As the winds intensified, they finally found their little rock igloo and crawled in. The snow blew in through all the cracks in their stone walls and covered everything inside their tent, though soon the snow on the outside began to pile up, which only helped to make the shelter more weatherproof. They struggled to start up the blubber stove, choosing not to use the Primus in order to save what little oil they had left. A spurt of boiling oil flew into Dr. Wilson's eye, and he writhed and groaned in pain for the entirety of the night, fearing that he may have lost the use of his eye. Fortunately, the next morning, he got up with both eyes still intact. That night, the blizzard raged on. Then Bowers shouted that he saw their tent had blown away. Curiously though, most of their belongings that were on the ground covered by the tent were still there. 
They fought against the dirty snow blowing in from the side to retrieve everything left outside and bring it back into the igloo and tied their door down. The force of the hurricane blew over their heads and because of the particular area they were in, created a fierce vacuum which tried with all its might to suck up their canvas rooftop. For hours upon hours, the roof was being beaten up and down, a tremendous howling surrounding them from all sides. With what little energy they had left, they cooked themselves a meal with a blubber stove, evidently a very temperamental machine. By the end of dinner time, it spasmed, spurted, and finally broke apart into pieces. For 24 hours, they lay in their sleeping bags, waiting either for the storm to move past or for their roof to collapse. Every new opening created in their walls was filled up with odd parts, like their mitts, socks, and pajama jackets. The canvas roof was continuously being stretched, almost reaching its limit. Its rapid movement became louder and louder. The team, lying right next to one another, had to communicate through shouting. Suddenly, the door to their igloo began to open up along its top, and then their canvas roof was ripped apart into a hundred pieces. The sound was described by Cherry Guard as akin to sitting in an express train going through a tunnel with all the windows down. The men were all about halfway in their sleeping bags, and in the midst of auroras assault of the blizzard, they scrambled to enter fully. Snow slabs that had helped to pin down the roof fell in on top of them, along with a heavy amount of snow. Bowers got in his sleeping bag along with a hefty load of snow as well. Wilson was having trouble getting into his. Cherry tried to help him, but Wilson urged Cherry to take care of himself first. When they were all safely in, they turned over with their sleeping bags face down and sloped to have their feet to the wind and their face as close to the ground and as far away from the assaulting winds as possible. They could barely talk, but sometimes Bowers and Wilson sang hymns to pass the time. Cherry would feebly join along if he could hear or recognize the tune. It was in these conditions that Dr. Wilson celebrated his 39th birthday. While lying down, they warmed up some drift snow on the floor with their hands and shoved it into their mouths to consume it, thusly staying hydrated. The snow continued to pile up around them, which helped to keep them warm, but also oversaturated their sleeping bags with moisture and would surely make thawing them a hellish affair. The hurricane force winds only started to lull on the 24th of July. The men decided to use this opportunity to risk going outside and look for their tent, though they all thought it was near hopeless. With no luck, they returned to the remains of their igloo, the wind attacking their faces. By this point, they had not eaten for nearly three days and figured they had to find a way to cook up a meal. After some time, they got the primus to ignite, but since they had lost some important parts of the stove in the storm, they had to hold the cooker in their hands over the flame. They put in some snow and let it melt, and cooked up some pemmican along with some blubber. It was full of dirt, penguin feathers, hairs, and debris, but given the conditions they were facing, they thought it was delicious. Soon enough, they also had some tea which retained a burnt scent from the blubber in the cooker. The meal was greatly enjoyed by all, and perhaps could be truly appreciated by only three men in the entire world. As soon as some light began to shine beyond the horizon, they got back out again and down the slope to look for their tent. They began to wonder if in its absence they would have to dig holes for themselves in the snow every night and cover themselves with their floor cloth. To Cherry and Wilson's surprise, they heard the joyous calls of Birdie about half a mile from their igloo and witnessed him retrieving their tent fully intact. They set up and dug in the tent in a nearby location as a blizzard loomed over them. They made themselves another meal and discussed what they would do next. Bowers enthusiastically announced that he was ready to march back into the rookery, but Wilson shut him down, thinking it was best for them to make their way back to the hut right away. 
After a few hours of packing, they began their journey home, leaving behind them one sledge and an axe. They were soon enough stopped by accelerating winds and had to pitch their tent. Two bamboo poles supporting the tent had broken and made their shelter flap about in the wind. Bowers tied the cap of the tent to himself, so that in the event it was carried away, the tent would not fly unaccompanied. Cherry Guard was suffering from a frostbitten toe, and Bowers offered him his sleeping bag lining made from the down feathers of the eider duck, which was still packed and dry, having never used it himself. Cherry declined, for accepting the kind gesture would have been brutish of him. As Cherry struggled to get even a wink of sleep, Bowers struggled to keep himself awake before he fully entered into his sleeping bag. Wilson's bag had been under so much stress that it was ripping and tearing in numerous places. The blizzard lasted nearly two days. On the 26th of July, the three men stumbled through pressure ridges, crevices, and icy slopes. The terrain up ahead was impossible to judge in the lightless day. Silhouettes of hills could either be approaching obstacles or mountains in the distance. Their inability to see almost cost Bowers' life, as he stepped into a crevice that was covered by only a thin layer of ice and fell in. Fortunately, his harness tied to the sledge kept him suspended in the air. For the next two days, they managed to march on the frozen sea between visible pressure ridges and met no more trouble. On the 29th, they reached the snowy, windless bite of the barrier which had impeded their progress so. To their fortune, the ground was more solid than what they had experienced before and made for easier travel. Cherry Garrard later expanded on their journey back. The horrors of that return journey are blurred to my memory, and I know they were blurred to my body at the time. I think this applies to all of us, for we were much weakened and callous. The day we got down to the penguins, I had not cared whether I fell into a crevice or not. We had been through a great deal since then. I know that we slept on the march, for I woke up when I bumped against Birdie, and Birdie woke when he bumped against me. I think Wilson steering out in front managed to keep awake. I know we fell asleep if we waited in the comparatively warm tent when the Primus was alight. I know that our sleeping bags were so full of ice that we did not worry if we spilt water or hoosh over them as they lay on the floor cloth when we cooked on them with our maimed cooker. They were so bad that we never rolled them up in the usual way when we got out of them in the morning. We opened their mouths as much as possible before they froze and hoisted them more or less flat onto the sledge. All three of us helped to raise each bag, which looked rather like a squashed coffin and was probably a good deal harder. I know that if it was only minus 40 degrees when we camped for the night, we considered quite seriously that we were going to have a warm one, and that when we got up in the morning, if the temperature was in the minus 60s, we did not inquire what it was. The day's march was bliss compared to the night's rest, and both were awful. We were about as bad as men can be and do good traveling, but I never heard a word of complaint nor, I believe, an oath, and I saw self-sacrifice standing every test. In the early hours of the 2nd of August, the Cape Crozier party returned to their hut on Cape Evans. The night watchman threw the door open for them and called all sleeping souls to attention. In their pajamas, the residents helped to take off all the straps and icy attire weighing down the men. Captain Scott wrote that the three looked more weather-worn than anyone he had ever seen, having endured five weeks of some of the most horrible weather conditions ever witnessed. All three men had visibly lost weight. Their eyes were dull, their faces scarred and wrinkled, their hands whitened and creased. But luckily, frostbite proved to be a lesser foe. They were treated to a midnight feast of bread and jam and hot cocoa. It was obvious, though, that what affected them most was their lack of sleep. This was promptly tended to with an escort back to their bunks, followed by a paradisical sleep that they thought lasted a thousand years. The following morning, they washed up and feasted on breakfast 
answering a great wealth of questions from everyone. According to Scott's records, Amundsen had experienced temperatures of minus 79 degrees during his trek in the Arctic Circle some years before. However, he had the assistance of Inuit, who could build for him comfortable snow igloos, which was luxurious accommodation when compared with the thin canvas tent of the Crozier party. Amundsen also only spent five days on the ice, away from his ship, compared with the five weeks of agony undertaken by their men, all for advances in science. Scott noted that their sleeping bags had increased in weight twofold by the night they returned to the hut, due to the accumulation of ice. Scott and Wilson also settled on the best arrangement of rations per day for the South Pole trek with Wilson suggesting that adding cocoa to their diet would be desirable. As August dragged on, the weather remained very mild and not too cold. With every passing day, the sun came closer to rising again. The Cape Crozier party still displayed some troubles with their bodies, particularly their sore feet. Bowers seemed fine, eager to relaunch experiments using weather balloons with Dr. Simpson. The remaining 10 ponies, though occasionally troublesome, were assessed to be in good physical condition, and each was allocated a master that would have to exercise them daily to get to know them, for they would have to guide them southward. The dogs were trained thoroughly as well, excited by the calmer weather and warmer temperatures as they had ample opportunity to exercise. On the 15th of August, one of the female dogs gave birth to a litter of six or seven pups, and the crew kept the family as quiet and warm as possible. Unfortunately, after two days, the first-time mother had managed to kill all of her babies by constantly neglecting them and then trotting or laying on them when she returned, until none were left breathing. On the 23rd of August, the sun made its official return above the horizon though could not be properly appreciated due to an overcast sky and increasing gale force winds. The men celebrated with champagne, the taste of which was equally unappreciated. With the brightening of the days came the gradual return of warmer climates, and all the men and their animals spent extended periods outside training and uncovering any nearby supply depots of snow. Lieutenant Evans knew that Captain Scott would choose only the fittest men to join him in the final stretch to the South Pole, so he took it upon himself to improve his skiing skills. He would constantly go to Gran for tutoring, almost engaging in a competition with the ski expert. In early September, Cherry Garrard finished editing and printing the second issue of the expedition's South Polar Times, an improvement on the first, according to Captain Scott. Winter lectures also resumed upon the arrival of the Cape Crozier party, and Scott was one of the last lecturers of the season, updating his team with his carefully arranged plans for the South Polar journey, which would closely follow Ernest Shackleton's route up the Beardmore Glacier. Scott had in fact neglected his diary throughout much of September, so he could focus on calculating and planning all aspects of their trip, and was greatly aided by Bowers. On the 15th of September, Captain Scott, Bertie Bowers, Petty Officer Evans and Dr. Simpson set out towards the Western Mountains on an excursion that was later dubbed by Bowers to have been a jolly picnic. Scott aimed to explore the Farrar Glacier and examine its movement by judging the distance between two wooden spikes placed in it on the geological expedition earlier that year. He was also keen on relearning his man-hauling techniques and practicing using photographic and cinematographic cameras. They reached the Farrar Glacier after about three days of trekking, suffering from some frostbite-inducing winds along the way. They calculated the positions of the markers left behind by the previous team and found that the glacier had moved about 30 feet over the past seven months. In the following days, they leisurely explored their surroundings and collected rock samples. The captain wrote that Simpson could never make a good sledge traveler, 
commenting that his efforts in manhauling were amusingly old maidish. By the 24th, things had been going well, and Scott remarked that their trip was unexpectedly pleasant. On that day, they decided to turn back and make their way for Cape Evans, covering 11 miles in a single day. On the 26th, they were stopped in their tracks by a blizzard. They remained in their tent for over a day, but vowed to resume their march on the 28th when the weather cleared a bit. However, they were beaten by another storm, which resulted in Dr. Simpson's face getting badly frostbitten. They decided to push through the chilling winds, eventually reaching their hut in the early hours of the 29th of September, admittedly exhausted and feeling battered by the weather of the past few days. Of his journey and comrades, Captain Scott wrote, The objects of our little journey were satisfactorily accomplished, but the greatest source of pleasure to me is to realize that I have such men as Bowers and Petty Officer Evans for the southern journey. I do not think that harder men or better sledge travelers ever took the trail. Bowers is a little wonder. I realize all that he must have done for the Cape Crozier party in their far severer experience. Upon his return, the captain learned that a three-man party consisting of Lieutenant Evans, Skier Gran, and Seaman Robert Ford had traveled to the corner camp depot to clear and remark the location. However, they were forced to camp for an extended period of time, as the temperature dropped to below minus 70 degrees. Ford came back with a severely frostbitten hand, with the possibility of losing the top of a finger. Scott was annoyed because it indicated he did not take good care of himself. This meant that Ford would most likely be unable to go on the Western Geographical journey as previously planned. In the beginning of October, Mears with a dog team went to Hut Point to lay a telephone wire leading from their Cape Evans camp. On the 6th, a delighted Scott had a telephone conversation with Mears and Oates, who were in the Discovery Hut, 15 miles away. Scott felt that this form of communication would come into great use come next season when discussing plans between different parties. Captain Scott also warmed up to Trigva Gran upon hearing from Lieutenant Evans that the young skier was eager to accomplish all his tasks thoroughly. Scott believed that at the beginning of the expedition, his unwillingness to work was the result of his age, and after wintering in Antarctica, he found his feet and developed into a quote-unquote thoroughly good boy ready to face hardship with the best. On the 8th of October, as Clissold stood atop an iceberg posing for photographs taken by Ponting, he slipped and fell nearly 20 feet to the ground. He was quickly brought back to the hut and examined. He suffered some injuries to his head and back, but Atkinson and Wilson judged there was nothing awfully serious about his condition. Clissold proceeded to have bouts of loss of consciousness, followed by exclamations of pain, and was forced to lay in bed for the coming days. On the 10th, Mears returned to the Cape Evans hut with more unfortunate news. One of their strongest dogs had developed a sudden sickness and died. Dr. Wilson believed that he was infected by a worm that invaded the brain. Over the next few days, the invalidated Ford and Clissold steadily improved, but Scott still considered them unfit to join any coming mission. On the 17th of October, another misfortune befell the team. The motor sledges were being brought out onto the ice floes in preparation for the impending journey, and the one piloted by Bernard Day cracked under the strain of an incline. It was brought back to the hut for maintenance, but this event reinforced Captain Scott's quiet doubts about the abilities of the motors. On the 20th, another accident occurred. While Scott advised against playing football at this time to avoid injuries, Ponting requested that the team set up a match for the cinematograph, and Debenham injured his knee, exciting an old wound. This further delayed their journey south. On top of this, two days later, while Wilson and Petty Officer Evans were restocking a supply depot, Bauer stayed back to mind their three ponies, who initially seemed rather calm. One pony then moved its head, and a hook on its harness cut into its nose. It panicked and jolted away. 
The others followed suit, galloping in different directions. Barris held on to one pony and managed to bring him back after running alongside it for two miles. Another while later, the other two ponies were rounded up and brought back, with the injured one visibly in distress, having sustained a tear of skin with a piece of flesh hanging from its nose. When they returned to the hut, the hanging flesh was snipped off and the wound appeared to be less gruesome than thought at first. The pony remained shaken and trembling in its stable. In the midst of this chaos, Cherry Garrard published the last issue of the South Polar Times for the season. It included a poem written by Dr. Wilson titled The Barrier Silence. As he wished to remain anonymous, he sent in a typed version for publication to not reveal his handwriting. However, a handwritten rough draft of the poem was later found, which confirmed that the words belonged to the good doctor, perhaps seeing a vision of things to come. The silence was deep, with a breath-like sleep, as our sledge runners slid on the snow, and the fateful fall of our fur-clad feet struck mute like a silent blow. On a questioning hush, as the settling crust shrank shivering over the flow, and the sledge in its track sent a whisper back, which was lost in a white fog bow. And this was the thought that the silence wrought, as it scorched and froze us through. For the secrets hidden are all forbidden, till God means man to know. We might be the men God meant should know, the heart of the barrier snow, in the heat of the sun, and the glow, and the glare from the glistening flow, as it scorched and froze us through and through with the bite of the drifting snow. On the 24th of October, the Terra Nova expedition's journey to the South Pole officially commenced. Day and Lashley rode out with their motor sledges, which slowly pulled supplies behind them. Lieutenant Evans and seaman Frederick Hooper accompanied them in the form of steerers, aiding the direction of travel by pulling on ropes attached to the front of the motors. This slow but strong sledge-pulling party set out first in order to later team up with the rest of the southern party that was to follow. In spite of the improvements made to the motor sledges, the chains of the tracks tended to slip off when in contact with more icy surfaces. After the first three hours, they managed to cover three miles. Regarding his Norwegian rival, Scott wrote, I don't know what to think of Amundsen's chances. If he gets to the pole, it must be before we do, as he is bound to travel fast with dogs and pretty certain to start early. On this account, I decided at a very early date to act exactly as I should have done had he not existed. Any attempt to race must have wrecked my plan, besides which it doesn't appear the sort of thing one is out for. In any case, you can rely on my not doing or saying anything foolish. Only I'm afraid you must be prepared for the chance of finding our venture much belittled. After all, it is the work that counts, not the applause that follows. On the morning of the 1st of November, any men who had letters to write home had them finished, sealed, and post it in a packing case on Atkinson's bunk, who would deliver them to the crew of the Terra Nova when the ship returned early next year. By noon, Captain Scott and the rest of the men of the Southern Party set out on their journey to capture the geographic South Pole. The party, leading their ponies, included Wilson, Bowers, Oates, Petty Officer Evans, Cherry Guard, Tom Crean, Seaman Patrick Cohan, Atkinson, and Wright. Mears and the dog handler Dimitri were set to follow the ponies with their dog teams at a later point, since they moved much faster. Over the course of their journey, they would create more supply depots, and gradually, small teams would be selected to leave Scott and return back to Cape Evans when they were deemed to have served to the best of their abilities. At the moment, the names of the three men who would accompany him to the pole were unknown, and anyone had the chance if they proved themselves strong enough, though Bowers, Oates, Petty Officer Evans, and of course Dr. Wilson were strong contenders. 
Lieutenant Evans, currently leading the motor sledge party, was privately singled out as one who would not accompany Scott to the pole. Writing to his expedition manager, Joseph Kinsey, Captain Scott said, Teddy Evans is a thoroughly well-meaning little man, but proves on close acquaintance to be rather a duffer in anything but his own particular work. All this is strictly on Trenu, but he is not at all fitted to be second in command, as I was foolish enough to name him. I'm going to take some steps concerning this, as it would not do to leave him in charge here at the Cape Evans base, in case I'm late returning. It seemed that not only did he not want Lieutenant Evans to go to the pole with him, but he also wished for Evans to be either demoted or even sent back early next year. By evening time, both the pony and dog teams were resting under the roof of the Discovery Hut and had a telephone conversation with the men remaining in Cape Evans. The next day, the pony party departed in detachments or small units of ponies of varying speed, which would eventually meet up with each other at a later point in the day and rest. As they advanced, they encountered notes left by Lieutenant Evans concerning his party's progress following the tracks of the doomed motors. The pony team had not known this yet, but by this point, Day's motor was deemed useless and left abandoned along the way. Lashley's sledge also failed completely not long after that. The four-man motor party then proceeded onwards as a man-hauling troop. Lieutenant Evans seemingly did not have much faith in the machines later referring to them as those wretched failures, the motor sledges. It is conceivable that if the lieutenant had not forced Commander Skelton, the original engineer for the sledges, to depart from the mission, the motors could have tread some miles further. On the 5th of November, Scott's party reached corner camp, with ponies doing well on the soft surface to the delight of all, especially Captain Oates, who at first had no faith in them. The next day, they encountered the remains of one motor sledge. It was disappointing, but Scott was satisfied that the motors had gone this far at all. The main issue was the engine's difficulties in such frigid conditions, which the captain believed was a solvable problem for future ventures. Two days later, the dog party caught up with the ponies, pulling their loads very efficiently. On the 8th of November, the former motor party of Lieutenant Evans, Lashley, Day, and Hooper reached One Ton Depot. As instructed by Scott, they were to march one degree south of the depot and wait for the pony party. At One Ton Depot, the men dug out as much food for the crew as they felt was necessary and resumed their trek, pulling 200 pounds per man. They built snow cairns along the way every three miles or so to mark the path Scott's party was to take. From the 9th of November onwards, the weather for Scott's party began to take on unexpected patterns. Pleasant days, when the ponies could march over 10 miles, were immediately followed by horrid marches of 5 miles caused by bad weather and a need to seek shelter in camps. Temperatures averaged at around minus 10 degrees Fahrenheit, and the surface grew soft and unstable. Scott commented, I expected these marches to be a little difficult, but not near so bad as today. The harsh winds necessitated the constructions of snow walls to shield the ponies, some standing taller than the ponies themselves. On the 14th of November, the second geological expedition, led by Griffith Taylor, set out from Cape Evans. His party now consisted of Gran, Ford, and Debenham, after quickly overcoming their injuries. Gran had requested that Captain Scott not include him on the journey to the South Pole, as it would put him in direct competition with his fellow countryman, Roald Amundsen. The geological expedition's objective this season was to study Granite Harbor and the nearby Mackay Glacier, located on the coast of Victoria Land. Here, they stayed for a few months, under the shelter of huts made of stones. On the 15th of November, Scott's party reached One Ton Depot and replenished themselves. Scott then called Oates and Bowers into his tent to hold a war of words of sorts, mostly concerning the state of the ponies. It was decided best to rest at the depot for a day for the sake of the animals. Regarding how much forage they would load, a change of plan was agreed upon. 
They were to take just enough food for the ponies to get most of them to the Beardmore Glacier, allowing for the inevitable killing of a few along the way. The captain originally thought that the ponies would march on for some distance up the glacier, which, according to Shackleton, was a disastrous surface and perhaps would have been a suicidal effort for the ponies. On that very day, Lieutenant Evans's team stopped at their predetermined destination, latitude 80 degrees 32 minutes south, and set up camp, where they would wait for Scott and his men. By the 19th of November, the ponies of Captain Scott's southern party were having trouble navigating the difficult terrain, but thankfully the air was still and the sun shone bright through clear skies, so rest periods were greatly enjoyed by their rapidly tiring steeds. On the 21st, Scott met up with the former motor party, who told him that they had been waiting in their camp for six days, spending their time constructing a tremendous cairn. The four men still looked fit, but confessed that they were very hungry. Day especially was looking gaunt. From here, the man-hauling motor party joined the pony and dog parties for a little while further. Now, the train to the pole consisted of 16 men, 23 dogs, and 10 ponies. Some ponies looked to be nearing the end of their usefulness, as was expected. After they were killed, they were to be fed to the dogs and Mears was eagerly awaiting fresh pony meat on which his dogs would feast. Oates and Atkinson, on the other hand, were determined to kill their first animal only after passing the point where Ernest Shackleton had shot his first pony on the Nimrod expedition. On the 24th of November, less than 150 miles from the Beardmore Glacier, that fateful day came when their weakest pony was taken aside and shot. Mears cut it up and later reported that there was enough pony meat to provide four rich meals for all the dogs. Also on this day, Hooper and Day departed the southern party and began their journey back to Cape Evans. Two days later, Scott's troop created Middle Barrier Depot at latitude 81 degrees 35 minutes south. The following marches proved to be harsh again, high winds and low visibility. An unspeakably uncomfortable surface made for very tiring pulling, as the men's feet would sink three or four inches under a thin, snow-covered crust of ice with every step. Oates and Petty Officer Evans suffered quite a bit from frostbite, as well as Mears, who, in Cherry Guard's words, lost his nose to the bite. The 28th presented itself with even more horrid conditions extremely low visibility and strong winds biting at the men's faces. Scott reckoned this was the hardest summer blizzard yet to be experienced in this region. Bowers wrote in his diary that they had marched a whole degree of latitude without witnessing a single fine day. On that night, a second pony was shot dead. During the slog over the ice barrier, the monotonous blank landscape and the heavy treading took a mental toll on the men. Cherry Guard wrote that the setup of their tents for lunch and supper was a welcome break in their icy depression. Cherry was asked to join Captain Scott in his personal tent, along with Dr. Wilson. Even though their food rations were the same as everyone else's, they entertained themselves by cooking interesting mixes of everything they had. Scott once told Cherry, you are going far to earn my undying gratitude. After preparing for his companions a so-called chocolate hoosh or thick stew, which included unfinished raisins, cocoa, and sugar from past meals. Despite his compliment, the captain had indigestion the morning after. For three weeks, the three had animated conversations within their homely tent, after which time, topics of discussion dried up and they seldom spoke, apart from calling commands to their teammates. On the 29th of November, elevated land far off in the distance was spotted for the first time in a long time. The triple peak, Mount Markham, appeared before them as the skies cleared a little. The surface, however, continued to be exhausting. Mears measured the holes left by the ponies sinking into the crust and found them to be an average of 8 to 12 inches in depth. The use of snowshoes was of limited success as the ponies angrily refused the garment. Captain Scott remarked that Shackleton noted the 15th of December as his first day on his march to the South Pole without fair weather. 
In contrast, Scott's party had yet to experience a single fine day. Even during his own trek south during the Discovery expedition, he never experienced weather like this. The blizzards, though, brought with them warmer weather, so the teams rested in their tents in comfort. On the 1st of December, Christopher, their most troublesome pony, was executed. As Oates shot him, he made a run for the camp with a bullet in his head. He was then caught and finished off with some struggle. The following day, Bowers' pony was shot dead as well, to his great disappointment and heartbreak. In addition to the dogs, the men too feasted on pony meat, wholly satisfied. They found it to be sweet, but tough. This was of special great relief to the man-hauling parties, who grew hungry much more quickly than those leading the ponies. On the 3rd of December, just as Scott roused his men to get them ready for sledging, they were beaten by the worst winds he had ever seen during Antarctic summer. They would build snow walls to protect their ponies from northerly winds, only for the winds to change their course completely, hour after hour. The winds were perfectly unpredictable and baffling, beyond what meteorologist Dr. Simpson could have forecasted. The captain suspected that they were in the midst of an unusually bad season, but they still managed to march 10 or 11 miles per day. He wrote of their situation. Is there some widespread atmospheric disturbance which will be felt everywhere in this region as a bad season, or are we merely the victims of exceptional local conditions? If the latter, there is food for thought in picturing our small party struggling against adversity in one place whilst others go smilingly forward in the sunshine. How great may be the element of luck! No foresight, no procedure could have prepared us for this state of affairs. Had we been ten times as experienced or certain of our aim, we should not have expected such rebuffs. The 4th of December provided no respite. By the time the snowbanks were built for the ponies, the ponies had to be placed on the opposite side on the count of the wind change. By the time all the tents had been set up, with their backs facing strong northerly winds, the gusts changed course completely and blew in sheets of snow through the now exposed doorways of their tents. The temperature rose so much that it reached above freezing, melting the snow on their blanketed tents and gear. If a strong cold returned, the men would have a mighty miserable time breaking away the ice trapped in their clothing and equipment. Another pony was sacrificed that day, and every tent enjoyed all he had to offer. By the end of the day, Cherry's pony, who felt beaten by the blizzard, lay down and rolled around in the snow in a display of fatigue and frustration, and then was shot. On the 5th of December, camped just 12 miles from the Beardmore Glacier, they were prevented from moving by a ferocious blizzard. Snowfall was so great that one tent could not see the other, though both were relatively nearby. Temperatures of 33 degrees Fahrenheit meant that any snow that did not fall on snow or ice melted and soon refroze. The ponies, shelterless, became covered head to hoof in ice. The terrible conditions continued into the next day, so the team stayed put. Anyone who went outside for a brief spell came back to their tents appearing as if they had been caught by a heavy rain shower, soaked through and through. Mears reported bad snow blindness in one eye, and Scott hoped that this rest period would help him. Mears, to his personal concern, had stayed with Captain Scott's team for longer than had been originally planned. It was first said that he and Dimitri would be back at Hut Point with their dogs by the 10th of December, but with that date soon approaching, they were still stranded near the entry of the glacier. Rations were being reduced for the men, and extra biscuits were given to the dog teams who would have to average 24 miles per day on their way back to Cape Evans. By the 7th, the weather showed no signs of improvement, and a despondent Scott lamented in his wet sleeping bag how the historically fine month of December had failed the expedition. What's more, their march had been delayed so many times that they were eating into rations that were designated for later. Bertie Bowers described the situation thusly. When I swung the thermometer this morning, I looked and looked again, but unmistakably the temperature was plus 33 degrees Fahrenheit, above freezing point, out of the sun's direct rays, for the first time since we came down here. 
What this means, nobody can conceive. We are wet through. Our tents are wet. Our bags, which are our life to us, and the objects of our greatest care, are wet. The poor ponies are soaked and shivering far more than they would be ordinarily in a temperature 50 degrees lower. Our sledges, the parts that are dug out, are wet. Our food is wet. Everything on and around and about us is the same, wet as ourselves and our cold, clammy clothes. Water trickles down the tent poles and only forms icicles in contact with the snow floor. The warmth of our bodies has formed a snow bath in the floor for each of us to lie in. This idleness when one is simply jumping to go on is bad enough for most, but must be worse for Captain Scott. I feel glad that he has Dr. Bill Wilson in his tent. There is something always so reassuring about Bill. He comes out best in adversity. On the 8th of December, Lieutenant Evans and his man-hauling team tried pulling a sled on foot, and they sank into the snow up to their knees. Better results were seen by pulling the load on skis, but it was still tough going. A test run of a pony's marching abilities proved to be discouraging also. Wilson felt that the ponies could go no further, whereas Oates thought they could go on for at least another march. Wilson then gave his pony all of his biscuits, so he would have enough strength to pull for one more day. The next day proved itself to be colder and calmer, and was deemed good enough to go out and go forward. However, the fresh snowfall made for dreadful marching conditions. The men sank an average of 15 inches into the snow. Petty Officer Evans experimented with snowshoes for a pony, which he had customized and were mildly successful. The men, ponies, and dogs marched for 11 hours straight, without break, without lunch, and they very slowly creeped to within a mile of the opening incline of the Beardmore Glacier. The half-fed ponies, who had eaten all there was to give them, were terribly tired and strengthless. At 8 p.m., all of them were shot. They were then prepared as food for the dogs and for the southern party on their return trip. On the 9th of December, Wilson reported to Captain Scott that Wright and Lashley, who had been part of the man-hauling party for an extended time now, reported great pains and fatigue. Scott was evidently not satisfied with their performance, whereas he himself thought that he had never felt fitter, and that petty officer Evans, Wilson, and Oates could hold their own, and were also doing splendidly. The day's march was little better than before. Their crew alternated between equipping and unequipping their skis on their uphill struggle. The captain remarked that the dog teams were pulling tremendous loads of 600 pounds with relative ease, reflecting that Amundsen had chosen the right form of transport. The next day was yet another tiresome affair, with five members of the team succumbing to snow blindness due to incaution. To alleviate the pain, they took cocaine and zinc sulfate tablets. On the 11th of December, Mears, Dimitri, and their dogs were sent back to home base, carrying a letter from Scott which read, Things were not as rosy as they might be, but we keep our spirits up and say the luck must turn. Mears was given orders to go with the dog team back to One Ton Depot in late December or early January to bring additional supplies enough for five returning four-man parties from the south, and as much dog food as possible. A further venture with the dogs had been scheduled for them to meet up with the returning South Pole party at around latitude 82 degrees, 30 minutes south, to bring them back to the Terra Nova so they could broadcast their success from New Zealand as soon as possible. The latter journey was deemed as important, but the former depot resupplying trip was stressed by the captain to have been vital. Scott stated that in case further sledging was to be carried out in the next year, the dogs' lives should not be risked at any cost. However, these plans were under the condition that Mears returned to Cape Evans on the 19th of December, which now seemed very unlikely. With these instructions, Mears, Dimitri, and the dogs left Scott's company. The following days brought more hard sledging, on the count that the sleds were now 800 pounds each, having been loaded up with the supplies that were being pulled by the dogs. The hard pulling combined with warmer weather meant they had to manhaul while wearing only a vest, pants, and windproof trousers to keep themselves drier. By the 15th, 
the thickness of the soft snow grew more shallow, with blue ice visible only a foot under. Crean stumbled upon a deep crevice in the ice, so they decided to throw an empty oil can down to see what would happen. The echoes of its tumble continued for a worryingly long time. Wright quietly commented to Cherry that he wanted to push Lieutenant Evans into the crevice. Cherry confessed that it was a pity he didn't. Wright further angrily wrote in his diary that Lieutenant Evans' sled was far slower than the captain's because he barely pulled any of the weight himself, leaving all the hard work to the other men tied to the sled. Only in the instances when Captain Scott's team would stop to take a break and look back at the men falling behind would Lieutenant Evans put his head down and pull with all his might. Scott also noticed that Lieutenant Evans' sledging team was poorly drilled and instructed, letting the men carry on without focus and without utilizing their strength efficiently. Nevertheless, all while avoiding innumerable ice-bridged crevices and pressure ridges, the men carried on, achieving at least 10 miles of marching per day. The mountains on either side of the Beardmore Glacier watched on as Lieutenant Evans and Bowers took every possible opportunity to survey them and Dr. Wilson to sketch them. On the 20th of December, the men camped at an altitude of 6,500 feet, and Captain Scott told Atkinson, Wright, Cohan, and Cherry Garrard that they were to make their way back to Cape Evans. Wright especially was bitterly disappointed by the decision. Wild with rage, Wright wrote that Scott was a fool for sending him back while keeping Lieutenant Evans on. Cherry wrote of the event in his diary. This evening has been rather a shock. Scott came up to me and said that he was afraid he had rather a blow for me. Of course I knew what he was going to say, but could hardly grasp that I was going back tomorrow night. Scott was very put about, said he had been thinking a lot about it, but had come to the conclusion that the seamen with their special knowledge would be needed. To rebuild the sledge, I suppose. Wilson told me it was a toss-up whether Oates or I should go on. That being so, I think Oates will help him more than I can. I said all I could think of. He seemed so cut up about it, saying, I think somehow, it is especially hard on you. I said I hoped I had not disappointed him, and he caught hold of me and said, No, no, no. So if that is the case, all is well. The captain restated to Atkinson that it was vital to send the necessary supplies to one ton depot via dog team, but changed the order concerning the dog team trek in March. Atkinson was apparently instructed to only go as far as he could in order to not risk the well-being of the dogs, and not until latitude 82 degrees, 30 minutes south. The captain asked Atkinson to lead the dogs in the likely event that Mears would be returning home on the Terra Nova, for it seemed that Mears had expressed his eagerness to do so. In a later account, Mears apparently stated that there used to be great trouble and unhappiness during the expedition and numerous clashes with Scott, which seemed to be a large contributing factor to his want to leave Antarctica. Captain Scott and the others bid farewell to the departing four on the 21st of December. Cherry gave away some spare belongings to the others who would march on, such as pajama trousers for Wilson, socks and a scarf for Crean, tobacco for Oates, and tobacco given discreetly to Wilson that was to be presented to Scott on Christmas Day. The now eight-man party reassembled and reorganized themselves into two sledging teams, Scott, Wilson, Oates, and Petty Officer Evans pulling one sledge, and Lieutenant Evans, Bowers, Crean, and Lashley pulling the other. They soon encountered landscapes of extensive crevices stretching out on all sides, covered by a thin layer of melted and refrozen snow. Most team members took turns in tumbling into them, some going as far as dangling freely with only the rope attached to their sledge to hold them up. On Christmas Eve, their path was interrupted by chaotic crevices and immense pressure ridges, and they had to carefully dodge these disturbances. Christmas Day also fell on Lashley's 44th birthday. Set to be as hard as nails, he was hardly perturbed when his full body fell into a crevice, nearly dragging down his sledge and the rest of the team with him. From what he could see, he judged the crevice to be around 50 feet deep and 8 feet across, in the shape of a U. 
measurements he gathered with the use of his ski sticks. He was quickly pulled back onto safe ground with the use of an alpine rope. A mix of smooth sailing followed by rough trekking ensued, and by the end of the day, the team had covered 15 miles. For dinner, they celebrated the holiday by feasting on pemmican, biscuits, chocolate eclair, pony meat, plum pudding, crystallized ginger, and four caramel candies per man. After the meal, they could hardly move. Other members had also kept secret reserves of chocolate and raisins for this occasion, which they shared with the others. The next day, the men started out half an hour late on the count of their heavy meal and equally heavy sleep. Unfortunately, as opposed to the expected southerly winds, which Scott hoped would help push them forward, they were met with unstopping headwinds pushing against them. On the 26th of December, the men who remained in the Cape Evans hut remarked that it had been one full week after the planned arrival date of the dog teams. Fearing a significant delay, a four-man team consisting of Day, Hooper, Nelson, and Clissold decided to instead manhaul three-fifths of the necessary fuel and supplies to one-ton depot. They did not bring any dog food because they deemed it to be a weight too great for them to manhaul and planned to bring them at a later date. Indeed, Mears not only stayed on the barrier for longer than planned, but his return trip was marred with blizzards, which further slowed his progress. He had to rebuild all the cairns the previous teams had made since most had been blown down, and had to take out extra rations for himself from the depots, leaving notes apologizing for doing so. During the final days of the year, the southern party were met with occasional slopes, snow hills, some pressure ridges, and of course, the unceasing headwinds. Captain Scott observed that his sledging team fared rather well and moved more smoothly compared with the other sledge. He suspected that two members of the second team, Lieutenant Evans and Lashley respectively, who had been manhauling for nearly two months ever since the breakdown of the motor sledges, were feeling pretty well done in. On New Year's Eve, Petty Officer Evans and Crean deconstructed and adjusted the sledges to be shorter, now measuring 10 feet in length rather than 12, which were bound to make hauling a lighter task. Petty Officer Evans accidentally cut through the knuckles of his hand in the process, which continued to badly affect him during the following weeks. The team used this break in sledging to create another supply depot, named Three Degree Depot, as they were roughly three degrees of latitude from the South Pole. On New Year's Day, 1912, the men trekked over 11 miles and celebrated with a stick of chocolate. On the 3rd of January, Captain Scott made his final decision regarding the men that would accompany him to the South Pole. In an unexpected move, he announced that the final polar party would consist of five men, Petty Officer Evans, Lieutenant Bowers, Captain Oates, Dr. Wilson, and Captain Scott himself. This created some difficulties as all packs of sledging rations had been made for teams of four. Likewise, their tents and all their cooking utensils could ideally support four men at a time. What made him change his mind isn't clear, but it is possible that he felt a five-man team could haul the sledge faster and so reach the pole in less time. Lashley was badly affected by this decision. Crean reportedly cried. When Captain Scott privately told Lieutenant Evans that he was to go no further, he burst out in furious anger. The lieutenant wrote that he was angered greatly by the fact that Scott had taken Bowers from his sledging team, leaving him and only two other men to pull their sledge back. Scott, though, remarked that after unloading their supplies, the returning party's sledge was quite light and would make for a hopefully quick trip home. He wrote in his journal that Evans was terribly disappointed, but had taken the news well and behaved like a man. Controversially, Captain Scott allegedly gave Lieutenant Evans new orders concerning the dog teams. He either changed the meeting place back to the original coordinates of latitude 82 degrees 30 minutes south, or that the dogs were to travel across the ice barrier and meet up with a polar team at the foot of the Beardmore Glacier. He sent a short message to be brought back to Cape Evans. Latitude 87 degrees 32 minutes. A last note from a hopeful position. I think it's going to be alright. 
we have a fine party going forward and arrangements are all going well. The next day, Mears and Dimitri finally returned to the Cape Evans hut with their dog teams. Understandably, the dogs were very tired after their ordeal and would take some time more for them to recuperate and get ready to set out again to complete their remaining objectives, mainly finishing the resupplying of One Ton Depot and meeting with Captain Scott at latitude 82 degrees 30 minutes south, as was told to Mears. After some days, he completed the setup of the sledges and was rearing to go, but he saw what he thought was the Terra Nova coming back from New Zealand in the distance and halted preparations. He was eager to get home as quickly as possible to handle some issues regarding his father and his estate and to get away from Captain Scott. What Mears had seen was actually a mirage. The Terra Nova was not as close to the Cape as it appeared and was in fact at the time on her way to pick up Campbell and his northern party waiting for her in Cape Adair. Campbell's party was then carried by the ship to the vicinity of Evans Cove a region some 250 miles from Cape Adair and 200 miles away from Scott's base in Cape Evans. Here, the Northern Party were to carry out further geological work and map making until the Terra Nova returned again to pick them up in the middle of February. The six men were left with only six weeks of provisions to sustain themselves. On the 5th of January, Captain Scott acknowledged some of the new difficulties with sledging as a team of five. He noted that cooking took considerably longer, taking up a solid hour of the day. Also on that day, the surface became extremely challenging as sastrugi, or wind-eroded ridges of snow, impeded their progress. On the 7th, Scott decided to leave behind their skis, which made pulling over the undulating surface only more difficult. After 40 minutes of marching, he saw that the sastrugi were gradually dissipating and made the decision to go back and fetch their skis again. However, to his shock, they still pulled incredibly slowly with their skis on the count of the fine sandy snow surface. Scott made a point to commend the rations and his men, but lamented over Petty Officer Evans, who had sustained a very worrisome cut on his hand while sledge making. Even though they claimed their meals were very satisfying after a hard day of hauling, the calories they were consuming were in fact too little in relation to the calories they were exerting, and the men unknowingly were on a starvation diet. The next day, they met their first blizzard while on the polar plateau. The captain took this time to write about the men in his company. It is quite impossible to speak too highly of my companions. Each fulfills his office to the party. Wilson, first as doctor, ever on the lookout to alleviate the small pains and troubles incidental to the work, now as cook, quick, careful, and dexterous, ever thinking of some fresh expedient to help the camp life. Tough as steel on the traces, never wavering from start to finish. Evans, a giant worker with a really remarkable headpiece. It is only now I realize how much has been due to him. Our ski shoes and crampons have been absolutely indispensable, and if the original ideas were not his, the details of manufacture and design and the good workmanship are his alone. He is responsible for every sledge, every sledge fitting, tents, sleeping bags, harness, and when one cannot recall a single expression of dissatisfaction with any of these items, it shows what an invaluable assistant he has been. Little Bowers remains a marvel. He is thoroughly enjoying himself. I leave all the provision arrangements in his hands, and at all times, he knows exactly how we stand, or how each returning party should fare. It has been a complicated business to redistribute stores at various stages of reorganization, but not one single mistake has been made. In addition to the stores, he keeps the most thorough and conscientious meteorological record, and to this he now adds the duty of observer and photographer. Nothing comes amiss to him, and no work is too hard. It is a difficulty to get him into the tent. He seems quite oblivious of the cold, and he lies coiled in his bag, riding and working out sights long after the others are asleep. Of these three, it is a matter for thought and congratulation that each is sufficiently suited for his own work, 
but would not be capable of doing that of the others as well as it is done. Each is invaluable. Oates had his invaluable period with the ponies. Now he is a foot slogger and goes hard the whole time, does his share of camp work and stands the hardship as well as any of us. I would not like to be without him either. So our five people are perhaps as happily selected as it is possible to imagine. On the 9th of January, the men surpassed Sir Ernest Shackleton's farthest south record. The marching though had become monotonous and upsetting over the terrible snowy surface. Some days, they only managed to travel five miles. On the 10th, they created the degree and a half depot, containing a week's worth of provisions, greatly lightening their load. Over the next few days, Captain Scott's diary entries remained quite brief, overcome by the monotonous slog of difficult ground and dark weather. He remained incredibly hopeful though of reaching the South Pole, counting down the ever-decreasing distance between them. On the 15th, they created their so-called last depot, containing four days of food. That evening, Scott wrote of their prospects. It is wonderful to think that two long marches would land us at the pole. We left our depot today with nine days provisions, so that it ought to be a certain thing now. And the only appalling possibility, the sight of the Norwegian flag for stalling hours. Only 27 miles from the pole. We ought to do it now. On the 16th of January, Scott wrote of the awful scene awaiting them. The worst has happened, or nearly the worst. About the second hour of the march, Bowers' sharp eyes detected what he thought was a cairn. He was uneasy about it, but argued that it must be a sestrugus. Half an hour later, he detected a black speck ahead. Soon we knew that this could not be a natural snow feature. We marched on found that it was a black flag tied to a sledge bearer nearby the remains of a camp. Sledge tracks and ski tracks going and coming and the clear trace of dogs paws, many dogs. This told us the whole story. The Norwegians have forestalled us and are first at the pole. It is a terrible disappointment and I'm very sorry for my loyal companions. Many thoughts come and much discussion have we had. Tomorrow, we must march on to the pole and then hasten home with all the speed we can compass. All the daydreams must go. It will be a wearisome return. The next day, they edged ever closer, following the tracks of the Norwegian sleds and the dogs, passing by two cairns along the way. On the 17th of January, they were within a few miles from the pole. Bauer spotted a cairn and a tent about a mile off, so they went to investigate. It was the final camp of the Norwegians before they had reached the pole. They went inside and found some documents, including a letter written by Roald Amundsen describing his journey to King Haken, and had left written instructions for Captain Scott to deliver it to the king himself. According to the letter, Amundsen had set out for the pole on the 19th of October with four other men, four sledges, and 52 dogs. On their journey, the men did not make any scientific or geographic observations and simply attempted to travel as fast as possible in order for Amundsen to win the race of his own design. Despite some near-death falls into crevices, they managed to reach the end of the ice barrier on the 17th of November, where they were stopped by the Transantarctic Mountains. Unlike Shackleton and Scott, who bypassed them via the Beardmore Glacier, Amundsen's team had to find another way. After scouting the area for several days, the men spotted a glacier via which they could ascend up to the polar plateau. Amundsen named it the Axel Heilberg Glacier, in honor of one of his financial backers. They successfully scaled it, with the Norwegians commending their powerful dogs. Upon climbing up to 10,000 feet, the men killed over half of their dogs to feed themselves and the other dogs. They finally reached the vicinity of the South Pole on the 14th of December, nearly five weeks before Scott's party. Amundsen and three other team members who were experienced navigators took various sextant readings at different times of the day from different locations over the next three days to make absolutely sure that they were in the right place. 
They set up their tent as close to what they approximated to have been the geographic South Pole as possible, and raised atop it the flag of Norway. They began making their way back to their camp on the 18th of December. Scott reflected. The Pole, yes, but under very different circumstances from those expected. We have had a horrible day, adds to our disappointment a headwind with a temperature of minus 22 degrees, and companions laboring on with cold feet and hands. Great God, this is an awful place, and terrible enough for us to have labored to it without the reward of priority. Well, it is something to have got here, and the wind may be our friend tomorrow. Scott's plan now was to mark the pole for himself, and then rush back to Cape Evans and board the Terra Nova in the desperate hope to report the news of reaching the pole when they get to New Zealand. Using their own measurements, the British team traced the approximate location of the South Pole to the best of their abilities. They built a small cairn and planted their Union Jack. Through the bitter cold and bitter feelings, they set up their camera to take some photographs at the site to record their achievement, taking little effort to hide their immeasurable tiredness and disappointment. After doing so, they promptly gathered their things and turned around to pull their way back, saying goodbye to their daydreams. On the 19th of January, Lieutenant Evans, Lashley, and Crean reached the Lower Glacier Depot along their way back to Cape Evans. Tom Crean and Lieutenant Evans had been suffering from snow blindness, which forced Lashley to lead and guide the party for some time. This and other depots were eventually found to have some missing supplies, which was caused by two possible scenarios. Either this was the result of one of Bowers's rare moments of making a mistake, or presumably out of spite or as an act of vengeance, it is possible that someone from Lieutenant Evans's party began taking out some food supplies from the depots that were reserved for the returning Polar Party. The reason for some missing supplies was never concretely determined, but due to Lieutenant Evans's known conflict with his superior, noted untrustworthiness from other teammates, added with his history of taking more than his ration of pemmican, would make him a likely candidate for taking extra supplies. By the 23rd of January, Scott's team was 13 miles away from Degree and a Half Depot, having experienced a mix of days of smooth sledging and horrible hauling. A strong wind from the south arrived to their advantage, so the men affixed a makeshift sail onto the sledge, using the wind to help push it along. They could then move ahead with great speed, but their progress was stopped by Dr. Wilson when he noticed that Petty Officer Evans's nose was thoroughly frostbitten, white, and hard. Oates too complained of cold feet, while the other three reportedly were in peak physical condition. One of Oates's toes had in fact turned black, and he hoped that it would not impede their progress. No doubt he must have been in a great deal of pain. The simple act of pulling on socks meant that exposed nerve endings of his damaged tissue brushed against their textile hairs, and from then on, he would wear his boots, which squeezed his feet for an agonizing 12 hours per day. His most longed-for moment was the end of the daily march, when he could finally take off his boots, only to go through the exact same process the next day, and every day after that. On the 24th of January, a full-fledged blizzard developed, forcing the team to set up camp. A worried Scott wrote in his diary, We are only seven miles from our depot, but I made sure we should be there tonight. This is the second full gale since we left the pole. I don't like the look of it. Is the weather breaking up? If so, God help us. With a tremendous summit journey and scant food. Wilson and Bowers are my standby. I don't like the easy way in which Oates and Evans get frostbitten. Fortunately, they reached the next depot the following day, taking with them nine and a half days of provisions that had to last them for another 89 miles till the next depot. Over the next couple of days, they encountered some unkind surfaces and sastrugi, and saw that most of their tracks from the way forward had been blown away, so they struggled to spot any of the cairns they had made in the distance. 
On the 27th, the air became more dry, which allowed their equipment, such as their tents and sleeping bags, to dry a little bit and shed their icy conditions caused by the blizzards. However, they would need many more days like this to allow for their things to fully recover. Wet sleeping bags and tents remained more hard and more cold, causing uncomfortable and possibly dangerous rest periods. On the 28th, Scott lamented. We are getting more hungry, there is no doubt. The lunch meal is beginning to seem inadequate. We are pretty thin, especially Evans, but none of us are feeling worked out. I doubt if we could drag heavy loads, but we can keep going well with our light one. We talk of food a great deal more and shall be glad to open out on it. Also on the 28th of January, Atkinson, Wright, Cohan, and Cherry Garrard returned to Cape Evans. At the hut, in the absence of both Captain Scott and Lieutenant Evans, Atkinson was the most senior member of the team and the de facto leader for the time being, a role he was not all that adept in handling. Upon their arrival, they learned of the late returning of the dog teams and also the partial delivery of vital supplies to Wantan Depot. Curiously, there was no further journey to the depot by the dog teams to deliver the remainder of supplies. Additionally, under Atkinson's command, it is said that Mears was quote-unquote unavailable to carry out his duties, having resigned from the expedition due to unclear reasons. In a later correspondence with Cherry Garrard, Atkinson wrote that Mears had been known to disobey orders. Instead of aiding Scott's mission in any capacity, Mears spent the rest of his time in Antarctica living side by side with the rest of the men, but without contributing anything, anxiously waiting for the Terra Nova to arrive at the Cape. At the time, the men could see the ship far off in the distance, but as of yet could not reach the hut due to the vast expanse of pack ice. Since the ship did not arrive yet, Atkinson did not set out with the dogs himself, as Captain Scott had suggested, for he wanted to make sure he was present when the Terra Nova made her landing. On the 30th of January, the Polar Party had nearly reached the next depot, when Dr. Wilson strained a tendon in his leg. On top of this, Petty Officer Evans's fingers were badly blistered and frostbitten, and most of his fingernails were coming off. He had been feeling miserable since his hand accident, and this only exacerbated his loss of heart. Scott considered an injured hand a manageable ailment, which would not affect hauling much, so he was instead deeply concerned over Wilson's leg, which remained painful and swollen into the night. On the final day of January, they reached their next depot. Wilson walked slowly alongside the sledge and effectively improved his condition. On the 1st of February, Wilson reported that Petty Officer Evans's hands continued to degrade horribly. Scott privately wrote that his once sturdy and dependable companion had become rather dull and incapable. What's more was that Evans and Scott, during their hauling, fell into unseen crevices, though were successfully pulled out. Wilson believed that Petty Officer Evans sustained some severe knocks to his head during one of such falls. On the 4th of February, the Terra Nova came close enough to Cape Evans for the shore party to establish communications and pick up mail from abroad. It was here that they learned that Campbell's northern party were taken from Cape Adair and brought to Evans Cove, where they were due to be picked up mid-February. It was also during this time that while on the ice barrier, Lieutenant Evans began experiencing looseness of the bowels. Furthermore, his companion Lashley reported that the lieutenant began feeling a stiffness of the neck and knees, a worrying condition, since these were some of the earliest signs of the onset of scurvy. Lieutenant Evans even had to be put into his skis by Lashley and Crean, since he could not lift his legs. On the 7th of February, Scott and his men reached the Upper Glacier Depot. There was a panic upon discovering that there was an entire day's worth of biscuit rations missing. Bowers especially was deeply disturbed by it, and the men could not account for the mystery. The next day proved to be positively exciting as they came across some exposed rock and took to chisel away at it to collect samples. They found some with visible fossilized impressions of plant life and were keen to bring it back to have it thoroughly examined. With this extra load of a negligible 35 pounds, they proceeded to make their way down the Beardmore Glacier. 
On the 9th of February, the Terra Nova was three miles away from Cape Evans, blocked by frozen sea. Atkinson made the decision to use the shore party to unload supplies from the ship, rather than using the ship's crew, a move that Cherry Guard considered to have been a mistake, since many of the shore party had just finished intense sledging and were awfully tired. Furthermore, their daily traveling of around 20 miles to unload the ship made them even more tired and too fatigued to carry out any more possible sledging in the near future. Before the Terra Nova had departed the team in early 1911, there were plans made to resupply the shore party in the case a second year would be spent on Antarctica. So not only did the men now receive extra food and new sledges, but also 14 dogs from Kamchatka in Russia and seven mules from India. The previous January, Captain Oates had discussed with Captain Scott the possibility that mules may be more effective than the ponies in the event the Polar Party failed at their first attempt to reach the South Pole and had to go again in the next season. In accordance with their request, the mules they received had been trained excellently and their gear was likewise fully adapted to function in cold conditions. After the unloading was completed, the Terra Nova then set out to pick up Griffith Taylor's geological party and then Campbell's northern party before coming back to Cape Evans to retrieve any other men who had to go back home. On the 11th of February, Scott's men experienced some of the worst traveling of their entire stay in Antarctica. They pulled through a wretched surface in terrible light, only to suddenly find themselves amidst pressure ridges. Numerous times, Scott called for a change of course to the east, then to the west, but their conditions remained hopeless. Arguments ensued over which course of action should be taken. A call to veer to the east resulted in them traversing a maze of crevices, with everyone taking a fall every minute, though without major accident. After 12 hours of marching, they made their camp for the night. Captain Scott felt that the next depot was longer away than he had originally planned, so he called for a reduction in rations, dividing the remaining three pemmican meals into smaller quantities to make them last four more times. The next day, they encountered much of the same horrific conditions. Crevices and fissures surrounded them, and when they made their camp that night, they were uncertain of their precise position. The captain called their situation critical. On the 13th, they moved out in low visibility, still hungry, and desperately keeping a lookout for their depot. At one point, Petty Officer Evans shouted at the possible sight of a depot ahead, but it was only a shadow on the ice. Wilson then spotted the flag waving above the snow, which signified the location of their next depot. They cheerily had their supper there, refilling their supply with three and a half days food. Sometime after they left the depot, Bowers had a severe attack of snow blindness. Wilson, too, was troubled by the ailment, likely caused by his tendency to remove his goggles while looking for tracks. Petty Officer Evans was judged by Scott to not have enough power to assist them with any camping work, calling him a great nuisance and very clumsy. Also on the 13th of February, just past One Ton Depot, Lieutenant Evans's condition was gradually getting worse with a new symptom being passing blood. Lashley, almost concretely diagnosing the lieutenant with scurvy, cut all whole pemmican out of his diet and fed him seal liver and meat picked out of the pemmican. His well-being did not improve, and it was decided by Lashley and Crean that it would be best to put Lieutenant Evans on the sledge and try to pull him the rest of the way. They left as many unnecessary items as possible behind to decrease their load. Their progress had slowed dramatically and were at risk of running out of food before reaching their next sanctuary at Hut Point. Because of his aversion to eating seal meat, Lieutenant Evans became the first and only confirmed crew member of the Terra Nova expedition to have gotten scurvy, putting the lives of himself and his two teammates at risk. Meanwhile, after making sure that all unloading activities were going smoothly, Atkinson and Dimitri set out with the dog teams and the remainder of the necessary supplies destined for One Ton Depot. Since the ice between Cape Evans and Hut Point was showing signs of breaking up, Atkinson crossed it early and stayed at the Discovery Hut where he could still communicate via telephone with the Cape Evans Hut if there was such a need. 
they were first to camp out at Hut Point for a week before making their way to Wonton. On the 14th of February, Captain Scott and his men fortunately marched a fair distance in calm weather. However, all was not well with the team. There is no getting away from the fact that we are not going strong, probably none of us. Wilson's leg still troubles him and he doesn't like to trust himself on ski. But the worst case is Evans, who is giving us serious anxiety. This morning, he suddenly disclosed a huge blister on his foot. It delayed us on the march when he had to have his crampon readjusted. Sometimes I fear he is going from bad to worse, but I trust he will pick up again when we come to steady work on ski like this afternoon. He is hungry, and so is Wilson. We can't risk opening out our food again. And as cook at present, I am serving something under full allowance. We are inclined to get slack and slow with our camping arrangements, and small delays increase. I have talked of the matter tonight and hope for improvement. We cannot do distance without the ponies. The next depot some 30 miles away and nearly three days food in hand. The next day, the five men pulled hard through soft surface. They were suffering on reduced provisions and reduced sleep and finished the day about 20 miles from their next depot. On the 16th, Scott wrote in his diary, a rather trying position. Evans had nearly broken down in brain, we think. He is absolutely changed from his normal self-reliant self. This morning and this afternoon, he stopped the march on some trivial excuse. By the end of the march, Scott reckoned they were 10 to 12 miles away from the lower glacier depot and were dreadfully low on supplies. Scott's words of hope had also become absent from his entries. On the 17th of February, Scott wrote of the tragedy which befell the group. A very terrible day. Petty Officer Evans looked a little better after a good sleep and declared, as he always did, that he was quite well. He started in his place on the traces, but half an hour later worked his ski shoes adrift and had to leave the sledge. The surface was awful, the soft, recently fallen snow clogging the ski and runners at every step, the sledge groaning, the sky overcast, and the land hazy. We stopped after about one hour, and Evans came up again, but very slowly. Half an hour later, he dropped out again on the same plea. He asked Bowers to lend him a piece of string. I cautioned him to come on as quickly as he could, and he answered cheerfully as I thought. We had to push on, and the remainder of us were forced to pull very hard, sweating heavily. Abreast the monument rock, we stopped and seeing Evans a long way astern, I camped for lunch. There was no alarm at first, and we prepared tea and our own meal, consuming the latter. After lunch, and Evans still not appearing, we looked out to see him still afar off. By this time we were alarmed, and all four started back on ski. I was first to reach the poor man and shocked at his appearance. He was on his knees, with clothing disarranged, hands uncovered and frostbitten, and a wild look in his eyes. I asked what was the matter. He replied with a slow speech that he didn't know, but thought he must have fainted. We got him on his feet, but after two or three steps, he sank down again. He showed every sign of complete collapse. Wilson, Bowers, and I went back for the sledge, while Oates remained with him. When we returned, he was practically unconscious, and when we got him into the tent, quite comatose. He died quietly at 12.30 a.m. On discussing the symptoms, we think he began to get weaker just before we reached the pole, and that his downward path was accelerated first by the shock of his frostbitten fingers, and later by falls during rough traveling on the glacier, furthered by his loss of all confidence in himself. Wilson thinks it's certain he must have injured his brain by a fall. It is a terrible thing to lose a companion in this way, but calm reflection shows that there could not have been a better ending to the terrible anxieties of the past week. Discussion of the situation at lunch yesterday shows us what a desperate pass we were in with a sick man on our hands at such a distance from home. At a loss for words, they silently moved ahead and quickly reached their next depot. On the 18th of February, a few miles from corner camp, Lashley attempted to move Lieutenant Evans, but he collapsed completely as he lost consciousness. Crean, thinking the lieutenant surely had just died, almost began crying, 
but was asked to hold on to his emotions, for causing a scene would not do anyone any good. Sure enough, after some coaxing and use of brandy, Lieutenant Evans was brought back into consciousness and was secured onto the sledge. They tried pulling for a couple of hours, but the surface was too soft. They stopped sledging and discussed a rescue plan. Lashley or Crean would set up camp and stay with the ill lieutenant, while the other would run on foot to Hut Point in an attempt to get help. Lashley volunteered himself for the dangerous and daring deed, but Crean thought it best that he stay and look after their superior. All three agreed with the plan. Having only a day's provisions with a small surplus of biscuits, they gave Crean as much as he thought was necessary to sustain himself for the 35-mile journey, two sticks of chocolate, and three biscuits. He was offered some brandy to keep himself warm, but declined. At 10 in the morning, Tom Crean left Lashley with Lieutenant Evans amidst calm weather. Crean ran on foot, having left his skis behind several days ago. He ran non-stop for around 16 miles when he decided he ought to take a break and eat most of what he had. He sat on the snow for about five minutes, finishing his chocolate and two biscuits, saving the last for later. He later said he was quite warm and not at all sleepy. He then got up again and continued on his run. The surface was becoming more unstable. Luckily, he bypassed any crevices which may have been in his path. Gradually, the clear weather gave way to overcast skies, and an increasing wind and falling snow pushed against him. Crean slipped and fell on his back several times, and he could feel slush seeping into his reindeer skin boots. When he reached the slopes of Observation Hill, he took a seat and finished his last biscuit with some ice. He could see the Discovery Hut in the distance, but no signs of sledges or dogs. He slid down the hill and bolted for the hut, eventually seeing dogs resting beside it. The winds were blowing very hard now as Crean struggled to reach Sanctuary. He opened the door and walked in, finding Atkinson and Dimitri inside, shocked. They rushed him inside, where they learned of Lieutenant Evans's predicament. They gave the exhausted Crean some brandy and porridge, which he could not hold down, promptly ejecting it. Crean had traveled 35 miles on foot in 18 hours. Atkinson then had to rearrange the course their dogs had to take, prioritizing the lieutenant's rescue over the resupply mission to One Ton Depot. Atkinson and Dimitri then promptly rode out in search of the lieutenant. By this time, the Terra Nova had picked up Taylor's geological party and were on their way to retrieve Campbell's northern party. They tried many attempts at reaching them at their predetermined meeting spot on Inexpressible Island but the ship was blocked by a border of heavy pack ice, never managing to get closer than 27 miles from the stranded men. From the northern party's perspective, there was open water as far as the eye could see, because the pack of ice in fact lay beyond their line of sight. While they anxiously waited for the Terra Nova, they began dreaming up stories of disaster to explain her absence, such as a possible wrecking, loss of the southern party, or tragedy caused by a fierce wind. As they waited in their tents, they started scheming what next steps they should take in the case the Terra Nova never arrived. Running low on coal and time, the ship had no other choice but to abandon Campbell's party and return to Cape Evans. Meanwhile, Scott and his remaining three polar travelers were making poor miles over difficult terrain that was described by the captain to have been like desert sand. Low visibility also resulted in them drifting off course. Only when the weather cleared could they refer to their map and correct their direction. Captain Scott reflected that without Petty Officer Evans, their speed was improved. But if he had still been with them and at perfect health, they would not be suffering through this critical period. On the 20th of February, while riding their dogs on the barrier, Atkinson and Dimitri found a flag flapping above the snow which marked the position of Lashley and Lieutenant Evans's sledge and tent. The marooned duo were overjoyed at Dr. Atkinson's sight, who quickly gave their sick superior the fruits, vegetables, and seal meat for which his body desperately craved. Evans was in good spirits, but terribly weak. The doctor could not thank Lashley and Crean enough for all they did in trying to save Lieutenant Evans's life, for if he had not gotten the nutrients he needed within another day or two, 
he would have died. As it happened, a blizzard prevented them from getting back to safety, so they had to remain in their tents for an entire day. On the 22nd, the winds settled enough for the four men to head back to Hut Point with their dogs. They reached the hut later that day and discussed the next steps in their plan. On the 23rd of February, everyone at Cape Evans was caught aback by the surprise arrival of Dimitri and Crean riding a single dog team. They delivered a letter from Atkinson to Wright. It was only then that the men learned that Atkinson had not gone to One Ton Depot to complete the vital journey as ordered by Captain Scott. Atkinson requested that Wright deliver the necessary food for the ailing Lieutenant Evans, along with other luxuries. He was also requested to travel with a dog team to One Ton instead of Atkinson, for he had to look after Evans. If Wright was unavailable, then the duty to travel to One Ton would be passed on to Cherry Guard. Soon enough, both he and Cherry reached Hut Point on foot. Upon their arrival, the doctor informed the two men of the new arrangements. After some discussion, it was concluded that Wright was to stay back at Cape Evans, for Dr. Simpson had received orders to board the Terra Nova and then travel to India to conduct meteorological research, leaving Wright as the most capable scientist on shore to continue Dr. Simpson's studies. This meant that Cherry Guard would have to deliver the supplies to the depot. The 130-mile trip to Wonton Depot was no small task for Cherry, who had never even driven a single dog, let alone an entire team. His navigational skills were also not one of his strong points, though should not have posed a problem since the route was adequately marked by snow cairns. Atkinson ordered Cherry to take the missing rations and 21 days of dog food to the depot via dog teams as quickly as possible. In the likelihood that Captain Scott and his team had not arrived there yet, Cherry Guard was told to decide for himself what to do. Atkinson reiterated that Scott stated that he did not depend on the dogs for their return and that the dogs should not be risked in view of sledging plans for the next season. Lieutenant Evans, who was also present at the Discovery Hut, apparently never disclosed any possible change in Scott's plans for the dogs to travel as far as the bottom of the Beardmore Glacier to meet up with them. After a night's rest, Dimitri arrived with his dog team at Hut Point and would then go with Cherry Guard to the depot. On the 24th of February, Captain Scott and his team reached the South Barrier Depot. He wrote that he found all the stores in order, except for the oil used to fuel their Primus stove. The kerosene oil contained within their cans had a tendency to undergo a chemical process called creep, during which the fuel would creep up the walls of the can and could even leak out the tightly screwed cap. This happened at a greater degree in cold temperatures. Furthermore, if the cans were exposed to direct sunlight, the oil could vaporize within the can and seep out the tiny gaps under the cap. With reduced kerosene, they had to use their primus more sparingly, meaning they possibly could not thoroughly cook all of their food, or even use it more liberally to heat up their tent and their bodies. This also meant they could not as often melt down ice to make drinking water, leading to severe dehydration. The days that followed brought with them laborious pulling. The weather had become beautifully clear, but dreadfully cold. All four men suffered from cold, wet feet, as their finesco, or their snowshoes, were entirely improper in conditions of heavy marching. Fortunately for Bowers and Oates, they then switched to their remaining unused pair of deerskin boots, hoping they would be enough to last them until the hut. In the final days of February, Scott decided to increase daily food rations, which proved to make a positive effect on the men's morale and endurance. Though just as important, if not more so, was their fuel, which was critically running low. Their frozen supplies would be of little use without it, so they had to struggle on until the next depot while using it very sparingly, sledging day to day in an escapable cold misery. On the 1st of March, Campbell and his northern party were coming to terms that the Terra Nova, for some unknown reason, was not coming for them. It was too far and too treacherous for them to make their own way back to either their comfortable hut on Cape Adair or Scott's hut on Cape Evans, so they gathered their forces and made preparations to winter where they were, on an expressible island. Their journey to Scott's hut would have to wait until springtime. 
In preparation, the men split up into two teams of three, with one spending many days killing seals and dolphins in spite of terrible winds, which were beginning to rip their windproof clothing and tents into shreds. The other team proceeded to dig a hole into a large drift of snow in an effort to construct a cave that would have to become their shelter for the approaching winter. Also on that day, Scott's team reached the middle barrier depot and their hearts sank even deeper. The oil cans were dreadfully low as a result of the teams which came before them opening and using them in addition to evaporation and leaking. Furthermore, Oates disclosed his feet to the others, which were in a horrifying state. The situation for the others did not look too promising either, as the lining of their finesco retained moisture and failed to dry in temperatures of minus 30 to minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit. It would take them well over an hour to simply put on their boots, slowly thawing their icy bottoms with the heat of their feet. However, since Oates's feet were so badly frostbitten, they radiated little heat on the count of the poor circulation. Wilson helped him cut a hole in a sleeping bag so Oates could keep his decaying foot frozen outside, keeping it less painful. Captain Scott wrote, The surface, lately a very good hard one, is coated with a thin layer of woolly crystals. These are too firmly fixed to be removed by the wind and cause impossible friction on the sledge runners. God help us. We can't keep up with us pulling, that is certain. Amongst ourselves we are unendingly cheerful, but what each man feels in his heart I can only guess. Pulling on footgear in the morning is getting slower and slower, therefore every day more dangerous. On the 3rd of March, after riding the dogs at great speed, Cherry and Dimitri found one ton depot. They were relieved to have gotten there before Scott and his men arrived and did not miss their fresh provisions. Cherry Guard assessed the situation and thought that the unsettled weather would make further travel south impossible. The low visibility made it entirely likely that the dog teams and the returning polar party would not even see each other. Cherry decided to stay at one ton for as long as his rations allowed. At this time, the Terra Nova was preparing to leave Antarctica, having deposited all necessary supplies and animals and taken aboard nine men who needed to stay no longer. These included photographer Ponting, the chef Clissold, Dr. Simpson, and a partially recovered Lieutenant Evans. While on board the ship, he met with Trigva Gran, who had just been picked up with the rest of the geological party. Gran was allegedly concerned over the lateness of the lieutenant's arrival and his condition, and requested that the shore party launch a relief expedition to find Captain Scott's men. Lieutenant Evans rejected this plea and instead asked Gran to accompany him back to New Zealand. Gran refused. The Terra Nova sailed away on the 4th of March. The next day offered no relief for the polar party. The march proved hard, caused in part by the conservation of oil, meaning they only managed to melt the chill off the pemmican before eating it awfully hard and cold. They pretended that they enjoyed it better that way. Oates's feet only got worse. Wilson tried to desperately treat the ailing soldier, but little could be done for him in the environment they were in. On the 6th of March, Captain Scott acknowledged in his journal that Oates had become a terrible hindrance to the group. He developed a pronounced limp and was hardly able to pull the sledge. He remained plucky and a little cheerful, though no doubt his feet must have pained him greatly. For the entire day, they only advanced six and a half miles. On the 7th, Scott estimated that if they kept sustaining themselves on what meager provisions they had and at the current rate of speed, they could reach the next depot, Mount Hooper Depot, but not One Ton Depot. Every day, they all hoped for the dogs to come and rescue them and were fearful that they would not be able to be seen if they veered off some distance to the east or west. On the 10th of March, the polar party reached Mount Hooper Depot, but according to Captain Scott's journal, their future still looked dim. Things steadily downhill, Oates's foot worse. He has rare pluck and must know that he can never get through. He asked Wilson if he had a chance this morning, and of course, Bill had to say he didn't know. In point of fact, he has none. Apart from him, if he went under now, I doubt whether we could get through. With great care, we might have a dog's chance, but no more. 
The weather conditions are awful, and our gear gets steadily more icy and difficult to manage. At the same time, of course, poor Oates is the greatest handicap. He keeps us waiting in the morning until we have partly lost the warming effect of our good breakfast, when the only wise policy is to be up and away at once, again at lunch. Poor chap. It is too pathetic to watch him. One cannot but try to cheer him up. Yesterday we marched up the depot, Mount Hooper. Cold comfort. Shortage on our allowance all round. I don't know that anyone is to blame, but generosity and thoughtfulness have not been abundant. The dogs, which would have been our salvation, have evidently failed. Mears had a bad trip home, I suppose. It is a miserable jumble. At one ton depot, from which the polar party was now about 60 miles away, Cherry Garrard thought that he had gone to the depot too early to meet with Scott. Considering they did not have enough dog food to stay at the depot any longer, Cherry decided that he and Dimitri should take back the dogs to Hut Point. He was not too concerned with Captain Scott's team, since he felt that based on the experiences of the supporting parties that came back, they should have enough supplies to last them for the rest of the trip. Furthermore, Dimitri was beginning to complain of severe pain in his head and then his arm, possibly brought about by the sustained exposure to the cold. The dogs had become restless and lunatical, and the men were not able to sufficiently calm them. In their chaotic state, the two began to drive their dogs back to Hut Point in an erratic pattern, only settling after about six or seven miles. Meanwhile, on Inexpressible Island, good progress was being made in the construction of the ice cave. Campbell's party also started including seal blubber as a key ingredient in their daily diet. Northern party members Abbott and Dickinson declared that the cooked blubber tasted like melon. On top of this, others used this fatty oily tissue as fuel for a makeshift lamp, which, according to geologist Raymond Priestley, was very successful. Both tents have now a blubber lamp made by suspending a few strands of lamp wick from a safety pin, which is stretched as a bridge across the mouth of a small oxo tin full of melted oil. The light is splendid better than I should have thought possible, and the lamps will be very economical. The only drawback at present is the expenditure of paraffin oil necessary to melt the blubber. We must make the lamps melt their own oil when we get into our winter home. The lamps also give out a surprising amount of heat and very little smoke. We ate the pieces of blubber after the oil had been expelled from them and found them excellent. They tasted to me equal to any ordinary variety of fat one gets at home. On the 11th of March, Oates, in a miserably poor condition, asked Dr. Wilson for advice on what he should do. At this point, it is likely that Oates's feet were also becoming gangrenous and in need of amputation. Wilson apparently told him to try and keep marching on as far as he could. Captain Scott instead seemingly disagreed and ransacked Wilson's medicine bag to reveal what he had that could put Oates out of his misery. The captain found that in the case that they could go no further and were certain to die, they had 30 opium tablets for each man and one tube of morphine, which, when administered, would kill the pain they were feeling as they were gently lulled into a sleep from which they would never wake. Scott apparently encouraged the poor soldier to put himself out of his misery and to give the other three a marginally better chance of survival. Oates did not take him up on the offer. Wilson, too, strongly discouraged this idea, as he was a deeply religious man. In the days that followed, they hauled five to seven miles per day, well below the necessary daily average. Oates also developed frostbite in his arms, which, on top of his feet, left him practically useless. Wilson, too, became painfully cold, forcing Bowers and Scott to solely set up the tent for the four men. On the 15th of March, Oates announced that he could go no further and asked his teammates to leave him behind in his sleeping bag, but they did not entertain the idea, urging him to keep moving forward. They made another few miles before setting up camp. In the tent, Oates was coming to terms that he was to die very soon. He discussed with the others that the men of his regiment would be pleased to learn of the bold way he faced his death. He also spoke of his mother fondly with the other men keeping up a cheerful atmosphere, desperately trying to escape their hopeless situation with talk of what they would do when they got home. Oates went to sleep that night, praying that he would not wake up. However, 
he did. He rose to the sound of a raging blizzard outside the tent and made the decision. With a great struggle, he stood up and went to the door of the tent. Scott awoke and asked him what he was going to do. Oates said, I am just going outside and maybe some time. Scott then unlatched the door for him. As it pained Oates so, he did not bother putting on his boots and walked out in his socks. On the 16th of March, the day before his 32nd birthday, Captain Lawrence Oates left the tent and sacrificed himself to the blizzard. He happened to leave the tent almost at the exact location that one ton depot would have been laid had Scott listened to Oates' call to push the ponies further. Captain Scott wrote of his thoughts the next day. We knew that poor Oates was walking to his death, but though we tried to dissuade him, we knew it was the act of a brave man and an English gentleman. We all hoped to meet the end with a similar spirit, and assuredly, the end is not far. I can only write at lunch, and then only occasionally. The cold is intense, minus 40 degrees at midday. My companions are unendingly cheerful, but we are all on the verge of serious frostbites, and though we constantly talk of fetching through, I don't think any one of us believes it in his heart. The next day, Scott, Wilson, and Bowers resumed their difficult and now seemingly impossible journey. To add to their misfortune, Scott, to his own surprise, lost the use of his right foot to frostbite. He recorded the line of events which caused his downfall. Like an ass, I mixed a small spoonful of curry powder with my melted pemmican. It gave me violent indigestion. I lay awake and in pain all night, woke and felt done on the march. Foot went, and I didn't know it. A very small measure of neglect and have a foot which is not pleasant to contemplate. Bowers takes first place in condition, but there is not much to choose after all. The others are still confident of getting through, or pretend to be. I don't know. We have the last half fill of oil in our primus, and a very small quantity of spirit. This alone between us and thirst. By this time, Campbell's northern party had made their ice cave almost as big as it could be for the six men to reside in, 12 feet long by 9 feet wide. They did their best to shift the remainder of their supplies into the hole while fighting against a wind that would lift the men off their feet or bash them against the ground or boulders. The other three, who were on hunting duty, had to make a hasty retreat to the cave amidst the raging blizzard, resorting to crawling on all fours, abandoning their tent which had collapsed in the wind. By the time they entered their tiny underground igloo, their faces were terribly bitten. All six members of the northern party then enjoyed a welcoming hot meal in the glow of several blubber lamps. As their bodies warmed up, so did their spirits. They began exchanging songs and hymns, a concert which lasted a couple of hours. As the lamps dimmed and the heat of their hoosh, or stew of mixed solids, waned, the men began to shiver and the singing subsided. It was time for them to try and go to sleep but the hunting party had left their sleeping bags in their tent half a mile away, so they had to make do with what they had. Two men sharing a single sleeping bag. The six men in their three sleeping bags did not see much sleep that first night. They struggled to squeeze inside, and some almost suffocated as their companions rolled over in their sleep. With the rising of the sun, they concluded their useless struggle for slumber, and in spite of the gale outside, they made their way back to their tent to retrieve the rest of their belongings. Meanwhile, Cherry Garrard and Dimitri returned to Hut Point, where they were accompanied by Atkinson and Cohen. It was at the Discovery Hut that Cherry first learned that the Terra Nova had made numerous failed attempts at reaching the northern party, who were waiting on Inexpressible Island. Atkinson was now in the unenviable position of choosing to send a relief party to either the Polar Party or the northern party, since he did not have enough men or resources to help both. On the 19th of March, the polar party set up camp 11 miles from One Ton Depot. All three men were suffering from frostbite, with Captain Scott's right foot getting bitten the hardest. He wrote that its amputation was a likely possibility, but they had other more pressing matters to concern about. They had in their possession about two days worth of food, but barely enough fuel to last a single day. 
Scott's foot had become so bad that the plan was for Wilson and Bowers to head out to the depot by themselves and retrieve food and oil back for Scott, who would remain in their tent. On the 20th, a fierce blizzard stopped them from enacting their plan. The 21st, 22nd, and 23rd passed, and the blizzard raged on. Scott's brief entries in his journal made it clear that as long as the snowstorm blew, they were stranded, only 11 miles away from the depot, a distance that could have easily been covered in a single day, had it not been for the gruesome weather and the deteriorating state of the men. By the 24th of March, the three remaining members of the Polar Party had come to terms that they would die in their tent. They chose to end their lives naturally, bearing the brunt of the cold and hunger, without taking morphine. They made use of this time by writing farewell letters to their business partners and loved ones. Henry Bowers wrote to his mother, My own dearest mother, as this may possibly be the last letter to you, I am sorry it is such a short scribble. We have had a terrible journey back. When man's extremity is reached, God's help may put things right. And although the end will be painless enough for myself, I should so like to come through for your dear sake. It is splendid to pass, however, with such companions as I have, and as all five of us have mothers and wives, you will not be alone. There will be no shame, and you will know I have struggled to the end. Much and dearest love to your dear self and my sisters. Oh, how I do feel for you when you hear all. You will know that for me the end was peaceful, as it is only sleep in the cold. Your ever-loving son to the end in this life and the next, when we will meet and when God shall wipe all the tears from our eyes. Dr. Wilson penned a letter to his wife. We have been short oil and short food for so long, in such low temperatures and bad weather that we are all done up. Evans and Oates are dead. Our effort today is rather a forlorn hope, but I hope this will reach you. I look forward to meeting you after this life is over. I shall simply fall and go to sleep in the snow and I have your little books with me in my breast pocket. God will bring us together again. Don't be unhappy, darling. All is for the best. We are playing a good part in a great scheme arranged by God himself, and all is well. I find absolutely no terror in the thought that this is my last day of life, yet it almost certainly is, I think, dear. I am only sorry I couldn't have seen your loving letters and mothers and dads, and all the happy news I had hoped to see. But all these things are easily seen later, I expect, when we are with Christ, which is far better. We will all meet after death, and death has no terrors. God keep you in this disappointment. We have done what we thought was best. Goodbye for the present. As their superior, Captain Scott rightfully wrote letters of condolence to the loved ones of his companions. For the would-be widow Wilson, he wrote, If this letter reaches you, Bill and I will have gone out together. We are very near it now, and I should like you to know how splendid he was at the end, everlastingly cheerful and ready to sacrifice himself for others, never a word of blame to me for leading him into this mess. He is not suffering, luckily, at least only minor discomforts. His eyes have a comfortable blue look of hope, and his mind is peaceful with the satisfaction of his faith in regarding himself as part of the greater scheme of the Almighty. I can do no more to comfort you than to tell you that he died as he lived, a brave, true man, the best of comrades and staunchest of friends. For Lieutenant Bowers' mother, he said, I write when we are very near the end of our journey, and I am finishing it in company with two gallant, noble gentlemen. One of these is your son. He had come to be one of my closest and soundest friends, and I appreciate his wonderful upright nature his ability and energy. As the troubles have thickened, his dauntless spirit ever shone brighter, and he has remained cheerful, hopeful, and indomitable to the end. The ways of providence are inscrutable, but there must be some reason why such a young, vigorous, and promising life is taken. Finally, Scott made numerous letters to his closest friends, business associates, and of course, his would-be widow. To his expedition manager, Joseph Kinsey, he wrote in part, I'm afraid we are pretty well done. Four days of blizzard, just as we were getting to the last depot. My thoughts have been with you often. 
You have been a brick. You will pull the expedition through, I'm sure. Lieutenant Evans is not to be trusted over much, though he means well. My thoughts are for my wife and boy. Will you do what you can for them if the country won't? To his wife, Kathleen Scott. Make the boy interested in natural history if you can. It is better than games. I know you will keep him in the open air. Above all, he must guard, and you must guard him against indolence. Make him a strenuous man. I had to force myself into being strenuous, as you know. I had always an inclination to be idle. What lots and lots I could tell you of this journey. How much better has it been than lounging in too great comfort at home? What tales would you have for the boy? But what a price to pay. Tell Sir Clements I thought much of him and never regretted his putting me in command of the discovery. Finally, Scott composed his message to the public, an address detailing his reasons for their failure to return safely. He put blame on the great loss of ponies the previous year and the unexpectedly dreadful weather. He singled out Petty Officer Evans, who he thought was the strongest man of the party, but his progressive physical failings and later death left the rest of his party shaken with little chance of recuperating their losses. He commended their arrangement of supplies, but could not account for the shortage of fuel at the time. We are weak. Riding is difficult. But for my own sake, I do not regret this journey, which has shown that Englishmen can endure hardships, help one another, and meet death with as great a fortitude as ever in the past. We took risks. We knew we took them. Things have come out against us, and therefore we have no cause for complaint but bowed to the will of Providence, determined still to do our best to the last. But if we have been willing to give our lives to this enterprise, which is for the honor of our country, I appeal to our countrymen to see that those who depend on us are properly cared for. Had we lived, I should have had a tale to tell of the hardihood, endurance, and courage of my companions, which would have stirred to the heart of every Englishman. These rough notes and our dead bodies must tell the tale. But surely, surely, a great rich country like ours will see that those who are dependent on us are properly provided for. On the 29th of March, Captain Scott made his last entry in his journal. Since the 21st, we have had a continuous gale from west-southwest and southwest. We had fuel to make two cups of tea apiece and bare food for two days on the 20th. Every day, we have been ready to start for our depot 11 miles away, but outside the door of the tent, it remains a scene of whirling drift. I do not think we can hope for any better things now. We shall stick it out to the end, but we are getting weaker, of course, and the end cannot be far. It seems a pity, but I do not think I can write more. R. Scott Last entry. For God's sake, look after our people. By the end of March, the men residing in the Discovery Hut were growing increasingly anxious since the Polar Party had failed to return on time. On the 27th, Atkinson and Cohan set out on the barrier to see if they could find any trace of the missing men. By the 30th, they had reached a point just south of Corner Camp, experiencing constant temperatures of negative 40 degrees and little sleep. Atkinson thought it useless and needlessly dangerous for them to advance any further, and chose to mark their position by leaving a week's worth of supplies for the Polar Party, even though in his heart he knew that Scott and his men had perished. They then journeyed back to Hut Point, returning on the 1st of April. Resting at the hut, Cherry Garrard was stricken with a fever and body pains which made him very feeble and unable to contribute anything meaningful to their group. But he was very grateful for Atkinson's kindness and patience with him. Atkinson, on top of suffering from exhaustion and cold, was also enormously anxious about his position regarding what he should do as the highest-ranking officer in their quarters. After a few more days, Cherry and the others had come to terms with the grim reality that the Polar Party would never be coming back, 
and there was nothing they could do. Their next course of action had to be to return to their home base on Cape Evans as soon as possible, but the sea between the huts continuously froze solid and then got swept away by the wind. Little could also be done for the northern party. The men at Hut Point also had no certainty when they could make their way back to Cape Evans, or if they could even survive. Back in their cave on Inexpressible Island, the Northern Party had decided that they would spend the entire winter in the cave, save for brief expeditions to kill seals, and sledge back to Cape Evans in early spring, meaning that they had to save all their sledging rations for that occasion. As a consequence, apart from consuming biscuits, which had to be carefully divided into six sections and passed around to each man, they largely had to sustain themselves on the meat and blubber of seals and penguins. Cherry Guard later summarized the lifestyle of the six men residing in the ice cave. They ate blubber, cooked with blubber, had blubber lamps, their clothes and gear were soaked with blubber, and the soot blackened them, their sleeping bags, cookers, walls, and roof, choked their throats and inflamed their eyes. Blubbery clothes are cold, and theirs were soon so torn as to afford little protection against the wind and so stiff with blubber that they would stand up by themselves, in spite of frequent scrapings with knives and rubbings with penguin skins. And always there were underfoot the great granite boulders, which made walking difficult, even in daylight and calm weather. As Levick said, the road to hell might be paved with good intentions, but it seemed probable that hell itself would be paved something after the style of Inexpressible Island. Early on during their cohabitation, they luckily killed a seal which had inside its stomach 36 barely digested fish, which the men eagerly cooked and ate over the next two days. This encouraged them to kill more seals, but they were never again met with this kind of fortune. On the 5th of April, the ice over McMurdo Sound looked stable enough that Atkinson, Cohan, and Dimitri set out to reach Cape Evans. They successfully reached the hut containing the rest of the men on that same day, and Atkinson called an assembly to explain the situation. He asked for understanding and any forthcoming suggestions during this trying time, but the men agreed that all that could be done for Scott's team had already been done. In Cape Evans, Atkinson heard that the seven mules were faring well in their stables, but three of their new dogs had mysteriously died. In addition, while nine men left with the Terra Nova, Two seamen, Archer and Williamson, joined the shore party on Cape Evans. After a few days rest, Atkinson then reassembled a team that would journey to Hut Point, and then sledge along the western coast to do all they could for Campbell and his men. Meanwhile, Cherry, gravely ill, was left alone at the Discovery Hut. He had to tend to the dogs, who had a tendency to grow wild and aggressive and Cherry in his weak state at times could only manage to crawl on his hands and knees over to them to break up their fights, swearing afterwards that he would have gladly killed the lot of them. The blizzards periodically battered the creaky walls of the hut, as Cherry Guard shivered and struggled to keep the stove alight with an ample supply of blubber. He later stated that he doubted his chances of survival if it were not for the morphine he was administering to himself. After four days of solitude, a six-man party arrived at the hut. Gran and Dimitri were to stay with the ailing Cherry, while Atkinson, Wright, Cohan, and Williamson were to march west as far as they safely could, reconstructing cairns and depots along the way. On the 17th of April, the four men set out on a journey which Wright personally felt was futile, whereas Atkinson hoped against hope that as they traveled west, they would meet with Campbell's party heading the opposite direction. During the next few days, they experienced temperatures of negative 40 degrees and lower, and got little sleep. When they reached the Butterpoint Depot, they observed that the ice ahead was breaking up and heading out to sea, which meant that they could not reach Campbell, nor could Campbell reach them. They remarked the depot the best they could and left two weeks of provisions, then made their retreat to the Discovery Hut. They successfully returned on the 23rd. Cherry Guard wrote that the party's clothes and sleeping bags were soaked, and that Atkinson looked too thin, with his cheeks sunken in. After almost a week of well-earned rest, all the men at Hut Point journeyed across the stable-looking ice of McMurdo Sound in separate parties, and successfully arrived at Cape Evans in the first days of May. On their return trip, 
Atkinson asked Cherry for guidance on which party they should try to find after the winter. Cherry Guard, without thinking, stated that they should go for Campbell's party, for he thought it thoroughly pointless to leave living men to themselves and search for those who were dead. As the men of Cape Evans cozied up in their hut, the northern party were drifting back into normality after the festivities of April 30th, which consisted of the passing of 25 raisins to each of the six men, a celebration reserved for the last day of every month. Birthdays were also fondly anticipated, as it meant that each man would treat himself to dessert in the form of a stick of chocolate, six sugar cubes, and 25 raisins. As five of the men were tobacco smokers, they could only receive a very limited supply of the substance, which was not enough to satisfy their cravings. The smokers experimented with various means of supplementing their tobacco with other things, such as dry wood shavings and tea leaves. One member, Dickinson, at one point pondered whether it was possible to convert a pair of socks into tobacco, though whether this experiment was carried out is uncertain. Over time, the difficulty in keeping up their habit resulted in all the men quitting smoking. Diet-wise, the men in the ice cave went through spells of uncomfort on the count of their near entirely meat-based food, which resulted in the development of rheumatism in some of the members. In addition, to conserve their limited quantity of salt, they resorted to using seawater or sea ice to make their hooshes more palatable. This caused them some irregularity, though most soon grew to enjoy the taste of saltwater hoosh. Another way to add flavor to their meals was to use the ice on which they killed a seal, which would become soaked with its fresh, hot blood. When boiled, the bloody ice turned to gravy and made their hoosh more nutritious and filling. Excursions outside the cave were very limited, as blizzards surrounded them constantly and were reserved for necessities like searching for seals and penguins, or light exercise. But with every increased period of exertion, the pangs of hunger the men had grew more intense, and there was little they could do to get rid of it. The weather they experienced was much the same as that which enveloped Cape Evans. Constant blizzards battered the hut. Gusts blew at over 90 miles per hour, and the ice over the sea had little chance of solidifying, for it was blown away as soon as it began to freeze. The men in the hut were experiencing weather phenomena previously unseen on McMurdo Sound. During the countless days they had to spend indoors, they thought of the two missing parties. There was too much doubt over Campbell's party, as there was an equal chance that they could survive or could perish by the end of the winter. They considered the Terra Nova could even have made another pass at Inexpressible Island and picked them up already. The men of Cape Evans pondered that if they pulled through, Campbell's team could make their own journey back to the hut, making an early spring relief mission by Atkinson futile. Concerning the Polar Party, Lashley was sure they had died of scurvy, while most others figured they had fallen into a crevice. If they had reached the Pole and made some distance back north, they reckoned it was the duty of the surviving team members to try and search for their remains and retrieve any records they had made. The conflicted Atkinson stated to the rest of the men that he believed their priority should be to venture south, but to reach a consensus, he called for an anonymous vote. Out of the 12 men present, 11 voted in favor of searching for Scott's party, while one man abstained. The identity of that man was never publicly revealed. With the matter seemingly resolved, they carried on with their duties, trying hard not to fall into despair and sadness. Scientific studies continued, and Cherry Guard relaunched the production of the South Polar Times magazine. When the winds were calmer, men would engage in fishing battles. One time, Crean rejoiced at the sight of his fish trap catching 25 fish. By comparison, Atkinson's trap had managed to capture only one poor specimen. In early June, a blizzard raged non-stop for eight days, vibrating the hut and making the men question its resistance against such winds. Not long after one concluded, another commenced, and so in July, the hut and its surroundings were thoroughly blanketed with four-foot-high snowdrifts thrown by the blizzard. As the men went outside to carry out routine temperature readings, they would be completely plastered in snow, losing their way even when they were mere feet from the hut. On one occasion, as Wright was about to enter a cave made for magnetic readings, he opened the makeshift door, which was immediately pulled out of his hands by the wind and carried away into the unknown distance. 
Meanwhile, in the cave on Inexpressible Island, the men would hold heated arguments over the most economical and soul-satisfying time of day to eat the ration of biscuit. Campbell declared the best was breakfast time. Levick would have part of his at breakfast and the rest mixed with his hoosh, while Priestley preferred to have part of his at midday and finish the rest at dinner. The verbal fights would conclude without resolve. In other food matters, some members of the crew were falling ill with dysentery, an infection of the intestines that caused diarrhea containing blood and mucus. This was likely caused by the use of seawater as a salting agent in their cooking. Furthermore, the men were getting irritably tired of their monotonous and diet. They had experimented with flavoring their hoosh with bits of seal brain. It proved to make the broth very tasteful, and the brain itself tasted like moist bread. This delicacy was rarely used, as the team wanted to resist more animalistic eating habits, which would make their readjustment to civilization more challenging. Toward the end of July, Campbell and Abbott went outside to enjoy the unusually calm weather when they spotted two seals nearby. In a fierce struggle using an ice axe and knives, they desperately tried to stun and kill the seals, for if they lost this chance, they would not have enough food to last them the rest of the winter. After one was successfully killed, Abbott went to stab at the other, but the blubbery knife slipped in his hand and tore three deep gashes across his fingers. Levick bandaged up the wound to the best of his abilities, but unfortunately, the knife severed the tendons of all three affected fingers, meaning Abbott permanently lost most of the use of his hand. The others went to fetch their bountiful supply of meat and blubber, which ought to have lasted them for the final two months in their struggle for survival. August brought with it the first glimpses of sunlight in four months. The mules of Cape Evans were exercised daily in the improved light. They were proven to be strong and fit for the job, but some men worried if their small hooves would sink down into the snow deeper than their ponies had. The dogs were also taken outside for training, though they seemed to have gotten tired of the hard sledging lifestyle and refused to cooperate with their drivers. On one occasion, close to Hut Point, a large group of meandering emperor penguins caught the ravenous attention of a band of dogs, who bit through their harnesses and slaughtered the birds. In early September, the men of the cave were making their final preparations for their sledging to Cape Evans. For physical training, the six men took part in a form of calisthenics, known as Swedish exercises. Some moves required them to stand up, but since their cave was only 5 feet 6 inches tall, they had to resort to doing these exercises lying down. It became quickly clear that this training was necessary, as even their light morning exercise routine left them feeling breathless and out of energy. Also in the start of September, they had their first tainted hoosh. They all could feel a certain quality about the taste was off, but could not pinpoint the cause theorizing that the meat they had used came from a seal which was of ill health. Two days later, another tainting occurred. While Dickinson and Priestley were cooking up the cocoa and then passing it around to the others, Priestley spotted a lump of seal liver at the bottom of the cocoa pot, which also had been extracted from that sick seal. The damage was done, and the men drank their seal liver-infused cocoa in visible disgust. Dickinson and Priestley managed to convince the others that some seaweed had gotten into the mix, keeping the truth a secret. On the 4th of September, Campbell developed ptomaine poisoning, or food poisoning. The others followed suit in the days immediately after. They resisted throwing away the tainted hoosh, as they could not afford to not eat it. Levick ordered a change of diet, but their ailments persisted. After examining their makeshift oven made from an old tin, they spotted in the corner a small pool of blood, water, and scraps of meat, which largely remained uncooked for long periods of time, allowing for the accumulation of bacteria. The old oven was soon replaced by a freshly emptied biscuit tin, and their health gradually improved. On the 30th of September, the six men exited the cave for the final time. Though covered in filth, malnourished, and recovering from illness, they all managed to survive six months living in a cramped cave in the snow. 
and were eager to begin their tiresome sledging journey to Cape Evans. Thankfully, their first days of sledging were welcomed by a cessation of winds. Unfortunately, Browning and Dickinson developed diarrhea, which, according to Priestley, left them half crippled. Their diet remained similar to that of their time in the cave, with the addition of raw seal or penguin meat for lunch. After a six-month break, another welcome change was the reintroduction of pemmican to their diet, consisting of 60% fat and 40% shredded meat. By the 10th, the six men could finally observe Mount Erebus 150 miles away. From here, they fought with occasional bad surfaces and pressure ridges, but their hardship was soon rewarded with the uncovering of old depots containing bountiful supplies, which gave them the energy to keep moving forward as they edged closer and closer to Cape Evans. On the 29th of October, a party of 12 men, accompanied by mules and dogs, set out from Hut Point in their search for any sign of the polar party. They averaged 12 miles per day, reaching One Ton Depot on the 11th of November. To their surprise, a tank of supplies left for the returning party had become soaked in fuel. They suspected that the oil had expanded in the increasing temperatures and leaked out of its tins. The next day, Wright spotted what appeared to be a snow cairn in the distance. Upon closer inspection, they came to the realization of the morbid reality. At the very top of this seeming cairn was the tip of a tent. It was Captain Scott's tent, covered in snow. There was a depression in the mound, and through this, they uncovered the door of the tent and opened it. Inside lay the frozen bodies of Bowers, Wilson, and Scott in their sleeping bags. Their skin had hardened, become glassy, and taken on a yellowish tint from the exposure to the cold. Bowers and Wilson seemingly died peacefully in their sleep. Captain Scott, who lay between them, showed signs of struggle, with his body bursting out of his sleeping bag. He had died with his arm draped over his dear friend, Dr. Wilson. The search party was certain that their captain had died last, as the ties of his companion's sleeping bags were securely fastened from the outside, with their faces fully covered. Within the tent, they found all their publishable and private writings, Amundsen's letter for King Hawken, and rolls of photographs. Under Scott's head and shoulder was the large green wallet which held his sledging journals. His body had gotten so solid that his arm had to be snapped broken in order for the men to retrieve his diaries. Outside the tent, Atkinson opened Scott's final journal and read a selection of entries to his men. Here, they learned that the team had gotten to the pole well over a month after Amundsen's team, and that Petty Officer Evans died at the foot of the Beardmore Glacier. He read Scott's account of Oates's gallant final march into the blizzard, and also recited the message to the public. They then held a short service with a reading from the Bible, then removed the bamboo frames of the tent and collapsed it over the three men. On top of the bodies, the search party built a specially large cairn and placed a cross fashioned out of Grant's skis atop it. They penned a brief commemorative letter signifying the location and placed it on the cairn. Grant took Captain Scott's skis with him, symbolically having some part of the captain come back home. The next morning, the 12 men went further south to look for Oates's body. About 15 miles away, they found his sleeping bag and some of his gear, which had been abandoned by the surviving three. A blizzard was growing, and the men felt that they ought to not advance further. They built another cairn close to where Oates had met his end, and placed a cross over it. With all important documentation in their possession, they turned to make their way back to the hut finally reaching Cape Evans on the 26th of November. To their delight, they found all six men of Campbell's party safe and sound, having arrived there 20 days prior. They had significantly gained weight since their return and were in good spirits, eager to tell the others of their adventures. The newly reunified team also meant that Campbell was the senior most man and was the de facto leader. He reorganized their efforts and made plans for the coming months. For one, he called for a significant trip to the top of Mount Erebus, finally planting their feet on its crater on the 12th of December. Meanwhile, 
Cherry Gard carried on Dr. Wilson's zoological studies by living alongside the Adelie penguin rookery on Cape Royds. He captured several eggs at early stages of development and brought them back to base camp. By the 18th of January, 1913, while the men were all eager to leave their frigid home of two years, there was still no sign of the Terra Nova, so the men began preparing for yet another winter on the ice. However, the ship suddenly appeared into view as the team was busy working. They stopped in their tracks in relief as she slowly approached the coast. Former Lieutenant Evans, now promoted to commander, had returned, having sufficiently recovered from scurvy and was now in command of the ship. He used a megaphone and asked if they were well. A senior member of the shore party yelled back. The polar party died on their return from the pole. We have their records. An understandable pause followed. After some time, a boat was lowered into the water and was rowed to meet the hut. Commander Evans brought with him fresh apples for the men to enjoy before a long period of loading ensued. After thoroughly digesting the heartbreaking news, Evans formally assumed control of the expedition. Once most of the loading and packing was complete, the men asked the ship's carpenter, Francis Davies, to fashion a large memorial cross to commemorate the losses of their finest men. They considered engraving it with a biblical verse, but ultimately decided on the final line from the epic poem Ulysses by writer Alfred Lord Tennyson, serving as a fitting tribute to the endurance of the men. To strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield. On the 22nd of January, a team of men hauled up the two large pieces of the cross to the summit of Observation Hill, which had watched over the Englishmen over several years and stood between their former living quarters and the spots where they died. When planted, the cross stood nine feet tall. The men who brought it up the hill gave it four cheers and then made their way back down to the Terra Nova. Afterwards, they coasted along the shore and made some stops to pick up any remaining scientific samples. When all necessities were retrieved, the ship steamed off back to civilization, with all the crew relieved to see the last of Antarctica. On the 10th of February, the Terra Nova reached the coast of Oamaru Harbour in New Zealand, where they first sent a telegram to the relatives of the lost expedition members, telling them what had transpired. From here on, they sailed on back to Littleton, where the news of the expedition and its tragedy were spread to the rest of the world. By this point, news of Roald Amundsen's South Polar conquest had been known for nearly a year. The initial outrage of his secretive change of plans had all been swept away in the eyes of Norway. In Britain, praise had been given with some restraint. Upon Amundsen's appearance before the Royal Geographical Society, he had been mocked by the group's superiors for relying so heavily on dogs carrying out most of the significant bulk of labor. Kathleen Scott, the captain's wife, acknowledged that in spite of her irritation of his dishonesty, she could not help but admire his feat. Shackleton had also joined in the congratulations, calling Amundsen perhaps the greatest explorer of the day. Amundsen's triumph was swiftly overshadowed in February 1913. The explorer was in the middle of touring America when he heard the news that Captain Scott and four of his comrades had reached the pole but all perished on their way back. He later stated, Captain Scott left a record for honesty, for sincerity, for bravery, for everything that makes a man. In a very short span of time, Captain Robert Scott became an icon worldwide and a martyr in the eyes of Britain. He and his men had given their lives in the name of science and achievement for their country. Newspaper headlines all read his name, declaring him a symbol of British heroism. Mere days after the news reached London, a hastily arranged memorial took place at St. Paul's Cathedral, attended by King George V and thousands of mourners. Naturally, there was a great hunger for the people to read Captain Scott's journals. A summary of his story was provided to elementary schools, and his tale was the focus of many Sunday sermons. A national fund succeeded in raising over £75,000 to help the bereaved, 
pay off the expedition's debts and publicize the expedition's scientific reports. Scott's last expedition, a work in two volumes, was published in November 1913. The first volume consisted of Scott's journal entries from November 1910 up to the day he died, albeit somewhat edited to omit most negative musings of teammates. Furthermore, some recorded temperatures were lowered to exaggerate the experienced weather conditions. The second volume was a collection of scientific reports from the various researchers of the expedition. Despite its steep price, it was wildly popular. Those not able to purchase the books could instead read the most noteworthy of Scott's entries in a variety of sources, such as magazine serializations and newspapers. These included his account of Captain Oates's self-sacrifice, his last words, and his message to the public, which resided firmly in the hearts of all who read it. As for their scientific research, more was learned by the men of the Terra Nova expedition than all previous Antarctic ventures combined, and brought forth understanding of the region that would not be thoroughly expanded upon for another half a century. The rock samples that were found with Scott, Wilson and Bowers's bodies proved to hold fossilized remains of the extinct plant Glossopterus, proving that Antarctica was once in a warmer climate and supported the theory that it had once been connected to other continents. Unfortunately, upon meticulous examination, the penguin eggs retrieved by Wilson, Bowers, and Cherry Guard during that most grueling winter trip to Cape Crozier did not prove any link between birds and reptiles at an embryonic stage, as Wilson had theorized. For Commander Evans, the media shone its spotlight as he was the highest-ranking officer beside Scott and deemed an authority on the expedition. In addition to their polar medals, Tom Crean and William Lashley were both awarded with the Albert Medal for bravery in their act of saving Evans's life. However, there were some questions raised regarding his competence on the mission. In April 1913, Lady Scott, who had been granted the same privileges as the wife of a knight, held a long conversation with the president of the Royal Geographical Society, Lord Curzon, after analyzing her husband's journals. Among what they discussed was the possibility that someone from the returning party consisting of Lieutenant Evans, Crean, and Lashley had taken more than their fair share of supplies from the depots. Furthermore, at around the same time, Dr. Wilson's widow, Oriana, spoke to Lord Curzon of the entries in her husband's diary, which recounted an inexplicable shortage of fuel and pemmican from some of the depots. Lady Scott heavily hinted that the culprit could have been Commander Evans. To further add to the scandal, Evans, in his earliest interviews with New Zealand press, stated that he had come down with scurvy 300 miles away from base camp, matching with his own private letters and diary. However, by the time the media were expending all their efforts to gather as much information about Scott's expedition as possible, Evans reported to magazines that he was known to be ill with scurvy an incredible 500 miles away from Cape Evans. This exaggeration was possibly to either make himself appear more stoic, having endured longer hardships, or to cover for the mystery of missing rations along the way. Him being ill earlier in the journey, to some may make the taking of extra food a more excusable offense. The RGS president even considered launching an inquiry into the matter. However, Commander Evans's wife Hilda suddenly became critically ill with peritonitis, an abdominal inflammation, and passed away on the 18th of April. The society thought it best to leave the matter to rest, as the commander had suffered enough, though negative opinions of him persisted, albeit in more private correspondences. Of the expedition's second-in-command, Cherry Guard privately wrote, I had made up my mind many months ago before I knew that Evans was left as leader of the expedition in the case of Scott's death, that I would be as far as I can be, silent as to his disloyalty to Scott and his failure in the main landing party, especially aggravated as it was by the fact that he will not or cannot pull. His sledging literally has been done by others. In a way, it seems hard that the return of his party shall be made the subject of a column in the Times. Concerning Scott's order of dock teams to meet with the Polar Party, it appears possible that it had been given verbally to Lieutenant Evans, but was not passed down to others. Upon first hearing of the tragedy in February 1913, Sir Clements Markham wrote to Lord Curzon, informing him of Scott's death, 
under the incorrect understanding that Cherry and two dog teams were sent out to meet Scott at the foot of the Beardmore Glacier, a detail that was not shared with the public. This misinformation could have only come from one source, who had been with Markham in London some months prior, Commander Evans. Gran later claimed that an order had been given for the dogs to go meet the party at the bottom of the glacier, which would have saved their lives. Ultimately, the existence of the order has not been concretely confirmed, and talks of a dog party traveling to the Beardmore Glacier could have come about through a misunderstanding. Cherry later wrote, Commander Evans is probably suffering from too many medals. A friend tells me the greatest mistake in this expedition was that God killed the wrong Evans. The deadly misfortune certainly overshadowed Amundsen's success, and his expedition has been near equally praised and criticized ever since. In his later years, Trigva Gran said, Scott was a man. He would always listen to you. Amundsen would listen to nobody. He was only interested in himself. So Amundsen, as a human being, was not worth much. But Scott was worth a lot as a human being. In the years since the return of the Terra Nova, Captain Scott and his four companions became symbols of the British stiff upper lip mentality, to not complain when hard times befell oneself, and to simply keep on pushing with all one's might. Captain Scott's encouraging words were widely read by soldiers on the front lines of the Great War, which soon followed, to boost their own morale. Likewise, during World War II, the explorer's journey was once again used by troops who sought comfort in his tale of hardship and endurance. The story of the Terra Nova expedition, as told from Cherry Gard's point of view in his book The Worst Journey in the World, was a source of moral support for countless souls in war. Decades later, biographies and analyses determined Scott to have been a buffoon, who died on the count of his ill preparation, which damaged his legacy. In more recent years, his reputation has had somewhat of a restoration, as the details of his expedition were scrutinized from a more unbiased point of view, and researchers corrected previous misconceptions regarding his character. The Polar Party perished for a multitude of reasons. The sledging rations they had devised were far too insufficient to combat the physical exertion of their activity, a dietary detail that had not been researched yet. Starvation likely accounted greatly for why Petty Officer Evans, the largest and most muscular man of the party, was the first to fall apart. The lesser amount of caloric intake resulted in the gradual degradation of their bodies, over time becoming overworked and unable to pull as hard as during a shorter sledging trip. Their loss of body fat meant that they were affected more severely by the cold. The missing rations and evaporating fuel only added to their discomfort but by far their most cruel treatment came from the weather. As Scott himself had put it, no one could have predicted the conditions they experienced, not even the team's meteorologist, Dr. Simpson, whose weather forecasting, when compared with modern calculations, was found to be extremely accurate. Through no fault of his own, Captain Scott ventured south during a period of unusually cold and windy summertime that only came about less than once per decade. Their disaster signified that as well prepared as they were, there was more to be done and more to learn about this icy world. Today, the South Pole is never lonely, for the American Amundsen Scott South Pole Station is permanently standing watch next to the pole, commemorating the achievements of both the Norwegians and the British. The research station honors Amundsen for his meticulous planning and bravery in seeking a new, unknown path to the pole while Scott is honored for his perseverance and commitment in advancing scientific understanding. Scott's huts, built during both the Discovery and Terra Nova expeditions, still stand today, virtually untouched and preserved for over a century, and are every year visited by limited numbers of tourists. Right nearby stands McMurdo Station, the most populous research base in Antarctica. Overlooking this veritable town is Observation Hill, and the cross that was planted by members of the Terra Nova expedition. As for the five men who never returned, they are now buried deep somewhere within the ice barrier, now known as the Ross Ice Shelf, which is ever evolving and growing with fresh ice and snow. Even in November 1912, a mere eight months after the Polar Party set up its last camp, 
Scott's tent was almost entirely covered with snow. Four years later, when Sir Ernest Shackleton returned on his endurance expedition, his men found no trace of the massive cairn built over their tent. The polar party is now estimated to be buried under more than 55 feet of ice and snow, and over 40 miles further north than where they died, for the Ross Ice Shelf is constantly moving, creeping slowly northward to meet the open waters of McMurdo Sound. It is believed that in about 230 years, their remains will reach the outer wall, and the portion of the ice shelf containing their bodies may break away into an iceberg and will float down the sound and out to sea. As in their life, they remain explorers, constantly on the move, though now fortunately for them, there is no more sledging, no pains of frostbite, no pangs of hunger, only an eternal sleep as Antarctica gently carries them back home, showing them the respect they rightfully earned. Oh, 